Chapter One of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter One Parentage Father's Marriage. I was born in St. John's, New Brunswick, in the year 1835. My father was from the city of Dublin, Ireland, where he spent his youth and received an education in accordance with the strictest rules of a Roman Catholic faith and practice. Early manhood, however, found him dissatisfied with his native country, longing for other scenes and distant climes. He therefore left Ireland, and came to Quebec. Here he soon became acquainted with Captain Willard, a wealthy English gentleman, who, finding him a stranger in a strange land, kindly opened his door, and gave him employment and a home. Little did he think that in doing so he was warming in his bosom a viper whose poisonous fangs would, ere long, fasten on his very heart-strings and bring down his grey hairs with sorrow to the grave his only child was a lovely daughter of fourteen from what i have heard of her i think she must have been very beautiful in person quiet gentle and unassuming in her deportment and her disposition amiable and affectionate she was exceedingly romantic and her mental powers were almost, if not entirely, uncultivated. Still, she possessed sufficient strength of character to enable her to form a deep, ardent, and permanent attachment. The young stranger gazed upon her with admiring eyes, and soon began to whisper in her ear the flattering tale of love. This, of course, her parents could not approve, what, give their darling to a stranger? Never, no never. What could they do without her? Grieved that their kindness should have been thus returned, they bade him go his way and leave their child in peace. He did go, but like a thief he returned. In the darkness of midnight he stole to her chamber and bore away from the home of her childhood a father's joy, a mother's pride. Who can tell the anguish of their souls when they entered that deserted chamber? How desolate their lonely hearthstone! How dark the home where her presence had scattered rainbow hues! A terrible blow it was to Captain Willard, a very bitter thing, thus to have his cherished plans frustrated his brightest hopes destroyed, to see the very sun of his existence go down at midday in clouds and darkness. Yes, to the stern father, this sad event brought bitter, bitter grief. But to the mother, that tender, affectionate mother, it was death, yea, more than death. For reason at the first shock reeled and tottered on its throne. Then, as days and weeks passed by, and still the loved one did not return, when every effort to find her had been made in vain, then the dread certainty settled down upon her soul that her child was lost to her for ever. Hope gave place to despair and she became from that time a raving maniac. At length death came to her relief, and her husband was left alone. Six weary years passed over the lonely man, and then he rejoiced in the intelligence that his child was still living with her husband at St. John's. He immediately wrote to her, imploring her to return to her old home, and with the light of her presence dispel the gloom of his dwelling. 
Accordingly she left St. John's, and in company with her husband, returned to her father. I was then about a year and a half old, but I have so often heard these facts related by my father and grandfather, they are indelibly impressed upon my mind, and will never be erased from my memory. My mother now thought her trouble at an end, that in future she should enjoy the happiness she once anticipated. But alas for all human prospects, ere one short month had passed, difficulties arose in consequence of the difference in their religious opinions. Captain Willard was a firm Protestant, while my father was quite as firm in his belief of the principles of the Roman Catholics. Can two walk together except they be agreed? They parted in anger, and my father again became a wanderer, leaving his wife and child with his father-in-law. But my mother was a faithful, devoted wife. Her husband was her heart's chosen idol, whom she loved too well to think of being separated from. She therefore left her father's house, with all its luxuries and enjoyments, to follow the fortunes of one who was certainly unworthy of the pure affection thus lavished upon him. As her health had been delicate for the last two years, she concluded to leave me with her father for a short time, intending to send for me as soon as she was in a situation to take care of me. But this was not to be. Death called her away, and I saw my mother no more till her corpse was brought back and buried in her father's garden. Two years I remained with my grandfather, and from him I received the most affectionate and devoted attention. My father at length opened a saloon for the sale of porter, and hired a black woman to do his work. He then came for me. My grandfather entreated that I might be allowed to remain. Well he knew that my father was not the man to be entrusted with the care of a child, that a porter house was no place for me, for he was quite sure that stronger liquors than porter were there drank and sold. In fact, it was said that my father was himself a living evidence of this. But it is of a parent I am speaking, and whatever failings the world may have seen in him, to me he was a kind and tender father. The years I spent with him were the happiest of my life. On memory's page they stand out in bold relief, strikingly contrasting with the wretchedness of my after-life. And though I cannot forget that his own rash act brought this wretchedness upon me, still I believe his motives were good. I know that he loved me, and every remembrance of his kindness, and those few bright days of childhood, I have carefully cherished as a sacred thing. He did not, however, succeed in the business he had undertaken, but lost his property and was at length compelled to give up his saloon. I was then placed in a Roman Catholic family where he often visited, and ever appeared to feel for me the most devoted attachment. One day he came to see me in a state of partial intoxication. I did not then know why his face was so red and his breath so offensive, but I know now that he was under the influence of ardent spirits. The woman with whom I boarded, seeing his condition, and being a good Catholic, resolved to make the most of the occasion for the benefit of the nunnery. She therefore said to him, You are not capable of bringing up that child. Why don't you give her to priest Dow? Will he take her? asked my father. Yes, she replied. 
he will put her into the nunnery, and the nuns will take better care of her than you can. On what condition will they take her? he asked. Give the priest one hundred dollars, replied the artful woman, and he will take care of her as long as she lives. This seemed a very plausible story, but I am sure my father did not realize what he was doing. Had he waited for a little reflection, he would never have consented to such an arrangement, and my fate would have been quite different. But as it was, he immediately sent for the priest, and gave me to him, to be provided for as his own child until I was of age. I was then to be allowed to go out into the world if I chose. To this Priest Dow consented in consideration of one hundred dollars, which he received together with a good bed and bedding. My mother's gold earrings were also entrusted to his care until I should be old enough to wear them, but I never saw them again, although I was at that time but six years old, I remember perfectly all that passed on that memorable occasion. I did not then comprehend the full meaning of what was said, but I understood enough to fill my heart with sorrow and apprehension. When their bargain was completed, Priest Dow called me to him, saying, with a smile, You are a stubborn little girl, I guess, a little naughty, sometimes are you not surprised and alarmed i replied no sir he then took hold of my hair which was rather short drew it back from my forehead with a force that brought the tears to my eyes and pressing his hand heavily on my head he asked again if i was not sometimes a little wilful and disobedient i was so much frightened at this I turned to my father, and with tears and sobs entreated him not to send me away with that man, but allow me to stay at home with him. He drew me to his bosom, wiped away my tears, and sought to quiet my fears by assuring me that I would have a good and pleasant home, that the nuns would take better care of me than he could, and that he would often come to see me. Thus, by the aid of flattery on one side, and sugar-plums on the other, they persuaded me at last to accompany the priest to the White Nunnery, St. Paul's Street, Quebec. I was too young to realize the sad change in my situation, or to anticipate the trials and privations that awaited me, but I was deeply grieved thus to leave my father, my only real friend, my mother being dead, and my grandfather a heretic, whom I had been taught to regard with the utmost abhorrence. Little, however, did I think that this was a last farewell. But such it was. Though he had promised to come often to see me, I never saw my father again, never even heard from him, and now I do not know whether he is dead or alive. End of chapter 1。Chapter 2 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter 2. The White Nunnery. On my arrival at the nunnery, I was placed under the care of a lady whom they called a superior. She took me into a room alone, and told me that the priest would come to me in the morning to hear confession, and I must confess to him all my sins. What are sins, I asked, and how shall I confess? I don't know what it means. Don't know what sins are, 
she exclaimed in great astonishment. Why, child, I am surprised that you should be so ignorant. Where have you lived all your days? With all the simplicity of childhood, I replied. With my father, and once I lived with my grandfather. But they didn't tell me how to confess. Well, said she, you must tell the priest all your wicked thoughts, words, and actions. What is wicked? I innocently asked. If you have ever told an untruth, she replied, or taken what did not belong to you, or been in any way naughty, disobedient, or unkind, if you have been angry or quarrelled with your playmates, that was wicked, and you must tell the priest all about it. If you try to conceal or keep back anything, the priest will know it and punish you. You cannot deceive him if you try, for he knows all you do or say or even think, and if you attempt it, you'll only get yourself into trouble. But if you are resolved to be a good girl, kind, gentle, frank, sincere, and obedient, the priest will love you and be kind to you. When I was conducted to my room at bedtime, I rejoiced to find in it several little cot beds occupied by little girls about my own age, who had been, like myself, consigned to the tender mercies of priests and nuns. I thought if we must live in that great gloomy house, which even to my childish imagination seemed so much like a prison, we could in some degree dispel our loneliness and mitigate our sorrows by companionship and sympathy. But I was soon made to know that even this small comfort would not be allowed us, for the superior, as she assisted me to bed, told me that I must not speak, or groan, or turn upon my side, or move in any way, for if I made the least noise or disturbance, I would be severely punished. She assured me that if we disobeyed in the least particular, she would know it, even if she was not present and deal with us accordingly. She said that when the clock struck twelve, the bell would ring for prayers, that we must then rise and kneel with our heads bowed upon the bed and repeat the prayer she taught us. When at length she left us, locking the room after her, I was so frightened I did not dare to sleep, lest I should move or fail to awake at the proper time. Slowly passed the hours of that long and weary night, while I lay, waiting the ring of the bell, or thinking upon the past with deep regret. The most fearful visions haunted my brain, and fears of future punishment filled my mind. How could I hope to escape it, when they were so very strict, and able to read my most secret thoughts. What would I not have given could I have been again restored to my father? True, he was intemperate, but at that time I thought not of this. I only knew that he was always kind to me, that he never refused what I asked of him. I sometimes think even now that if he had not so cruelly thrust me from him, I might have been able to win him from his cups and evil course of life. But this was not to be. Having given himself up to the demon of intemperance, it is not surprising that he should have given away his only child, that he should have placed her in the hands of those who proved utterly unworthy of the trust. But however indignant I may at times have felt towards him, for the one great wrong he committed against me. Still, I do not believe he ever would have done it but for the influence of ardent spirits. Moreover, I do not suppose that he had the least idea what kind of place it was. 
He wished, doubtless, that his child might be well educated, that she might be shielded from the many trials and temptations that cluster around the footsteps of the young and inexperienced, in the midst of a cold and heartless world. From these evils the nunnery, he thought, would be a secure retreat, for there science, religion, and philanthropy, professedly, go hand in hand. Like many other deluded parents, he thought that holiness to the Lord was inscribed upon these walls, and that nothing which could pervert or defile the youthful mind was permitted to enter there. With these views and feelings, he was undoubtedly sincere when he told me, I would have a good home, and the nuns would take better care of me than he could. Rash his decision certainly was, cruel it proved to be, but I shall ever give him credit for good intentions. At length the bell rang, and the girls immediately left their beds, and placed themselves upon their knees. I followed their example, but I had scarcely time to kneel by my bed, when the superior came into the room with a light in her hand, and attended by a priest. He came to me, opened a book, and told me to cross myself. This ceremony he instructed me to perform in the following manner. The right hand is placed upon the forehead, and drawn down to the breast, then across the breast, from left to right. The superior then told me to say the prayer, called Hail Mary. I attempted to do so, but failed, for though I had often repeated it after my father, I could not say it correctly alone. She then bade me join my hands and repeat it after her. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord be with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Jesus, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now, said the superior as I rose from my knees, you must learn every word of that prayer before tomorrow night or go without your supper. I tried my best to remember it, but with so little instruction, for she repeated it to me but once, I found it quite impossible the next night to say it correctly. Of course, I was compelled to go without my supper. This may seem a light punishment to those who have enough to eat, who sit down to a full table and satisfy their appetite three times per day, but to a nun who is allowed only enough to sustain life, it is quite a different thing, and especially to a child, this mode of punishment is more severe and harder to bear than almost any other. I thought I would take good care not to be punished in that way again, but I little knew what was before me. Before the superior left us, she assisted me into bed, and bade me be very still until the second bell in the morning. Then I must rise and dress as quickly as possible, and go to her room. Quietness she enjoined upon me as a virtue, while the least noise or disturbance of any kind would be punished as a crime. She said I must walk very softly indeed along the walls, and close the doors so carefully that not a sound could be heard. After giving me these first instructions in convent life, she left me, and I was allowed to sleep the rest of the night. The next morning I awoke at the ringing of the first bell, but I did not dare to stir until the second bell, when the other girls arose in great haste. I then dressed as quickly as possible, but not a word was spoken, 
not a thought and scarcely a look exchanged i was truly alone amid a crowd and i felt the utter loneliness of my situation most keenly yet i saw very clearly that there was but one course for me to pursue and that was to obey in all things to have no will of my own and thus if possible escape punishment but it was hard very hard for me to bring my mind to this i had been the idolized child of affection too long to submit readily and patiently to the privations i was now forced to endure hitherto my will had been law i had naturally an imperious violent temper which i had never been taught to govern instead of this my appetites were pampered my passions indulged and every desire gratified as far as possible until that last sad parting i hardly knew what it was to have a request refused and now to experience such a change, such a sudden transition from the most liberal indulgence to the most cruel and rigorous self-denial. Oh, it was a severe trial to my independent spirit to submit to it. Yet submit I must, for I had learned even then that my newly appointed guardians were not to be trifled with henceforth obedience must be my motto to every command however cruel and unjust i must yield a blind passive and unquestioning obedience i dressed as quickly as possible and hastened down to the superior as i passed through the hall i thought i would be very careful to step softly but in my haste i forgot what she said about closing the door and it came together with a loud crash on entering the room i found the superior waiting for me in her hand she held a stick about a foot long to the end of which was attached nine leather strings some twelve or fifteen inches long and about the size of a man's little finger she bade me come to her in a voice so cold and stern it sent a thrill of terror through my frame and i trembled with the apprehension of some impending evil i had no idea that she was about to punish me for i was not aware that i had done anything to deserve it but her looks frightened me and i feared i know not what she took hold of my arm and without saying a word gave me ten or twelve strokes over the head and shoulders with this miniature cat and nine tails truly with her it was a word and a blow and the blow came first wherever the strings chanced to fall upon the bare flesh they raised the skin as though a hot iron had been applied to it in some places they took off the skin entirely and left the flesh raw and quivering with the stinging pain i could not think at first what i had done to deserve this severe punishment nor did she condescend to enlighten me but when i began to cry and beg to go to my father she sternly bade me stop crying at once for i could not go to my father i must stay here she said and learn to remember all her commands and obey them she then taught me the following verse i am a little nun the sisters i will mind when i am pretty and learn then they will use me kind i must not be so noisy when i go about the house I'll close the doors so softly they'll think I am a mouse. This verse I repeated until I could say it correctly. I was then taken to the breakfast room where I was directed to kneel before the crucifix 
and say my prayers, which I repeated after the superior. I was then seated at the table and directed to hold my head down and fix my eyes upon my plate. I must not look at any one or gaze about the room, but sit still and quietly eat what was given me. I had upon my plate one thin slice of wheat bread, a bit of potato, and a very small cup of milk. This was my stated allowance, and I could have no more, however hungry I might be. The same quantity was given me every meal, when in usual health, until I was ten years of age. On fast days no food whatever was allowed, and we always fasted for three meals before receiving the sacrament. This ceremony was observed every third day, therefore we were obliged to fast about one-third of the time, yet however long the fast might be, my allowance of food was never increased. After breakfast the superior took me to Priest Dow for confession. He kept me with him all day, allowing me neither food nor drink, nor did he permit me to break my fast until four o'clock the next day. I then received what they call the sacrament for the first time. To prepare for this, I was clad in a white dress and cape, and a white cap on my head. I was then led to the chapel, and passing up the aisle, knelt before the altar. Priest Dow then came and stood before me, and taking from a wine-glass a small thin wafer, he placed it upon my tongue, at the same time repeating some Latin words, which the superior afterwards told me mean in English, the body and blood of Christ. I was taught to believe that I held in my mouth the real body and blood of Christ. I was also told that if I swallowed the wafer before it had melted on my tongue, it would choke me to death, and if I indulged an evil thought while I held it in my mouth, I should fall into a pool of blood. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter Three. While in the White Nunnery, I spent most of my time in the nursery, but the name gives one no idea of the place. The freedom and careless gaiety, so characteristic of other nurseries, had no place in this. No cheerful conversation, no juvenile merriment, or pleasurable excitement of any kind were ever allowed. A merry laugh, on the contrary, a witty jest, or a sly practical joke, would have been punished as the most heinous offence. Here, as elsewhere in the establishment, the strictest rules of silence and obedience were rigidly enforced. There were twenty little girls in the room with me, but we were never permitted to speak to each other, nor to any one except a priest or a superior. When directly addressed by either of them, we were allowed to answer, but we might never ask a question, or make a remark, or in any way either by looks, words, or signs, hold communication with one another. Whenever we did so, it was at the risk of being discovered and severely punished. Yet this did not repress the desire for conversation. It only made us more cautious, artful, and deceptive. The only recreation allowed us was fifteen minutes' exercise in the yard 
every morning and evening. We might then amuse ourselves as we chose, but were required to spend the whole time in some kind of active exercise. If one of our number ventured to sit still, we were all punished the next day by being kept in the house. It was my business, while in the nursery, to dust all the furniture and the floor with a flannel mop made and kept for this purpose. The floors were all painted and varnished and very easily kept clean. Two hours and a half each day we spent with a priest, whom we were to call Father Darity. I do not know as I spell this and other names correctly, but I give it to the reader as it sounded to my ear. He appeared to take great pleasure in learning us to repeat the prayers and catechisms required by Priest Dow. He also gave us a variety of instructions in other things, enjoining in particular the most absolute obedience and perfect silence. He assured us that if we dared to disobey him in the least particular, he should know it, even if he was not present with us at the time. He said he knew all our thoughts, words and actions, and if we did not obey, he should eat us with a grain of salt. I presume my reader will smile at this and exclaim, How absurd! Yes, to you it is absurd, but to the mind of a child who placed the utmost confidence in his veracity, it was an evidence that he was invested with supernatural powers. For myself I believed every word he said, and nothing would have tempted me to disobey him. Perfect obedience he considered the highest attainment, and to secure this the greatest of all virtues, no means were thought too severe. We were frightened and punished in every possible way. But, though Father Darity acted on the one great principle with the Romanists, that the end sanctifies the means, he was in general a much kinder man than Priest Dow. He urged us on with our catechism as fast as possible, telling us as a motive to greater diligence that the bishop was soon to visit us and that we could not be admitted to his presence until we had our prayers and catechism perfectly. One day, when we were in the yard at play, I told one of the girls that I did not like to live there, that I did not like the people in the house, that I wished to return to my father, and I should tell him so the first time he came to see me. Then you like to live with your father, said she? I told her I did, for I could then do as I pleased without the fear of punishment. She said that she did not like to live there any better than I did. I asked her why she did not go away if she disliked to stay. She replied, I would like to go away well enough if I had any friends to go to, but my father and mother are both dead, and I have no home but this. So you see, I must stay here if they wish me to. But there is one consolation. If we are good girls, and try to do right, they will be kind to us. I made no further remark, but the moment we returned to the house, she told the superior what I said taking good care not to repeat her own expressions, and leaving the superior to infer that she had made no reply. I saw at once by the stern look that came over the lady's face that she was very angry, and I would gladly have recalled those few hasty words had it been in my power to have done so. She immediately left the room, but soon returned with Priest Dow. His countenance also indicated anger, as he took hold of my arm and led me to a darkened room, in which several candles were burning. Here I saw three scenes, 
which I think must have been composed of images, pictures, and curtains. I do not pretend to describe them correctly. I can only tell how they appeared to me. The first was an image of Christ on the cross, with his arms extended as we usually see them in pictures. On his right hand was a representation of heaven, and on the left of hell. Heaven was made to appear like a bright, beautiful, and glorious place. A wall of pink color surrounded it, and in the center was a spring of clear water. In the midst of this spring stood a tree, bearing on every limb a lighted candle, and on the top the image of Christ and a dove. Hell was surrounded by a black wall, within which there was also a spring. But the water was very black, and beside it stood a black image, with horns on its head, a long tail, and a large cloven foot. The place where it stood was in deep shadow, made to resemble, as neatly as possible, clouds and darkness. The priest led me up to this fearful object, and placed me on one side of it, while he stood on the other. But it would turn away from him towards me, roll up its great eyes, open its mouth, and show its long white tusks. The priest said it turned from him, because he was a good man, and I was very wicked. He said that it was the devil, come up from the bottomless pit, to devour me, and if I said such wicked things again, it would carry me off. I was very much frightened, for I then thought that all he said was true, that those image which I now know were strung on wires were really what they were made to represent. In fact, until I was fifteen years old, I really believed that the image I saw then was an evil spirit, but since that time I have been made to know that the priests themselves are the only evil spirits about the place. Priest Dow then led me back to the nursery, and left me with the superior, but he soon came back, saying he knew what I was thinking about, that I had wicked thoughts about him, thought that he was a bad man, and that I wished to leave him and go to my father. Now this was all true, and the fact that he knew it frightened me accordingly. It was a sure proof that what Father Darity said was true. But how could I ever be safe if they could thus read the inmost secrets of my soul? I did dislike them all very much indeed, and I could not help it. How then could I avert the consequences of this deep aversion to convent life, since it could not be concealed? Was it possible for me so far to conquer myself as to love the persons with whom I lived? How many nights did I lie awake pondering this question and resolving to make the effort? I was, of course, too young to know that it was only by shrewd guessing and a general knowledge of human nature that he was enabled to tell my thoughts so correctly. Now, said he, for indulging these dreadful thoughts, I shall take you back to the devil and give you up to him. I was frightened before, but I have no words to describe my feelings when he again led me back and left me beside the image, saying, as he closed the door, If the devil groans three times, and the Lord does not speak, you must stay here until tomorrow at this time. I trembled so that I could hardly stand, and when after a few moments a sound like a groan fell upon my ears, I shrieked in the extremity of terror. Footnote. Siui, formerly a Benedictine monk, giving an account of his imprisonment at Rome after his conversion, says, One evening, after listening to a discourse filled 
with dark images of death, I returned to my room, and found the light set upon the ground. I took it up, and approached the table to place it there. But what was my horror and consternation at beholding spread out upon it, a whitened skeleton. Before the reader can comprehend my dismay, it is necessary he should reflect, for a moment, on the peculiarities of childhood, especially in a Romish country, where children are seldom spoken to except in superstitious language, whether by their parents or teachers, and domestics adopt the same style to answer their own purposes, menacing their disobedient charges with hobgoblins, phantoms, and witches. Such images as these make a profound impression on tender minds, leaving a panic terror which the reasoning of after years is often unable entirely to efface. There can be no doubt but that this pernicious habit is the fruit of the noxious plant fostered in the Vatican. Rising generations must be brought up in superstitious terror in order to render them susceptible to every kind of absurdity, for this terror is the powerful spring employed by the priests and friars to move at their pleasure families, cities, provinces, nations. Although in families of the higher order this method of alarming infancy is much discountenanced, nevertheless it is impossible but that it should in some degree prevail in the nursery nor was it probable that I should escape this infection's malady, having passed my whole days in an atmosphere charged more than any other with that impure miasma priestcraft. Then immediately I heard the question, and it seemed to come from the figure of Christ. Will you obey? Will you leave off sin? I answered in the affirmative as well as I could, for the convulsive sobs that shook my frame almost stopped my utterance. I now know that when the priest left me he placed himself, or an assistant, behind a curtain close to the images, and it was his voice that I heard, but I was then too young to detect their treacherous practices and deceitful ways. On being taken back to the superior, I was immediately attacked with severe illness, and had fits all night. It seemed to me that I could see that image of the devil everywhere. If I closed my eyes, I thought I could feel him on my bed, pressing on my breast, and he was so heavy I could scarcely breathe. I was very sick, and suffered much bodily pain but the tortures of an excited imagination were greater by far and harder to bear than any physical suffering. For long years after, that image haunted my dreams, and even now I often, in sleep, live over again the terrors of that fearful scene. I was sick a long time, how long I do not know, but I became so weak I could not raise myself in bed, and they had an apparatus fixed to the wall to raise me with. For several days I took no nourishment, except a teaspoonful of brandy and water which was given to me as often as I could take it. I continued to have fits every day for more than two years, nor did I ever entirely recover from the effects of that fright. Even now, though years have passed away, a little excitement or a sudden shock will sometimes throw me into one of those fits. End of chapter 3、Chapter、4 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery 
at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter 4. A Slave for Life. During this illness I was placed under the care of an abbess whom they called Saint Bridget. There were many other abbesses in the convent, but she was the principal one and had the care of all the clothing. If the others wished for clean clothes, they were obliged to go to her for them. In that way I saw them all, but did not learn their names. They approached me and looked at me, but seldom spoke. This I thought very strange, but I now know they dared not speak. One day an abbess came to my bed, and after standing a few moments, with the tears silently flowing down her cheeks, asked me if I had a mother. I told her I had not, and I began to weep most bitterly. I was very weak, and the question recalled to my mind the time when I shared a father's love and enjoyed my liberty. Then I could go and come as I chose, but now a slave for life. I could have no will of my own. I must go at bidding and come at command. This, I am well aware, may seem to some extravagant language, but I use the right word. I was literally a slave, and of all kinds of slavery, that which exists in a convent is the worst. I say, the worst because the story of wrong and outrage, which occasionally finds its way to the public ear, is not generally believed. You pity the poor black man who bends beneath the scourge of southern bondage, for the tale comes to you from those who have seen his tears and heard his groans. But you have no tears, no prayers, no efforts for the poor helpless nun who toils and dies beneath the heartless cruelty of an equally oppressive taskmaster. No, for her you have no sympathy, for you do not believe her word. Within those precincts of cruelty no visitor is ever admitted. No curious eye may witness the secrets of their prison house. Consequently, there is no one to bear direct testimony to the truth of her statements. Even now, methinks, I see your haughty brow contract, and your lip curl with scorn, as with supreme contempt you throw down these pages and exclaim, "'Tis all a fiction, just got up to make money, no proof that it is true." No proof, do you say? Oh, that the strong arm of the law would interpose on our behalf, that some American Napoleon would come forth and break open these prison doors and drag forth to the light of day those hidden instruments of torture. There would then be proof enough to satisfy the most incredulous that so far from being exaggerated, the half has not been told. Sons of America, will you not arise in your might and demand that these convent doors be opened and the oppressed allowed to go free? Or, if this be denied, sweep from the fair earth the black-hearted wretches who dare, in the very face of heaven, to commit such fearful outrages upon helpless, suffering humanity. How long, oh, how long will you suffer these dens of iniquity to remain unopened? How long permit this system of priestly cruelty to continue? But I am wandering from my story. Would that I might forever wander from it, that I might at once blot from memory's page the fearful recollection that must follow me to my grave. Yet painful as it is to rehearse the past, if I can but awaken your sympathy for other sufferers, 
if I can but excite you to efforts for their deliverance, it is all I ask, I shall have my reward. But to return to my story. The abbess saw how deeply I was grieved, and immediately left the room. St. Bridget told me not to cry, for she would be a mother to me as long as I remained with her, and she was true to her promise. Another sister who sometimes came to my room, I believe was crazy. She would run up to my bed, put her hand on me, and burst into a loud and hearty laugh. This she repeated as often as she came, and I told the abbess one day I did wish that sister would not come to see me, for she acted so strange. I was afraid of her. She replied, Do not care for her. She always does just so. But we do not mind her. You must be careful what you say, she continued, for if you speak of her before any of the sisters, they may get you into trouble. When I began to get better, I had a sharp appetite for food, and was hungry a great part of the time. One of the sisters used to bring me a piece of bread concealed under her cape and hide it under my pillow. How she obtained it I do not know, unless she saved it from her own allowance. It was very easy for her to hide it in this way, for the nuns always walk with one hand under their cape and the other by the side. Truly, in this instance, bread eaten in secret was pleasant. Of all the luxuries I ever tasted, those stolen bits of bread were the sweetest. During my illness, I thought a great deal about my father, and wondered why he did not come to see me, as he had promised. I used to cry for him in my sleep, and very often awoke in tears. St. Bridget sought every possible way to make me forget him, and the priest would tell me that I need not think so much about him, for he no longer cared for me. He said that the devil had got him, and I would never see him again. Those cruel words, so far from making me forget, served to awaken a still greater desire to see him, and increased my grief because I was denied the privilege. In the room with me were six other little girls, who were all sick at the same time, and St. Bridget took care of us all. For two of the little girls I felt the greatest sympathy. They were quite young, I think not more than three years of age, and they grieved continually. They made no complaint, did not even shed a tear, but they sobbed all the time, whether asleep or awake. Of their history I could learn nothing at that time, except the fact that they were taken from their parents for the good of their souls. I afterwards overheard a conversation that led me to think that they were heirs to a large property, which, if they were out of the way, would go to the church. But it is of what I know, and not what I think, that I have undertaken to write, and I do know that the fate of those little girls was hard in the extreme, whatever might have been the cause of their being there. Poor little creatures, no wonder their hearts were broken, torn from parents and friends, while yet in early childhood, doomed while life is spared, to be subject to the will of those who know no mercy, who feel no pity, but consider it a religious duty to crush and destroy all the pure affections, all the exquisite sensibilities of the human soul. Yet to them these hapless babes must look for all the earthly happiness they could hope to enjoy. They were taught to obey them in all things, and consider them their only friends and protectors. I never saw them after I left that room, but they did not live long. 
I was glad they did not, for in the cold grave their sufferings would be over, and they would rest in peace. Oh, how little do Protestants know the sufferings of a nun, and truly no one can know them except by personal experience. One may imagine the most aggravated form of cruelty, the most heart-rending agonies, yet I do believe the conception of the most active imagination would fall far short of the horrible reality. I do not believe there was one happy individual in that convent, or that any one there, if I accept the lady superior, knew anything of enjoyment. Life with them was a continual round of ceaseless toil and bitter self-denial, while each one had some secret grief slowly but surely gnawing away the heart-strings. I have sometimes seen the abbess sitting by the bedside of the sick, with her eyes closed, while the big tears fell unchecked over her pale cheeks. When I asked her why she wept, she would shake her head, but never speak. I now know that she dare not speak for fear of punishment. The abbesses in the various parts of this convent are punished as much as the nuns if they dare to disobey the rules of the priests, and if the least of these are broken in the presence of any one in the house, they will surely tell of it at confession. In fact, they are required to do this, and if it is known that one has seen a rule broken, or a command disobeyed without reporting it, a severe punishment is sure to follow. Thus, every individual is a spy upon the rest, and while every failure is visited with condign punishment, the one who makes the most reports is so warmly approved that poor human nature can hardly resist the temptation to play the traitor. Friendship cannot exist within the walls of a convent, for no one can be trusted, even with the most trifling secret. Whoever ventures to try it is sure to be betrayed. While I was sick, Father Darity came often to see me, and by his kindness succeeded in gaining my affections. I was a great favorite with him. He always called me his little girl, and tried in every way to make me contented. He wished to make me say that I was happy there, that I liked to live with them as well as with my father. But I could never be persuaded to say this, for it was not the truth, and I would not tell a falsehood unless forced to do so. He said I must be a good girl, and he hoped I would sometimes see better times. But I could never see my father again, and I must not desire it. He advised me, however hard it might be, to try and love all who came into the nunnery, even those who were unkind, who wished to injure me or wound my feelings. He told me how Jesus Christ loved his enemies, how he died for them a cruel death on the cross, how amid his bitter agonies he prayed for them, and with his expiring breath he cried, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And now, said he, can you do as Jesus Christ did? He has set you an example. Can you not follow it? No, sir, I replied. I cannot love those who punish me so cruelly, so unjustly. I cannot love the little girl who reported what I said in the yard, when she said as bad things as I did. But you forget, said he, that in doing this she only obeyed the rules of the house. She only did her duty. If you had done yours, you would have reported her. I'll never do that, I exclaimed, emboldened by his kindness. It is a bad rule, and 
hush hush child he cried interrupting me do you know to whom you are speaking and do you forget that you are a little girl are you wiser than your teachers i must give you a penance for those naughty words and you will pray for a better spirit he said much more to me and gave me good advice that i remember much better than i followed he enjoined if upon me to keep up good courage as i would gain my health faster he then bade me farewell telling me not to forget to repeat certain prayers as a penance for my sin in speaking so boldly oh did he think when he talked to me so kindly so faithfully that it was his last opportunity to give me good advice did he know that he left me to return no more i saw nothing unusual in his appearance and i did not suspect that it was the last time i should see his pleasant face and listen to his kindly voice i loved that man and bitter were the tears i shed when i learned that i should never see him again the abbess informed me that he was sent away for something he had done she did not know what oh that something i knew well enough what it was he had a kind heart he could feel for the unfortunate and that with the roman catholics is an unpardonable sin end of chapter four Chapter 5 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter 5 Ceremony of Confirmation. I continued to regain my health slowly and the abbess said they would soon send me back to the nursery. I could not endure the thought of this, for I had the greatest fear of the abbess who had the charge of that department. She was very cruel, while St. Bridget was as kind as she dared to be. She knew full well that if she allowed herself to exhibit the least feeling of affection for those children, she would be instantly removed, and some one placed over them who would not give way to such weakness. We all saw how it was, and loved her all the more for the severity of her reproofs when any one was near. With tears, therefore, I begged to be allowed to stay with her, and when the priest came for me, she told him that she thought I had better remain with her till I gained a little more strength. To this he consented, and I was very grateful indeed for the kindness. Wishing in some way to express my gratitude, as soon as I was able, I assisted in taking care of the other girls as much as possible. St. Bridget, in turn, taught me to read a little, so that I could learn my prayers when away from her. She also gave me a few easy lessons in arithmetic, and instructed me to speak the Celt language. She always spoke in that, or the French, which I could speak before, having learned it from the family where I lived after my father gave up his saloon. They were French Catholics, and spoke no other language. As soon as I was sufficiently recovered to leave my room, I was taken to the chapel to be confirmed. Before they came for me, the abbess told me what questions would be asked, and the answers I should be required to give. She said they would ask me if I wished to see my father, if I should like to go back to the world, etc. To these and similar questions she said I must give a negative answer. But, said I, that will be a falsehood, and I will not say so for any of them. 
"'Hush, hush, child!' she exclaimed, with a frightened look. "'You must not talk so. From my heart I pity you, but it will be better for you to answer as I tell you, for if you refuse they will punish you till you do. Remember,' she added, emphatically, "'remember what I say. It will be better for you to do as I tell you, and she made me promise that I would.' "'But why do they wish me to tell a lie?' I asked. "'They do not wish you to tell a lie,' she replied. "'They wish you to do right and feel right, "'to be contented and willing to forget the world.' "'But I do not wish to forget the world,' I said. "'I am not contented, and saying that I am will not make me feel so. "'Is it right to tell a lie?' It is right for you to obey, she replied, with more severity in her tone than I had ever heard before. Do you know, she continued, that it is a great sin for you to talk so? A sin? I exclaimed in astonishment. Why is it a sin? Because, she replied, you have no right to inquire why a command is given. Whatever the church commands, we must obey, and that, too, without question or complaint. If we are not willing to do this, it is the duty of the bishop and the priests to punish us until we are willing. All who enter a convent renounce forever their own will. But I didn't come here myself, said I. My father put me here to stay a few years. When I am eighteen, I shall go out again. That does not make any difference, she replied. You are here, and your duty is obedience. But, my dear, she continued, I advise you never again to speak of going out, for it can never be. By indulging such hopes, you are preparing yourself for a great disappointment. By speaking of it, you will... I assure you, get yourself into trouble. You may not find others so indulgent as I am. Therefore, for your own sake, I hope you will relinquish all idea of ever leaving the convent and try to be contented. Such was the kind of instruction I received at the White Nunnery. I did not feel as much disappointed at the information that I was never to go into the world again, as she had expected. I had felt for a long time, almost indeed from my first entrance, that such would be my fate, and though deeply grieved, I was able to control my feelings. The great day at length came, for which the abbess had been so long preparing me. I say great, for in our monotonous life, the smallest circumstance seemed important. Moreover, I was assured that my future happiness depended very much upon the answers I, that day, gave to the various questions put to me. When about to be taken to the chapel, St. Bridget begged the priest to be careful and not frighten me, lest it should bring on my fits again. I was led to the chapel and made to kneel before the altar. The bishop and five priests were present, and also a man whom I had never seen before, but I was told he was the Pope's nuncio, and that he came a long way to visit them. I think this was true, for they all seemed to regard him as a superior. I shall never forget my feelings when he asked me the following questions which I answered as I had been directed. Who do you believe in? God. How many persons are there in God? Three. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. What world have you lately left? The world of sin and Satan. Do you wish to go back and live with your Father? No, sir. 
Do you think you can live all your life with us? I think I can, sir. He then said, You will not fare any better than you have hitherto, and perhaps not as well. It was with the greatest difficulty that I could control my feelings sufficiently to answer this last question, but remembering what the abbess had told me, I suppressed my tears and choked down the rising sob. Surely these men must have known that I was telling a falsehood, that the profession I made was not in accordance with my real sentiments. For myself I then felt, and still feel, that the guilt was not mine, the sin did not rest with me. The bishop was then told to hear my confession, after which a priest took some ointment from a small box and rubbed it on my forehead, and another priest came with a towel and wiped it off. I was then taken back to St. Bridget, with whom I remained as long as I was in the white nunnery. On my tenth birthday, the bishop came to the abbess very early in the morning and informed her that I was to take the white veil that day, and immediately after the ceremony I would leave for the grey nunnery in Montreal. He desired her to make all the necessary preparation and take her leave of me, as she would not see me again. This was sad news for us both for I felt that she was my only friend, and I knew that she felt for me the most sincere affection. She gave me much good advice in reference to my future conduct, and with tears exhorted me to be kind, cheerful, and obedient. I was going to a new place, she said, and if I was a good girl and sought to please my superiors, I would find someone to be kind to me. She advised me to try and appear contented in whatever situation I might be placed, and above all other considerations, never disobey the least command. Obedience, she again repeated, is the rule in all convents, and it will be better for you to obey at once and cheerfully and willingly comply with every request than to incur displeasure and perhaps punishment by any appearance of reluctance or hesitation. If there is any one thing that you dislike to do, be sure that you do not betray your feelings, for if you do, that will be the very thing they require of you, and I assure you if you once become the object of suspicion or dislike, your condition will be anything but agreeable. You will be marked and watched, and required to do many unpleasant things, to say the least. Therefore, I hope you will perform all your duties with a cheerful and willing spirit. Bitterly did I grieve at the thought of being separated, from the only being on earth who seemed to care for me. In the anguish of the moment I wished I might die. St. Bridget reproved me, saying encouragingly that death was the coward's refuge, sought only by those who had not the resolution to meet, endure, or overcome the trials of life. She exhorted me to courage perseverance and self-denial, saying that if I fought life's battle bravely, I would have my reward. She changed all my clothes and assisted me to put on a white dress and cape and a white cap and veil. She then gave me a card of good behavior, embraced me for the last time, and led me out to the bishop who was waiting to conduct me to the chapel where the ceremony was to be performed. I there met ten other little girls, who, like myself, were compelled to take upon themselves vows they did not understand, and thus 
by an apparently voluntary act, consign themselves to slavery for life. They were all strangers to me, sent here, as I afterwards learned, from some nunnery in Ireland, where they had friends who were too solicitous for their welfare. The priests do not wish the nuns to see friends from the world, and they will frame almost any plausible excuse to prevent it. But when the friends become too urgent, as they sometimes do, and their inventive powers are taxed too severely, or if the task of furnishing so many excuses become too irksome, the poor hapless victims are sent off to some other nunnery, and the friends are told that they were not contented, and wished to go to some other place, and that they, generous creatures that they are, have at length, after much solicitation, kindly consented to their removal. And this too, when they know that these very girls are grieving their lives away for a sight of those dear friends, who, they are confidently assured, are either dead or have entirely forgotten them. Can the world of woe itself furnish deceit of a darker dye? The bishop led me up to the altar, and put a lighted candle into my hand. He then went under the altar on which a lighted candle was placed, and soon returned, followed by two little boys whom they called apostles. They held each a lighted torch with which they proceeded to light two more candles. On a table near the altar stood a coffin, and soon two priests entered bearing another coffin, which they placed beside the other. A white cloth was spread over them, and burning candles placed at the head and foot. These movements frightened me exceedingly, for I thought they were going to kill me. Forgetting in my terror that I was not allowed to speak, I asked the bishop if he was going to kill me. Kill you? he exclaimed. Oh, no! Don't be frightened. I shall not hurt you in the least. But it is our custom, when a nun takes the veil, to lay her in a coffin to show that she is dead to the world. Did not St. Bridget tell you this? I told him she did not but I did not dare to tell him that I supposed she felt so bad when she found I must leave her, that she entirely forgot it. He then asked, very pleasantly, which of the two coffins I liked the best, saying I could have my choice. I replied, I have no choice. This was true, for although he assured me to the contrary, I still believed he was about to kill me, and I cared very little about my coffin. They were both large enough for a grown person, and beautifully finished, with a large silver plate on the lid. The bishop took me up in his arms, and laid me in one of them, and bade me close my eyes. I lay in that coffin a long time, as it seemed to me without the least motion. I was so much alarmed, I felt as though I could not even lift a finger. Meanwhile the bishop and priests read alternately from a book, but in a language I could not understand. Occasionally they would come and feel my hands and feet, and say to each other, She is very cold. I believe they were afraid I should die in their hands of fear. When at last they took me up, they told me that I would carry that coffin to Montreal with me, that I would be laid in it when robed for the grave, and that my bones would moulder to dust in it. I shall never forget the impression these words made on my mind. There was something so horrible 
in the thought of carrying a coffin about with me all my life, constantly reminding me of the shortness of time and the sure approach of death, I could not endure it. Gladly would I have left it, costly and elegant as it was, choosing rather to run the risk of being buried without one, but this was not allowed. I could have no choice in the matter. These ceremonies concluded, I was taken to a small room, and a woman assisted me to change my clothes again, and put on the grey nunnery suit. This consisted of a grey dress and shoes, and a black cap. Each nunnery has a peculiar dress, which every nun is required to wear. Thus, on meeting one of them, it is very easy to tell what establishment she belongs to, and a runaway is easily detected. On leaving the chapel, I was taken to the steamboat with the other ten girls, accompanied by a priest. Our coffins were packed in cotton and placed on the boat with us. On arrival at Montreal, we found a priest and two nuns waiting for us to conduct us to the nunnery. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter Six The Grey Nunnery. The Grey Nunnery is situated on St. Paul Street, Montreal. It is four stories high, besides the basement. It occupies a large space of ground. I do not know how much, but it is a very extensive building. The roof is covered with tin, with a railing around it, finished at the top with sharp points that look like silver, about a foot in length and three feet apart. Over the front door there is a porch, covered with a profusion of climbing plants, which give it a beautiful appearance. The building stands in a large yard, surrounded on all sides by a high fence, so high indeed that people who pass along the street can see no part of the nunnery except the silver points on the roof. The top of this fence is also finished with long iron spikes. Everything around the building seems expressly arranged to keep the inmates in and intruders out. In fact, it would be nearly impossible for anyone to gain a forcible or clandestine admission to any part of the establishment. There are several gates in the fence, how many I do not know but the front gate opens on St. Anne Street. Over each of the gates hangs a bell, connected with the bells in the rooms of the superior and abbesses, which ring whenever the gate is opened. There is always a guard of two men at each gate who walk up and down with guns upon their shoulders. While attempting to give a brief description of this building, I may as well say that it is constructed with non-conductors between the walls, so that the ringing of a bell or the loudest shriek could not be heard from one room to the other. The reader will please bear this in mind, as the reason for the precaution will appear in the course of my narrative. The priest who met us as we left the boat conducted us to the front door and rang the bell. Soon a lady appeared, who drew a slide in the middle of the door, exposing one pane of glass. Through this she looked, to see who was there, and when satisfied on this point, opened the door. Here let me remark that since I left the nunnery, I have heard of another class of people, who find it convenient to have a slide in their door, 
and if I am not very much mistaken, the character of the two houses, or rather the people who live in them, are very much alike, whether they are nunneries of private families, Catholics or Protestants. Honest people have no need of a slide in the door, and where there is so much precaution, may we not suppose that something behind the curtain imperatively calls for it? It is an old adage, but true notwithstanding, that where there is concealment there must be something wrong. In the hall, opposite the front door, were two other doors, with a considerable space between them. The right-hand door was opened by the door-tender, and we entered a room furnished in the plainest manner, but everything was neat and in perfect order. Instead of chairs on two sides of the room, a long bench was fastened to the sides of the house. They were neither painted nor cushioned, but were very white, as was also the floor, on which there was no carpet. Beside the door stood a basin of holy water, and directly opposite an image of the Saviour extended on the cross, which they call a crucifix. Here we were left a few moments. Then the doorkeeper came back, and asked us if we would like to see the black cloisters, and if so, to follow her. She led us back into the hall, and in the space between the two doors that I mentioned, she unlocked a bar, and pulling it down, touched a spring, and immediately a little square door slid back into the ceiling. Across this door, or window, or whatever they called it, were strong bars of iron about one inch apart. Through this aperture we were allowed to look, and a sad sight met my eyes. As many as fifty disconsolate-looking ladies were sitting there, who were called black nuns, because they were preparing to take the black veil. They were all dressed in black, a black cap on the head, and a white bandage drawn across the forehead, to which another was attached that passed under the chin. These bandages they always wore, and were not allowed to lay aside. They sat, each one with a book in her hand, motionless as so many statues. Not a finger did they move, not an eye was raised, but they sat gazing upon the page before them, as intently as though life itself depended upon it. Our guide informed us that they were studying the black book preparatory to taking the black veil and entering the cloister. This book was quite a curiosity. It was very large, with a white cover, and around the edge a black border about an inch wide. The black book, or Praxis Sacra Romance Inquisitionis, is always the model for that which is to succeed it. This book is a large manuscript volume in folio, and is carefully preserved by the head of the Inquisition. It is called Libro Nero, the black book, because it has a cover of that color, or as an inquisitor explained to me, Libro Necro, which, in the Greek language, signifies the book of the dead. In this book is the criminal code, with all the punishments for every supposed crime also the mode of conducting the trial, so as to elicit the guilt of the accused, and the manner of receiving accusations. I had this book in my hand on one occasion, and read therein the proceedings relative to my own case, and I moreover saw, in this same volume, some very astounding particulars. For example, in the list of punishments I read concerning the bit, or as it is called by us, the mordakia, which is a very simple contrivance to confine the tongue and compress it between two cylinders composed of iron and wood and furnished with spikes. This 
horrible instrument not only wounds the tongue and occasions excessive pain, but also from the swelling it produces, frequently places the sufferer in danger of suffocation. This torture is generally had recourse to in cases considered as blasphemy against God, the Virgin, the Saints, or the Pope, so that according to the Inquisition it is as great a crime to speak disparagingly of a Pope, who may be a very detestable character, as to blaspheme the holy name of God. Be that as it may, this torture has been in use till the present period, and to say nothing of the exhibitions of this nature which were displayed in Romanga in the time of Gregory the Sixteenth, by the Inquisitor Ancarini, in Umbria by Stefanelli, Salva, and others, we may admire the inquisitorial seal of Cardinal Ferretti, the cousin of his present holiness, who condescended more than once to employ these means when he was bishop of Rieti and Fermo. Dealings with the Inquisition by the Rev. Giacinto Achille D.D., late prior and visitor of the Dominican Order, head professor of theology and vicar of the master of the sacred apostolic palace, etc., etc., page 81. Our curiosity being satisfied as far as possible, we returned to the side room, where we waited long for the lady superior. When at length she came, she turned to me first, as I sat next the door, and asked me if I had anything to show in proof of my former good character. I gave her my card. She looked at it and led me to the other side of the room. The same question was asked of every girl in turn. When it was found that only four beside myself had cards of good behavior, the other six presented cards which she said were for bad behavior. They were all placed together on the other side of the room, and as the superior was about to lead them away, one of them came towards us, saying that she did not wish to stay with those girls, she would rather go with us. The superior drew her back, and replied, No, child, you cannot go with those good girls, you would soon learn them some of your naughty ways. If you will do wrong, you must take the consequences. Then, seeing that the child really felt very bad, she said in a kinder tone, When you learn to do right, you shall be allowed to go with good girls, but not before. I pitied the poor child, and for a long time I hoped to see her come to our room, but she never came. They were all led off together, and that was the last I ever saw of any of them. I was taken, with the other four girls, to a room on the second floor. Here we found five cribs, one for each of us, in which we slept. Our food was brought to us regularly, consisting of one thin slice of fine wheat bread for each of us, and a small cup of milk. It was only in the morning, however, that the milk was allowed us, and for dinner and supper we had a slice of bread and a cup of water. This was not half enough to satisfy our hunger, but we could have no more. For myself I can say that I was hungry all the time, and I know the others were also, but we could not say so to each other. We were in that room together five weeks yet not one word passed between us. We did sometimes smile, or shake our heads, or make some little sign, though even this was prohibited, but we never ventured to speak. We were forbidden to do so, on pain of severe punishment, and I believe we were watched all the time, and kept there for a trial of our obedience. We were employed in peeling a soft kind of wood for beds, 
and filling the ticks with it. We were directed to make our own beds, keep our room in the most perfect order, and all our work in the middle of the floor. The superior came up every morning to see that we were thoroughly washed, and every Saturday she was particular to have our clothes and bed linen all changed. As every convenience was provided in our rooms or the closets adjoining, we were not obliged to go out for anything, and for five weeks I did not go out of that room. My bed was then brought from Quebec, and we were moved to a large square room with four beds in it, only two of which were occupied. We were then sent to the kitchen, where in future we were to be employed in cleaning sauce, scouring knives and forks, and such work as we were able to do. As we grew older, our tasks were increased with our strength. I had no regular employment, but was called upon to do any of the drudgery that was to be done about the house. The superior came to the kitchen every morning after prayers, and told us what to do through the day. Then, in her presence, we were allowed five minutes' conversation, a priest also being present. For the rest of the day we kept a profound silence, not a word being spoken by any of us unless in answer to a question from some of our superiors. In one part of the building there was a school for young ladies, who were instructed in the various branches of education usually taught in Catholic schools. Many of the scholars boarded at the nunnery, and all the cooking and washing was done in the kitchen. We also did the cooking for the saloons in Montreal. If this did not keep us employed, there were corn brooms and brushes to make, and thus every moment was fully occupied. Not a moment of leisure, no rest, no recreation, but hard labor, and the still more laborious religious exercises filled up the time. It was sometimes very annoying to me to devote so many hours to mere external forms, for I felt, even when very young, that they were of little worth. But it was a severe trial to our temper to make so many pies, cakes, puddings, and all kinds of rich food which we were never allowed to taste. The priests, superiors, and the scholars had every luxury they desired, but the nuns who prepared all their choice dainties were never permitted to taste anything but bread and water. I am well aware that this statement will seem incredible, and that many will doubt the truth of it, but I repeat it, the nuns in the grey nunnery, or at least those in the kitchen with me, were allowed no food except bread and water, or, in the case of illness, water gruel. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter 7. Orphan's Home. The Grey Nunnery is said to be an orphan's home, and no effort is spared to make visitors believe that this is the real character of the house. I suppose it is true that one part of it is devoted to this purpose. At least my superior informed me that many children were kept there, and to those apartments visitors are freely admitted, but never to that part occupied by the nuns. We were never allowed to communicate with people from the world, nor with the children. In fact, during all the time I was there, I never saw one of them, nor did I ever enter the rooms where they were. 
In the ladies' school there were three hundred scholars, and in our part of the house two hundred and fifty nuns, besides the children who belonged to the nunnery. Add to these the abbesses, superiors, priests, and bishop, and one will readily imagine that the work for such a family was no trifling affair. In this nunnery the bishop was the highest authority, and everything was under his direction, unless the Pope's nuncio, or some other high church functionary, was present. I sometimes saw one whom they called the archbishop, who was treated with great deference by the priests, and even by the bishop himself. The Holy Mother, or Lady Superior, has power over all who have taken or are preparing to take the veil. Under her, other superiors or abbesses are appointed over the various departments, whose duty it is to look after the nuns and novices, and the children in training for nuns. The most rigid espionage is kept up throughout the whole establishment, and if any of these superiors or abbesses fail to do the duty assigned them, they are more severely punished than the nuns. Whenever I saw the lady superior is absent, the punishments are assigned by one of the priests. Of these there were a large number in the nunnery, and whenever we chanced to meet one of them, as we sometimes did when going about the house, or whenever one of them entered the kitchen, we must immediately fall upon our knees. No matter what we were doing, however busily employed, or however inconvenient it might be, everything must be left or set aside, that this senseless ceremony might be performed. The priest must be honoured, and woe to the poor nun who failed to move with sufficient alacrity. No punishment short of death itself was thought too severe for such criminal neglect. Sometimes it would happen that I would be engaged in some employment with my back to the door, and not observe the entrance of a priest, until the general movement around me would arrest my attention. Then I would hasten to make my manners, as the ceremony was called, but all too late. I had been remiss in duty, and no excuse would avail, no apology be accepted, no forgiveness granted, the dreaded punishment must come. While the nuns are thus severely treated, the priests and the Holy Mother live a very easy life, and have all the privileges they wish. So far as the things of this world are concerned, they seem to enjoy themselves very well, but I have sometimes wondered if conscience did not give them occasionally an unpleasant twinge, and from some things I have seen I believe that with many of them this is the fact. They may try to put far from them all thoughts of a judgment to come, yet I do believe that their slumbers are sometimes disturbed by fearful forebodings of a just retribution which may, after all, be in store for them. But whatever trouble of mind they may have, they do not allow it to interfere with their worldly pleasures and expensive luxuries. They have money enough, go when and where they please, eat the richest food, and drink the choicest wines. In short, if sensual enjoyment was the chief end of their existence, I do not know how they could act otherwise. The abbesses are sometimes allowed to go out, but not unless they have a pass from one of the priests, and if at any time they have reason to suspect that someone is discontented, they will not allow anyone to go out of the building without a careful attendant. My superior here, as in the white nunnery, was very kind to me. I sometimes feared she would share the fate of Father Darity, for she had a kind heart, and was guilty of many benevolent acts, which, if known, 
would have subjected her to very serious consequences. I became so much attached to her that my fears for her were always alarmed when she called me her good little girl, or used any such endearing expression. The sequel of my story will show that my fears were not unfounded. But let me not anticipate. Sorrows will thicken fast enough if we do not hasten them. I lived with this superior one year before I was consecrated, and it was, comparatively, a happy season. I was never punished unless it was to save me from less merciful hands, and then I would be shut up in a closet, or some such simple thing. The other four girls who occupied the room with me were consecrated at the same time. The bishop came to our room early one morning and took us to the chapel. At the door we were made to kneel and then crawl on our hands and knees to the altar, where sat a man who we were told was the archbishop. Two little boys came up from under the altar with the vesper lamp to burn incense. I suppose they were young apostles for they looked very much like those we had seen at the white nunnery, and were dressed in the same manner. The bishop turned his back, and they threw incense on his head and shoulders, until he was surrounded by a cloud of smoke. He bowed his head, smote upon his breast, and repeated something in Latin, or some other language that we did not understand. We were told to follow his example, and did so as nearly as possible. This ceremony over, the bishop told us to go up on to the altar on our knees, and when this feat was performed to his satisfaction, he placed a crown of thorns upon each of our heads. These crowns were made of bands of some firm material, which passed over the head and around the forehead. On the inside thorns were fastened, with the points downward, so that a very slight pressure would cause them to pierce the skin. This, I suppose, is intended to imitate the crown of thorns which our Saviour wore upon the cross. But what will it avail them to imitate the crucifixion and the crown of thorns, while justice and mercy are so entirely neglected? What will it avail to place a crown of thorns upon a child's head, or to bid her kneel before the image of the Saviour, or travel upstairs on her knees, while the way of salvation by Christ is never explained to her, while of real religion, holiness of heart, and purity of life, she is as ignorant as the most benighted, degraded heathen. Is it rational to suppose that the mere act of repeating a prayer can heal the wounded spirit, or give peace to a troubled conscience? Can the most cruel penance remove the sense of guilt, or whisper hope to the desponding soul? Ah, no. I have tried it long enough to speak with absolute certainty. For years I practiced these senseless mummeries, and if there were any virtue in them, I should most certainly have discovered it. But I know full well, and my reader knows, that they cannot satisfy the restless yearnings of the immortal mind. They may delude the vulgar, but they cannot dispel the darkness of the tomb. They cannot lead a soul to Christ. On leaving the chapel after the ceremony, I found a new superior waiting for us at the door to conduct us to our rooms. We were all very much surprised at this, but she informed us that our old superior died that morning, that she was already buried, and she had come to take her place. I could not believe this story, for she came to us as usual that morning, appeared in usual health, though always very pale, and made no complaint, 
or exhibited any sign of illness. She told us in her kind and pleasant way that we were to be consecrated, gave us a few words of advice, but said nothing about leaving us, and I do not believe she even thought of such a thing. Little did I think, when she left us, that I was never to see her again. But so it was. In just two hours and a half from that time, we were told that she was dead and buried, and another filled her place. A probable story, truly. I wonder if they thought we believed it. But whether we did or not, that was all we could ever know about it. No allusion was ever made to the subject, and nuns are not allowed to ask questions. However excited we might feel, no information could we seek as to the manner of her death. Whether she died by disease, or by the hand of violence, whether her gentle spirit peacefully winged its way to the bosom of its god, or was hastily driven forth upon the dagger's point, whether some kind friend closed her eyes in death and decently robed her cold limbs for the grave, or whether torn upon the agonizing rack, whether she is left to moulder away in some dungeon's gloom, or thrown in the quickly consuming fire, we could never know. These and many other questions that might have been asked will never be answered until the last great day, when the grave shall give up its dead and the prison disclose its secrets. After the consecration we were separated, and only one of the girls remained with me. The others I never saw again. We were put into a large room where were three beds, one large and two small ones. In the large bed the superior slept, while I occupied one of the small beds and the other little nun the other. Our new superior was very strict, and we were severely punished for the least trifle, such, for instance, as making a noise, either in our own room or in the kitchen. We might not even smile, or make motions to each other, or look in each other's face. We must keep our eyes on our work, or on the floor, in token of humility. To look a person full in the face was considered an unpardonable act of boldness. On retiring for the night, we were required to lie perfectly motionless. We might not move a hand, or foot, or even a finger. At twelve the bell rang for prayers, when we must rise, kneel by our beds, and repeat prayers until the second bell, when we again retired to rest. On cold winter nights these midnight prayers were a most cruel penance. It did seem as though I should freeze to death but live or die the prayers must be said, and the superior was always there to see that we were not remiss in duty. If she slept at all, I am sure it must have been with one eye open, for she saw everything. But if I obeyed in this thing, I found it impossible to lie as still as they required. I would move when I was asleep, without knowing it. This, of course, could not be allowed, and for many weeks I was strapped down to my bed every night until I could sleep without the movement of a muscle. I was very anxious to do as nearly right as possible, for I thought if they saw that I strove with all my might to obey, they would perhaps excuse me if I did fail to conquer impossibilities. In this, however, I was disappointed, and I at length became weary of trying to do right, for they would inflict severe punishments for the most trifling accident. In fact, if I give anything like a correct account of my convent life, it will be little else than a history of punishments. Pains, trials, prayers, and mortifications filled up the time. 
penance was the rule, to escape it the exception. I neglected at the proper time to state what name was given me when I took the veil. I may therefore as well say in this place that my convent name was Sister Agnes. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter Eight Confession and Sorrow of No Avail. It was a part of my business to wait upon the priests in their room, carry them water, clean towels, wine glasses, or anything they needed. When entering a priest's room, it was customary for a child to knock twice, an adult four times, and a priest three times. This rule I was very careful to observe. Whenever a priest opened the door, I was required to courtesy and fall upon my knees, but if it was opened by one of the waiters, this ceremony was omitted. These waiters were the boys I have before mentioned, called apostles. It was also part of my business to wait upon them, carry them clean frocks, etc. One day I was carrying a pitcher of water to one of the priests, and it being very heavy, it required both my hands and nearly all my strength to keep it upright. On reaching the door, however, I attempted to hold it with one hand, as I dare not set it down while I rapped with the other. In doing so, I chanced to spill a little water on the floor. Just at that moment the door was opened by the priest himself, and when he saw the water he was very angry. He caught me by the arm and asked what punishment he should inflict upon me for being so careless. I attempted to explain how it happened, told him that it was an accident, that I was very sorry and would try to be more careful in future but I might as well have said that I was glad, and would do so again, for my confession, sorrow, and promises of future obedience were entirely thrown away, and might as well have been kept for someone who could appreciate the feeling that prompted them. He immediately led me out of his room, it being on the second floor, and down into the back yard. Here, in the centre of the gravel walk was a grate where they put down coal. This grate he raised and bade me go down. I obeyed and descending a few steps found myself in a coal cellar, the floor being covered with it for some feet in depth. On this we walked some two rods perhaps, when the priest stopped and with a shovel that stood near cleared away the coal, and lifted a trap-door. Through this we descended four or five steps, and proceeded along a dark, narrow passage, so low we could not stand erect, and the atmosphere so cold and damp it produced the most uncomfortable sensations. By the light of a small lantern, which the priest carried in his hand, I was enabled to observe on each side the passage small doors, a few feet apart, as far as I could see. Some of them were open, others shut, and the key upon the outside. In each of these doors there was a small opening, with iron bars across it, through which the prisoner received food, if allowed to have any. One of these doors I was directed to enter, which I did with some difficulty, the place being so low, and I was trembling with cold and fear. The priest, 
crawled in after me and tied me to the back part of the cell, leaving me there in midnight darkness and locking the door after him. I could hear on all sides, as it seems to me, the sobs, groans, and shrieks of other prisoners, some of whom prayed earnestly for death to release them from their sufferings. For twenty-four hours I was left to bear, as best I could, the pains and terrors of cold, hunger, darkness, and fatigue. I could neither sit or lie down, and every one knows how painful it is to stand upon the feet a long time, even when the position can be slightly changed. How much more so when no change can be effected, but the same set of muscles kept continually on the stretch for the space of twenty-four hours. Moreover, I knew not how long I should be kept there. The other prisoners, whose agonizing cries fell upon my ears, were evidently suffering all the horrors of starvation. Was I to meet a fate like this? Were these terrible sufferings in reserve for me? How could I endure them? And then came the thought, so often present with me while in the convent, if there is a God in heaven, why does he permit such things? What have I done that I should become the victim of such cruelty? God of mercy, I involuntarily exclaimed, save me from this terrible death. My prayer was heard, my petition granted. At the close of twenty-four hours, the Lady Superior came and released me from my prison, told me to go to the priest and ask his forgiveness, and then go to my work in the kitchen. I was very faint and weak from my long fast, and I resolved never to offend again. I verily thought I could be careful enough to escape another such punishment. But I had not been in the kitchen one hour when I chanced to let a plate fall upon the floor. It was in no way injured, but I had broken the rules by making a noise, and the superior immediately reported me to the priest. He soon appeared with his bunch of keys and a dark lantern in his hand. He took me by the ear which he pinched till he brought tears to my eyes, saying, You don't try to do well, and I'll make you suffer the consequences. I did not reply, for I had learned that to answer a priest, or seek to vindicate myself, or even to explain how things came to be so, was in itself a crime to be severely punished, However unjust their treatment, or whatever my feelings might be, I knew it was better to suffer in silence. Unlocking a door that had opened out of the kitchen, and still keeping hold of my ear, he led me into a dark, gloomy hall with black walls, and opening a door on the right, he bade me enter. This room was lighted by a candle and around the sides, large iron hooks with heavy chains attached to them were driven into the wall. At the back part of the room, he opened the door and bade me enter a small closet. He then put a large iron ring over my head and pressed it down upon my shoulders. Heavy weights were placed in my hands, and I was told to stand up straight and hold them fifteen minutes. This I could not do. Had my life depended upon the effort, I could not have stood erect with those weights in my hands. The priest, however, did not reprove me. Perhaps he saw that I exerted all my strength to obey, for he took out his watch and slowly counted the minutes as they passed. Ere a third part of the time expired, he was obliged to release me, for the blood gushed from my nose and mouth, 
and I began to feel faint and dizzy. The irons were removed, and the blood ceased to flow. I was then taken to another room, lighted like the other, but it was damp and cold, and pervaded by a strong, fetid, and very offensive odour. The floor was of wood, and badly stained with blood. At least I thought it was blood, but there was not light enough to enable me to say positively what it was. In the middle of the room stood two long tables, on each of which lay a corpse covered with a white cloth. The priest led me to these tables, removed the cloth, and bade me look upon the face of the dead. They were very much emaciated, and the features, even in death, bore the impress of terrible suffering. We stood there a few moments, when he again led me back to his own room. He then asked me what I thought of what I had seen. Having taken no food for more than twenty-four hours, I replied, I am so hungry I can think of nothing else. How would you like to eat those dead bodies? he asked. I would starve, sir, before I would do it, I replied. Would you? said he with a slight sneer. Yes, indeed, I exclaimed, striving to suppress my indignant feelings. What, eat the flesh of a corpse? You do not mean it. I would starve to death first. Frightened at my own temerity in speaking so boldly, I involuntarily raised my eye. The peculiar smile upon his face actually chilled my blood with terror. He did not, however, seem to notice me, but said, Do not be too sure. I have seen others quite as sure as you are, yet they were glad to do it, to save their lives. And remember, he added significantly, you will do it too if you are not careful. He then ordered me to return to the kitchen. At ten o'clock in the morning, the nuns had a slice of bread and a cup of water, but as I had been fasting, they gave me a bowl of gruel composed of Indian meal and water with a little salt. A poor dinner this for a hungry person, but I could have no more. At eleven we went to mass in the chapel as usual. It was our custom to have mass every day, and I have been told that this is true of all Romish establishments. Returning to my work in the kitchen, I again resolved that I would be so careful that in future they should have no cause for complaint. For two days I succeeded. Yes, for two whole days I escaped punishment. This I notice as somewhat remarkable, because I was generally punished every day, and sometimes two or three times in a day. On the third morning I was dusting the furniture in the room occupied by the priest above mentioned, who treated me so cruelly. The floor being uncarpeted, in moving the chairs I chanced to make a slight noise, although I did my best to avoid it. He immediately sprang to his feet, exclaiming, You careless dog, what did you do that for? Then taking me by the arms, he gave me a hard shake, saying, Have I not told you that you would be punished if you made a noise? But I see how it is with you. Your mind is on the world, and you think more of that than you do of the convent. But I shall punish you until you do your duty better. He concluded this choice speech by telling me to march downstairs. Of course I obeyed, and he followed me, striking me on the head at every step with a book he held in his hand. I thought to escape some of the blows, and hastened along, 
but all in vain he kept near me and drove me before him into the priest's sitting-room. He then sent for three more priests to decide upon my punishment. A long consultation they held upon this serious business, as I sneeringly thought it, but the result was serious in good earnest, I assure you, for the heinous offence of making a slight noise I was to have dry peas bound on my knees, and then be made to crawl to St. Patrick's Church through an underground passage and back again. This church was situated on a hill a little more than a quarter of a mile from the convent. Between the two buildings an underground passage had been constructed, just large enough to allow a person to crawl through it on the hands and knees. It was so low and narrow that it was impossible either to rise or turn around once within that passage there was no escape but to go on to the end. They allowed me five hours to go and return, and to prove that I had really been there I was to make a cross and two straight lines with a bit of chalk upon a blackboard that I should find at the end. Oh, the intolerable agonies I endured on that terrible pathway! Any description that I can give will fail to convey the least idea of the misery of those long five hours. It may, perchance, seem a very simple mode of punishment, but let anyone just try it, and they will be convinced that it was no trifling thing. At the end I found myself in a cellar under the church where there was light enough to enable me to find the board and the chalk. I made the mark according to orders and then looked around for some means of escape. Alas, there was none to be found. Strong iron bars firmly secured the only door and a very slight examination convinced me that my case was utterly hopeless. I then tried to remove the peas from my swollen, bleeding limbs, but this too I found impossible. They were evidently fastened by a practised hand, and I was at length compelled to believe that I must return as I came. I did return, but, oh, how many times I gave up in despair and thought I could go no further! How many times did I stretch myself on the cold stones in such bitter agony that I could have welcomed death as a friend and a deliverer! What would I not have given for one glass of cold water or even for a breath of fresh air? My limbs seemed on fire, and while great drops of perspiration fell from my face, my throat and tongue were literally parched with thirst. But the end came at last, and I found the priest waiting for me at the entrance. He seemed very angry, and said, You have been gone over your time. There was no need of it. You could have returned sooner if you had chosen to do so, and now I shall punish you again for being gone so long. At first his reproaches grieved me, for I had done my best to please him, and I did so long for one word of sympathy. It seemed for a moment as though my heart would break. Had he then spoken one kind word to me, or manifested the least compassion for my sufferings, I could have forgiven the past, and obeyed him with feelings of love and gratitude for the future. Yes, I would have done anything for that man if I could have felt that he had the least pity for me, but when he said that he should punish me again, my heart turned to stone. Every tender emotion vanished, 
and a fierce hatred, a burning indignation, and thirst for revenge took possession of my soul. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter Nine Alone with the Dead. The priest removed the peas from my limbs, and led me to a tomb under the chapel, where he left me with the consoling assurance that the dead would rise and eat me. This tomb was a large rectangular room, with shelves on three sides of it, on which were the coffins of priests and superiors who had died in the nunnery. On the floor under the shelves were large piles of human bones, dry and white, and some of them crumbling into dust. In the center of the room was a large tank of water, several feet in diameter, called St. Joseph's Well. It occupied the whole center of the room, leaving a very narrow pathway between that and the shelves, so narrow, indeed, that I found it impossible to sit down, and exceedingly difficult to walk or even stand still. I was obliged to hold firmly by the shelves to avoid slipping into the water which looked dark and deep. The priest said when he left me that if I fell in I would drown, for no one could take me out. Oh, how my heart thrilled with superstitious terror when I heard the key turn in the lock and realized that I was alone with the dead, and that was not the worst of it. They would rise and eat me. For a few hours I stood as though paralyzed with fear. A cold perspiration covered my trembling limbs as I watched those coffins with the most painful and serious apprehension. Every moment I expected the fearful catastrophe, and even wondered which part they would devour first, whether one would come alone and thus kill me by inches, or whether they would all rise at once and quickly make an end of me. I even imagined I could see the coffins move that I heard the dead groan and sigh, and even the sound of my own chattering teeth, I fancied to be a movement among the dry bones that lay at my feet. In the extremity of terror I shrieked aloud. But this I knew was utterly useless. Who would hear me? Or who would care if they did hear? I was surrounded by walls, that no sound could penetrate, and if it could, it would fall upon ears deaf to the agonizing cry for mercy, upon hearts that feel no sympathy for human woe. Some persons may be disposed to smile at this record of absurd and superstition's fear, but to me it was no laughing matter. Had not the priest said that the dead would rise and eat me, and did I not firmly believe that what he said was true? What, a priest tell a falsehood? Impossible. I thought it could not be. Yet as hour after hour passed away, and no harm came to me, I began to exercise my reason a little and very soon came to the conclusion that the priests are not the immaculate, infallible beings I had been taught to believe. Cruel and hard-hearted I knew them to be, but I did not suspect them of falsehood. Hitherto 
I had supposed it was impossible for them to do wrong, or to err in judgment, all their cruel acts being done for the benefit of the soul, which in some inexplicable way was to be benefited by the sufferings of the body. Now, however, I began to question the truth of many things I had seen and heard, and ere long I lost all faith in them, or in the terrible system of bigotry, cruelty, and fraud, which they call religion. As the hours passed by, and my fears vanished before the calm light of reason, I gradually gained sufficient courage to enable me to examine the tomb, thinking that I might perchance discover the body of my old superior. For this purpose I accordingly commenced the circuit of the room, holding on by the shelves and making my way slowly forward. One coffin I succeeded in opening, but the sight of the corpse so frightened me I did not dare to open another, the room being brilliantly lighted, with two large spermaceti candles at one end, and a gas burner at the other, I was enabled to see every feature distinctly. One of the nuns informed me that none but priests and superiors are laid in that tomb. When these die in full communion with the church, the body is embalmed and placed here, but it sometimes happens that a priest or superior is found in the convent who does not believe all that is taught by the Church of Rome. They desire to investigate the subject, to seek for more light, more knowledge of the way of salvation by Christ. This, with the Romanists, is a great sin and the poor hapless victim is at once placed under punishment. If they die in this condition, their bodies are cast out as heretics, but if they confess and receive absolution, they are placed in the tomb, but not embalmed. The flesh, of course, decays, and then the bones are thrown under the shelves. Never shall I forget how frightful those bones appeared to me, or the cold shudder that thrilled my frame at the sight of the numerous human skulls that lay scattered around. Twenty-four hours I spent in this abode of the dead, without rest or sleep. The attempt to obtain either would have been sheer madness, for the least misstep, the least unguarded motion, or a slight relaxation of the firm grasp by which I held on to the shelves, would have plunged me headlong into the dark water, from which escape would have been impossible. For thirty hours I had not tasted food, and my limbs, mangled and badly swollen, were so stiff with long standing, that when allowed to leave the tomb, I could hardly step. When the priest came to let me out, he seemed to think it necessary to say something to cover his attempt to deceive and frighten me, but he only made a bad matter worse. He said that after he left me he thought he would try me once more to see if I would not do my duty better. He had therefore willed the dead not to eat me and they, obedient to his will, were compelled to let me alone. I did not reply to this absurd declaration, lest I should say something I ought not, and again incur his displeasure. Indeed, I was not expected to say anything unless I returned thanks for his unparalleled kindness and I was not hypocrite enough for that. I suppose he thought I believed all he said, but he was greatly mistaken. If I began to doubt his word while in the tomb, this ridiculous pretense only served 
to add contempt to unbelief, and from that time I regarded him as a deceiver and a vile, unscrupulous, hypocritical pretender. It was with the greatest difficulty that I again made my way to the kitchen. I was never very strong, even when allowed my regular meals, for the quantity was altogether insufficient to satisfy the demands of nature, and now I had been so long without anything to eat, I was so weak, and my limbs so stiff and swollen, I could hardly stand. I managed, however, to reach the kitchen, when I was immediately seated at the table, and presented with a bowl of gruel. Oh, what a luxury it seemed to me, and how eagerly did I partake of it! It was soon gone, and I looked around for a further supply. Another nun, who sat at the table with me, with a bowl of gruel before her, noticed my disappointment when I saw that I was to have no more. She was a stranger to me, and so pale and emaciated, she looked more like a corpse than a living person. She had tasted a little of her gruel, but her stomach was too weak to retain it, and as soon as the superior left us, she took it up and poured the whole into my bowl, making at the same time a gesture that gave me to understand that it was of no use to her, and she wished me to eat it. I did not wait for a second invitation, and she seemed pleased to see me accept it so readily. We dared not speak, but we had no difficulty in understanding each other. I had but just finished my gruel, when the superior came back and desired me to go upstairs and help tie a mad nun. I think she did this simply for the purpose of giving me a quiet lesson in convent life, and showing me the consequences of resistance or disobedience. She must have known that I was altogether incapable of giving the assistance she pretended to ask. But I followed her as fast as possible, and when she saw how difficult it was for me to get upstairs, she walked slowly and gave me all the time I wished for. She led me into a small room and closed the door. There I beheld a scene that called forth my warmest sympathy, and at the same time excited feelings of indignation that will never be subdued while reason retains her throne. In the centre of the room sat a young girl who could not have been more than sixteen years old, and a face and form of such perfect symmetry, such surpassing beauty I never saw. She was divested of all her clothing, except one undergarment, and her hands and feet securely tied to the chair on which she sat. A priest stood beside her, and as we entered he bade us assist him in removing the beds from the bedstead. They then took the nun from her chair and laid her on the bedcord. They desired me to assist them, but my heart failed me. I could not do it, for I was sure they were about to kill her, and as I gazed upon those calm expressive features, so pale and sad, yet so perfectly beautiful, I felt that it would be sacrilege for me to raise my hand against nature's holiest and most exquisite work. I therefore assured them that I was too weak to render the assistance they required. At first they attempted to compel me to do it, but finding that I was really very weak and unwilling to use what strength I had, they at length permitted me to stand aside. When they extended the poor girl on the cord, she said very quietly, 
I am not mad, and you know that I am not. To this no answer was given, but they calmly proceeded with their fiendish work. One of them tied her feet, while the other fastened a rope across her neck in such a way that if she attempted to raise her head, it would strangle her. The rope was then fastened under the bed cord and two or three times over her person. Her arms were extended and fastened in the same way. As she lay thus, like a lamb bound for the sacrifice, she looked up at her tormentors and said, Will the Lord permit me to die in this cruel way? The priest immediately exclaimed in an angry tone, Stop your talk, you mad woman! And turning to me, he bade me go back to the kitchen. It is probable he saw the impression on my mind was not just what they desired, therefore he hurried me away. All this time the poor doomed nun submitted quietly to her fate. I suppose she thought it useless, yea, worse than useless to resist, for any effort she might make to escape would only provoke them, and they would torment her the more. I presume she thought her last hour had come, and the sooner she was out of her misery the better. As for me, my heart was so filled with terror, anguish, and pity for her, I could hardly obey the command to leave the room. I attempted to descend the stairs, but was obliged to go very slowly on account of the stiffness of my limbs, and before I reached the bottom of the first flight the priest and the superior came out into the hall. I heard them whispering together, and I paused to listen. This, I know, was wrong, but I could not help it, and I was so excited I did not realize what I was doing. My anxiety for that girl overpowered every other feeling. At first I could only hear the sound of their voices, but soon they spoke more distinctly, and I heard the words, What shall we do with her? She will never confess. In an audible tone of voice the other replied, We had better finish her. How those words thrilled my soul. I knew well enough that they designed to finish her, but to hear the purpose announced so coolly, it was horrible. Was there no way that I could save her? Must I stand there and know that a fellow creature was being murdered, that a young girl like myself, in all the freshness of youth and the fullness of health, was to be cut off in the very prime of life and numbered with the dead, hurried out of existence and plunged, unwept, unlamented into darkness and silence. She had friends, undoubtedly, but they would never be allowed to know her sad fate, never shed a tear upon her grave. I could not endure the thought. I felt that if I lingered there another moment I should be in danger of madness myself, for I could not help her. I could not prevent the consummation of their cruel purpose. I therefore hastened away, and this was the last I ever heard of that poor nun. I had never seen her before, and as I did not see her clothes, I could not even tell whether she belonged to our nunnery or not. End of section 9。Chapter 10 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson Chapter 10 The Sick Nun On my return to the kitchen, I found the sick nun sitting as we left her. She asked me by signs if we were alone. I told her she need not fear to speak, for the superior was two flights of stairs above, and no one else was near. Are they all away? she whispered. I assured her that we were quite alone, that she had nothing to fear. She then informed me that she had been nine days under punishment, that when taken from the cell she could not stand or speak, and she was still too weak to walk without assistance. Oh, said she, and the big tears rolled over her cheeks as she said it, I have not a friend in the world. You do not know how my heart longs for love, for sympathy, and kindness. I asked if she had not parents or friends in the world. She replied, I was born in this convent, and know no world but this. You see, she continued with a sad smile, what kind of friends I have here. Oh, if I had a friend, if I could feel that one human being cares for me, I should get better. But it is so long since I heard a kind word. A sob choked her utterance. I told her I would be a friend to her as far as I could. She thanked me, said she was well aware of the difficulties that lay in my way for every expression of sympathy or kind feeling between the nuns was strictly forbidden, and if caught in anything of the kind, a severe correction would follow. But, said she, if you will give me a kind look sometimes, whenever you can do so with safety, it will be worth a great deal to me. You do not know the value of a kind look to a breaking heart. She wept so bitterly I feared it would injure her health, and to divert her mind, I told her where I was born, spoke of my childhood and of my life at the white nunnery. She wiped away her tears and replied, I know all about it. I have heard the priests talk about you, and they say that your father is yet living, that your mother was a firm Protestant and that it will be hard for them to beat Catholicism into you. But I do not know how you came in that nunnery. Who put you there? I told her that I was placed there by my father when only six years old. Is it possible? she exclaimed, and then added passionately, Curse your father for it. After a moment's silence, she continued, Yes, child, you have indeed cause to curse your father, and the day when you first entered the convent, but you do not suffer as much as you would if you had been born here and were entirely dependent on them. They fear that your friends may sometime look after you, and in case they are compelled to grant them an interview, they would wish them to find you in good health and contented. But if you had no influential friends outside the convent, you would find yourself much worse off than you are now. She then said she wished she could get some of the brandy from the cellar. Her stomach was so weak from long fasting, it would retain neither food or drink, and she thought the brandy would give it strength. She asked if I could get it for her. The idea frightened me at first, for I knew that if caught in doing it, I should be most cruelly punished. Yet my sympathy for her at length overcame my fears, and I resolved to try whatever might be the result. 
I accordingly went upstairs, ostensibly to see if the superior wanted me, but really to find out where she was, and whether she would be likely to come down before I could have time to carry out my plan. I trembled a little, for I knew that I was guilty of a great misdemeanor in thus boldly presenting myself to ask if I was wanted. But I thought it no very great sin to pretend that I thought she called me, for I was sure my motives were good, whatever they might think of them. I had been taught that the end sanctifies the means, and I thought I should not be too hardly judged by the great searcher of hearts if for once I applied it my own way. I knocked gently at the door I had left but a few moments before. It was opened by the superior, but she immediately stepped out and closed it again, so that I had no opportunity to see what was passing within. She sternly bade me return to the kitchen and stay there till she came down, a command I was quite ready to obey. In the kitchen there was a small cupboard called the key cupboard, in which they kept keys of all sizes belonging to the establishment. They were hung on hooks, each one being marked with the name of the place to which it belonged. It was easy for me to find the key to the cellar, and having obtained it, I opened another cupboard filled with bottles and vials, where I selected one that held half a pint, placed it in a large pitcher, and hastened downstairs. I soon found a cask marked brandy, turned the faucet, and filled the bottle. But my heart beat violently, and my hand trembled so that I could not hold it steady, and some of it ran over into the pitcher. It was well for me that I took this precaution, for if I had spilt it on the stone floor of the cellar, I should have been detected at once. I ran upstairs as quickly as possible, and made her drink what I had in the pitcher, though there was more of it than I should have given her under other circumstances. But I did not know what to do with it. If I put it in the fire or in the sink, I thought they would certainly smell it, and there was no other place for I was not allowed to go out of doors. I then replaced the key, washed up my pitcher, and secreted the bottle of brandy in the waist of the nun's dress. This I could easily do, their dresses being made with a loose waist, and a large cape worn over them. I then began to devise some way to destroy the scent in the room. I could smell it very distinctly and I knew that the superior would notice it at once. After trying various expedients to no purpose, I at length remembered that I had once seen a dry rag set on fire for a similar purpose. I therefore took one of the cloths from the sink and set it on fire, let it burn a moment, and threw it under the cauldron. I was just beginning to congratulate myself on my success, when I saw that the nun appeared insensible and about to fall from her chair. I caught her in my arms and leaned her back in the chair, but I did not dare to lay her on the bed without permission, even if I had strength to do it. I could only draw her chair to the side of the room, put a stick of wood under it, and let her head rest against the wall. I was very much frightened, and for a moment thought she was dead. She was pale as a corpse, her eyes closed, and her mouth wide open. Had I really killed her? What if the superior should find her thus? I soon found that she was not dead, for her heart beat regularly, and I began to hope she would get over it before anyone came in. But just as the thought passed my mind, the door opened and the superior appeared. 
her first words were, What have you been burning? What smells so? I told her there was a cloth about the sink that I thought unfit for use, and I put it under the cauldron. She then turned towards the nun and asked if she had fainted. I told her that I did not know, but I thought she was asleep, and if she wished me to awaken and assist her to bed, I would do so. To this she consented, and immediately went upstairs again. Glad as I was of this permission, I still doubted my ability to do it alone, for I had little, very little strength, yet I resolved to do my best. It was long, however, before I could arouse her, or make her comprehend what I said, so entirely were her senses stupefied with the brandy. When at length I succeeded in getting her upon her feet, she said she was sure she could not walk, but I encouraged her to help herself as much as possible, told her that I wished to get her away before any one came in, or we would be certainly found out and punished. This suggestion awakened her fears, and I at length succeeded in assisting her to bed. She was soon in a sound sleep, and I thought my troubles for that time were over. But I was mistaken. In my fright I had quite forgotten the brandy in her dress. Somehow the bottle was cracked, and while she slept the brandy ran over her clothes. The superior saw it, and asked how she obtained it. Too noble-minded to expose me, she said she drew it herself. I heard the superior talking to a priest about it, and I thought they were preparing to punish her. I did not know what she had told them, but I did not think she would expose me, and I feared if they punished her again, she would die in their hands. I therefore went to the superior and told her the truth about it, for I thought a candid confession on my part might perchance procure forgiveness for the nun, if not for myself. But no, they punished us both, the nun for telling the lie, and me for getting the brandy. For two hours they made me stand with a crown of thorns on my head, while they alternately employed themselves in burning me with hot irons, pinching and piercing me with needles, pulling my hair and striking me with sticks. All this I bore very well, for I was hurt just enough to make me angry. When I returned to the kitchen again, the nun was sitting there alone. She shook her head at me, and by her gestures gave me to understand that someone was listening. She afterwards informed me that the superior was watching us to see if we would speak to each other when we met. I do not know how they punished her, but I heard a priest say that she would die if she suffered much more. Perhaps they thought the loss of that precious bottle of brandy was punishment enough, but I was glad I got it for her, for she had one good dose of it and it did her good. Her stomach was stronger, her appetite better, and in a few weeks she regained her usual health. One day, while at work as usual, I was called upstairs with the other nuns to see one die. She lay upon the bed and looked pale and thin, but I could see no signs of immediate dissolution. Her voice was strong, and respiration perfectly natural. The nuns were all assembled in her room to see her die. Beside her stood a priest, earnestly exhorting her to confess her sins to him, and threatening her with eternal punishment if she refused. But she replied, No, I will not confess to you, if, as you say, I am really dying, 
it is with my God I have to do. To him alone will I confess, for he alone can save. If you do not confess to me, exclaimed the priest, I will give you up to the devil. Well, said she, I stand in no fear of a worse devil than you are, and I am quite willing to leave you at any time, and try any other place. Even hell itself cannot be worse. I cannot suffer more there than I have here. Daughter, exclaimed the priest, with affected sympathy, must I give you up? How can I see you go down to perdition? It is not yet too late. Confess your sins and repent. I have already confessed my sins to God, and I shall confess to no one else. He alone can save me. Her manner of saying this was solemn, but very decided. The priest saw that she would not yield to his wishes, and raising his voice, he exclaimed, Then let the devil take you! Immediately the door opened, and a figure representing the Roman Catholic idea of his satanic majesty entered the room. He was very black and covered with long hair, probably the skin of some wild animal. He had two long white tusks, two horns on his head, a large cloven foot, and a long tail that he drew after him on the floor. He looked so frightful, and recalled to my mind so vividly the figure that I saw at the white nunnery, that I was very much frightened. Still, I did not believe it was really a supernatural being. I suspected that it was one of the priests dressed up in that way to frighten us, and I now know that such was the fact. But what of that? We all feared the priests, quite as much as we should the evil one himself, even if he should come to us in bodily shape, as they pretended he had done. Most of the nuns were very much frightened when they saw that figure walk up to the bedside, taking good care, however, to avoid the priest. He being so very holy, it was impossible for an evil spirit to go near or even look at him. The priest then ordered us to return to the kitchen, for, said he, the devil has come for this nun's soul, and will take it with him. As we left the room, I looked around on my companions, and wondered if they believed this absurd story. I longed to ask them what they thought of it, but this was not allowed. All interchange of thought or feeling being strictly forbidden, we never ventured to speak without permission when so many of us were present, for some one was sure to tell of it if the least rule was broken. I was somewhat surprised at first that we were all sent back to the kitchen, as but few of us were employed there. But we were soon called back again to look at the corpse. I was inexpressibly shocked at this summons, for I had not supposed it possible for her to die so soon. But she was dead, and that was all we would ever know about it. As we stood around the bed, the priest said she was an example of those in the world called heretics, that her soul was in misery and would remain so for ever. No masses or prayers could avail her then, for she could never be prayed out of hell. Sins like hers could never be forgiven. I continued to work in the kitchen as usual for many months after this occurrence, and for a few weeks the sick nun was there a great part of the time. Whenever we were alone, and sure that no one was near, we used to converse together, 
and a great comfort it was to us both. I felt that I had found in her one real friend to sympathize with me in my grievous trials, and with whom I could sometimes hold communication without fear of betrayal. I had proved her and found her faithful, therefore I did not fear to trust her. No one can imagine, unless they know by experience, how much pleasure we enjoyed in the few stolen moments that we spent together. I shall never forget the last conversation I had with her. She came and sat down where I was assisting another nun to finish a mat. She asked us if we knew what was going on in the house. As I came from my room, said she, I saw the priests and superiors running along the halls, and they appeared so much excited I thought something must be wrong. As they passed me, they told me to go to the kitchen and stay there. What does it all mean? Of course, we did not know, for we had neither seen or heard anything unusual. Well, said she, they are all so much engaged upstairs, we can talk a little and not be overheard. I want to know something about the people in the world. Are they really cruel and cold-hearted, as the priests say they are? When you was in the world, were they unkind to you? On the contrary, I replied, I would gladly return to them if I could get away from the convent. I should not be treated any worse, at all events, and I shall embrace the first opportunity to go back to the world. That is what I have always thought, since I was old enough to think at all, said she, and I have resolved a great many times to get away if possible. I suppose they tell us about the cruelty in the world just to frighten us, and prevent us from trying to escape. I am so weak now, I do not suppose I could walk out of Montreal, even if I should leave the convent but if I ever get strong enough, I shall certainly try to escape from this horrible place. Oh, I could tell you things about this convent that would curdle the blood in your veins. The other nun said that she had been once in the world, and every one was kind to her. I shall try to get out again some day, said she, but we must keep our resolutions to ourselves for there is no one here that we can trust. Those whom we think our best friends will betray us if we give them a chance. I do believe that some of them delight in getting us punished. The sick nun said, I have never exposed anyone, and I never will. I have the secrets of a great many hid in my breast that nothing shall ever extort from me. Here she was interrupted, and soon left the room. I never saw her again, whether she was under punishment, or was so fortunate as to make her escape, I do not know. As no questions could be asked, it was very little we could know of each other. If one of our number escaped, the fact was carefully concealed from the rest, and if she was caught and brought back, no one ever knew it except those who had charge of her. The other nun who worked in the room with me watched me very closely, having heard me declare my intention to leave the first opportunity. She determined to go with me, if possible. End of chapter 10《ハプトゥリヴォックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロックス・ロ
Richardson. Chapter 11. The Joy of Freedom. At length the long-sought opportunity arrived, and with the most ecstatic joy we fled from the nunnery. The girl I have before mentioned, who wished to go with me, and another nun, with whom I had no acquaintance, were left in the kitchen to assist me in taking charge of the cooking while the rest of the people were at mass in the chapel. A chance presented for us to get away, and we all fled together, leaving the cooking to take care of itself. We were assisted to get out of the yard, but how or by whom I can never reveal. Death in its most terrible form would be the punishment for such an act of kindness, and knowing this, it would be the basest ingratitude for me to name the individual who so kindly assisted us in our perilous undertaking. How well do I remember the emotions that thrilled my soul when I found myself safely outside the walls of that fearful prison. The joy of freedom, the hope of ultimate success, the fear of being overtaken and dragged back to misery or death were considerations sufficiently exciting to agitate our spirits and lend fleetness to our steps. With trembling limbs and throbbing hearts we fled towards the St. Lawrence River. Following the towpath we hastened on for a few miles, when one of the nuns became exhausted and said she could go no further. She was very weak when we started, and the excitement and fatigue produced serious illness. What should we do with her? We could not take her along with us, and if we stopped with her, we might all be taken and carried back. Must we leave her by the wayside? It was a fearful alternative, but what else could we do? With sad hearts, we took her to a shed nearby, and there we left her to her fate, whatever it might be, perchance to die there alone, or what was still worse, be carried back to the convent. It was indeed a sorrowful parting, and we wept bitter tears together as we bade her a last farewell. I never saw or heard from her again. We pursued our way along the towpath for a short distance when the canal boat came along. We asked permission to go upon the boat, and the captain kindly granted it, but desired us to be very still. He carried us twelve miles, and then proposed to leave us, as he exposed himself to a heavy fine by carrying us without a pass, and unattended by a priest or superior. We begged him to take us as far as he went with the boat, and frankly told him our situation. Having no money to offer, we could only cast ourselves upon his mercy, and implore his pity and assistance. He consented to take us as far as the village of Beauharnois, and there he left us. He did not dare take us further, lest someone might be watching for us and find us on his boat. It was five o'clock in the morning when we left the boat, but it was a Roman Catholic village, and we did not dare to stop. All that day we pursued our way without food or drink, and at night we were tired and hungry. Arriving at a small village, we ventured to stop at the most respectable-looking house, and asked the woman if she could keep us overnight. She looked at us very attentively, and said she could not. We did not dare to call again, for we knew that we were surrounded by those who would think they were doing a good work to deliver us up to the priests. Darkness came over the earth, but still weary and sleepy as we were, we pursued our lonely way. I will not repeat our bitter reflections upon a cold-hearted world, but the reader will readily imagine what they were. 
Late in the evening we came to an old barn. I think it must have been four or five miles from the village. There was no house or other building near it, and as no person was in sight, we ventured to enter. Here to our great joy we found a quantity of clean straw, with which we soon prepared a comfortable bed, where we could enjoy the luxury of repose. We slept quietly through the night, and at the early dawn awoke refreshed and encouraged, but oh so hungry. Gladly we would have eaten anything in the shape of food, but nothing could we find. The morning star was yet shining brightly above us as we again started on our journey. At length our hearts were cheered by the sight of a village. The first house we came to stood at some distance from the other buildings, and we saw two women in a yard milking cows. We called at the door and asked the lady for some milk. Oh yes, said she with a sweet smile, come in and rest a while, and you shall have all you want. She thought we were sisters of charity, for they often go about visiting the sick and praying with the people. It is considered a very meritorious act to render them assistance and speed them on their way, but to help a runaway nun is to commit a crime of sufficient magnitude to draw down the anathema of the church. Therefore, while we carefully concealed our real character, we gratefully accepted the aid we so much needed, but which, we were sure, would have been withheld had she known to whom it was offered. After waiting till the cows were milked, and she had finished her own breakfast, she filled a large earthen pan with bread and milk, gave each of us a spoon, and we ate as much as we wished. As we arose to depart, she gave each of us a large piece of bread to carry with us, and asked us to pray with her. We accordingly knelt in prayer, implored heaven's blessing on her household, and then took our leave of this kind lady, never more to meet her on earth, but she will never be forgotten. That day we travelled a long distance, at least so it seemed to us. When nearly overcome with fatigue, we saw from the towpath an island in the river, and upon it a small house. Near the shore a man stood beside a canoe. We made signs to him to come to us, and he immediately sprang into his canoe and came over. We asked him to take us to the island, and he cheerfully granted our request. But he said we must sit very still or we would find ourselves in the water. I did not wonder he thought so, for the canoe was very small, and the weight of three persons sank it almost even with the surface of the river while the least motion would cause it to roll from side to side, so that we really felt that we were in danger of a very uncomfortable bath, if nothing worse. We landed safely, however, and were kindly welcomed by the Indian family in the house. Six squaws were sitting on the floor, some of them smoking, others making shoes and baskets. They were very gaily dressed, their skirts handsomely embroidered with beads and silk of various colours. One of the girls seemed very intelligent, and conversed fluently in the English language, which she spoke correctly. But she did not look at all like an Indian, having red hair and a lighter skin than the others. She was the only one in the family that I could converse with as the rest of them spoke only their native dialect, but the nun who was with me could speak both French and Indian. They treated us with great kindness, gave us food, and invited in to stay and live with them, said we could be very happy there, and to induce us to remain, they informed us that the village we saw on the other side of the river, called St. Regis, was inhabited by Indians, but they were all Roman Catholics. 
they had a priest and a church where we could go to mass every sabbath little did they imagine that we were fleeing for life from the romish priests that so far from being an inducement to remain with them this information was the very thing to send us on our way with all possible speed we did not dare to stay for i knew full well that if any one who had seen us went to confession they would be obliged to give information of our movements and if one priest heard of us he would immediately telegraph to all the priests in the united states and canada and we should be watched on every side escape would then be nearly impossible therefore we gently but firmly refused to accept the hospitality of these good people and hastened to bid them farewell i asked the girl how far it was to the united states she said it was two miles to hogansburg and that was in the states we then asked the man to take us in his canoe to the village of st regis on the other side of the river he consented but i thought with some reluctance and before he allowed us to land he conversed some minutes with the indians who met him on the shore we could not hear what they said but my fears were at once awakened i thought they suspected us and if so we were lost but the man came back at length and assisted us from the boat if he had any suspicions he kept them to himself soon after we reached the shore i met a man of whom i inquired when a boat would start for hogansburg he gazed at us a moment and then pointed to five boats out in the river and said those were the last to go that day they were then ready to start and waited only for the tow-boat to take them along but they were so far away we could not get to them even if we dared risk ourselves among so many passengers what could we do to stay there overnight was not to be thought of for a moment we were sure to be taken and carried back if we ventured to try it yet there was but one alternative either remain there till the next day or try to get a passage on the tow-boat it did not take me a long time to decide for myself and i told the nun that i should go on if the captain would take me what go on the tow-boat she exclaimed there are no ladies on that boat and I do not like to go with so many men. I am not afraid of the men, I replied, if they are not Romanists, and I am resolved to go. Do not leave me, she cried, with streaming tears. I am sure we can get along better if we keep together, but I dare not go on the boat. And I dare not stay here, said I, and so we parted. I to pursue my solitary way, she to go I know not whither. I gave her the parting hand, and have never heard from her since, but I hope she succeeded better than I did in her efforts to escape. I went directly to the captain of the boat, and asked him if he could carry me to the States. He said he should go as far as Ogdensburg, and would carry me there if I wished, or he could set me off at some place where he stopped for wood and water. When I told him I had no money to pay him, he smiled, and asked if I was a runaway. I frankly confessed that I was, for I thought it was better for me to tell the truth than to try to deceive. Well, said the captain, I will not betray you, but you had better go to my stateroom and stay there. I thanked him, but said I would rather stay where I was. He then gave me the key to his room, and advised me to go in and lock the door. For, said he, we are not accustomed to have ladies on this boat, and the men may annoy you. 
you will find it more pleasant and comfortable to stay there alone. Truly grateful for his kindness, and happy to escape from the gaze of the men, I followed his direction, nor did I leave the room again until I left the boat. The captain brought me my meals, but did not attempt to enter the room. There was a small window with a spring on the inside. He would come and tap on the window and ask me to raise it, where he would hand me a waiter on which he had placed a variety of refreshments and immediately retire. End of section 11「Chapter Twelve of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter Twelve Stranger in a Strange Land. That night and the next day, I suffered all the horrors of seasickness, and those who have known by experience how completely it prostrates the energies of mind and body can imagine how I felt on leaving the boat at night. The kind-hearted captain set me on shore at a place where he left coal and lumber, a short distance from the village of Ogdensburg. He gave me twelve and a half cents and expressed regret that he could do no more for me. He said he could not direct me to a lodging for the night, being a stranger in the place, and this the first time he had been on that route. Should this narrative chance to meet his eye, let him know that his kind and delicate attentions to a stranger in distress are and ever will be remembered with the gratitude they so richly merit. It was with evident reluctance that he left me to make my way onward as I could. And now, reader, imagine if you can, my situation. A stranger in a strange land, and comparatively a stranger to the whole world, alone in the darkness of night, not knowing where to seek a shelter or a place to lay my head, exhausted with seasickness until I felt more dead than alive. It did seem as though it would be a luxury to lie down and die. My stockings and shoes were all worn out with so much walking, my feet sore, swollen and bleeding, and my limbs so stiff and lame that it was only by the greatest effort that I could step at all. So extreme were my sufferings that I stopped more than once before I reached the village, cast myself upon the cold ground, and thought I could go no further. Not even the idea of being run over in the darkness by some passing traveller had power to keep me on my feet. Then I would rest a while and resolve to try again, and so I hobbled onward. It seemed an age of misery before I came to any house, but at length my spirits revived at the sight of brilliant lights through the window and the sound of cheerful voices that fell upon my ear. And now I thought my troubles over for that night at least. But no, when I asked permission to stay overnight, it was coldly refused. Again and again I called at houses where the people seemed to enjoy all the comforts and even the luxuries of life, but their comforts were for themselves and not for a toil-worn traveller like me. This I was made to understand in no gentle manner, and some of those I called upon were not very particular in the choice of language. By this time my feet were dreadfully swollen, and, oh, so sore and stiff, that every step produced the most intense agony. Is it strange that I felt 
as though life was hardly worth preserving, I resolved to call at one house more, and if again refused, to lie down by the wayside and die. I accordingly entered the village hotel and asked for the landlady. The bartender gave me a suspicious glance that made me tremble and asked my business. I told him that my business was with the landlady and no other person. He left the room a moment and then conducted me to her chamber. As I entered, a lady came forward to meet me, and the pleasant expression of her countenance at once won my confidence. She gave me a cordial welcome, saying with a smile, as she led me to a seat, I guess, my dear, you are a runaway, are you not? I confessed that it was even so, that I had fled from priestly cruelty, had travelled as far as I could, and now, weary, sick, and faint from long fasting, I had ventured to cast myself upon her mercy. Will you protect me? I asked. And are you a Roman Catholic? No, she replied. I am not a Roman Catholic, and I will protect you. You seem to have suffered much, and are quite exhausted, but you will find a friend in me. I will not betray you, for I dislike the priests and the convents as much as you do. She then called her little girl, and ordered a fire kindled in another chamber, saying she did not wish her servants to see me. The child soon returned when the lady herself conducted me to a large, pleasant bedroom, handsomely furnished with every convenience, and a fire in the grate. She gave me a seat in a large easy chair before the fire, and went out, locking the door after her. In a short time she returned with warm water for a bath, and with her own hands gave me all the assistance needed. As I related the incidents of the day, she expressed much sympathy for my sufferings, and said she was glad I had come to her. She gave me a cordial, and then brought me a cup of tea and other refreshments, of which I made a hearty supper. She would not allow me to eat all I wished, but when I had taken as much as was good for me, she bathed my feet with a healing wash and assisted me to bed. Oh, the luxury of that soft and comfortable bed! No one can realize with what a keen sense of enjoyment I laid my head upon those downy pillows unless they have suffered as I did and known by experience the sweetness of repose after excessive toil. All that night this good lady sat beside my bed and kept my feet wet in order to reduce the swelling. I was little inclined to sleep and at her request related some of the events of my convent life. While doing this, I hardly knew what to make of this curious woman. Sometimes she would weep, and then she would swear like any pirate. I was surprised and somewhat afraid of her. She seemed so strange and used such peculiar language. She understood my feelings at once and immediately said, You need not be afraid of me, for I have a kind heart if I do use wicked words. I cannot help swearing when I think about the priests, monsters of iniquity that they are, what fearful crimes they do commit under the cloak of religion. Oh, if the people of this land could but see their real character, they would rise en masse and drive them from the country whose liberties they will, if possible, destroy. For myself, I have good cause to hate them. Shall I tell you my story, dear? I begged her to do so, which she did as follows. I once had a sister, young, talented, beautiful, 
amiable and affectionate. She was the pride of all our family, the idol of our souls. She wished for an education, and we gladly granted her request. In our zeal to serve her, we resolved to give her the very best advantages, and so we sent her to a Romish school. It was a seminary for young ladies taught by nuns, and was the most popular one in that part of the country. My father, like many other parents who knew such establishments only by report, had not the least idea of its true character, but deluded by the supposed sanctity of the place, he was happy in the thought that he had left his darling where it was said that science and religion go hand in hand. For a season all went on well. She wrote to us that she was pleased with the school and wished to remain. We thought her handwriting wonderfully improved, and eagerly looked forward to the time when she would return to us a finished scholar as well as an accomplished lady. But these pleasant prospects were soon overcast. Too soon our happy, bounding hearts were hushed by unspeakable grief, and our brilliant anticipations were dissipated in the chamber of death. In their place came those solemn realities, the shroud, the coffin, the hearse, and the tomb. Did she die? I asked. Yes, replied the lady, as she wiped away the fast-flowing tears. Yes, she died. I believe she was poisoned, but we could do nothing. We had no proof. She had been long at school before we suspected the deception that was practised upon us. But at length I went with my other sister to see her, and the superior informed us that she was ill and could not see us. We proposed going to her room, but to our great surprise were assured that such a thing could not be allowed. We left with sad hearts, and soon called again. I cannot describe my feelings when we were coldly informed that she did not wish to see us. What could it mean? Surely something must be wrong. And we left with terrible presentiments of coming evil. It came. Yes. Too soon were our worst fears realized. I called one day, resolved to see her before I left the house. Conceive, if you can, my surprise and horror when they told me that my beautiful, idolized sister had resolved to become a nun, that she had already renounced the world and would hold no further communication with her relatives. Why did I not know this before? I exclaimed. You know it now, was the cold reply. I did not believe a word of it, and when I told my father what they said, he went to them and resolutely demanded his child. At first they refused to give her up, but when they saw that his high spirit was aroused, that he would not be flattered or deceived, they reluctantly yielded to his demand. End of section 12「Chapter Thirteen of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter Thirteen. Landlady's Story Continued. The poor girl was overjoyed to meet her friends again, but how great was our astonishment and indignation when she informed us that she had never received a single line from home after she entered the school. Nor did she ever know that we had called to see her until we informed her of the fact. 
Whenever she expressed surprise that she did not hear from us, they told her that we had probably forgotten her, and strove to awaken in her mind feelings of indignation, suspicion, and animosity. Not succeeding in this, however, they informed her that her father had called, and expressed a wish that she should become a nun, that he did not think it best for her to return home again, nor did he even ask for a parting interview. Confounded and utterly heartbroken, she would have given herself up to uncontrollable grief had she been allowed to indulge her feelings. But even the luxury of tears was forbidden, and she was compelled to assume an appearance of cheerfulness, and to smile when her heart-strings were breaking. We brought forward the letters we had received from time to time, which we believed she had written. She had never seen them before. And this, said she, is not my handwriting. Of this fact she soon convinced us, but she said she had written letter after letter, hoping for an answer, but no answer came. She said she knew that the superior examined all the letters written by the young ladies, but supposed they were always sent after being read, but it was now plain to be seen that these letters were destroyed and others substituted in their place. Footnote. Raphael Ciocci, formerly a Benedictine monk, in his narrative published by the American and Foreign Christian Union, relates a similar experience of his own when in the papal college of San Bernardo. Being urged to sign a deed of humility in which he was to renounce all his property and give it to the college, he says, I knew not what to think of this deed of humility. A thousand misgivings filled my mind, and hoping to receive from the notary an explanation that would assist me in fully comprehending its attention, I anxiously said, I must request, sir, that you will inform me what is expected from me. Tell me what is this deed, whether it be really a mere form, as has been represented to me, or if. Here the master arose, and in an imperious tone interrupted me, saying, do not be obstinate and rebellious, but obey. I have already told you that when you assume the habit of the order, the chapter De Humititate shall be explained to you. In this paper you only have to make a renunciation of all you possess on earth. Of all I possess? And if I renounce all, who, when I leave the college, will provide for me? The notary now interposed. That, said he, is the point to which I wish to call your attention. In advising you to make some reservation, if you neglect to do so, you may find yourself in difficulties, losing, as you irrevocably will, every right of your own. At these words, so palpable, so glaring, the bandage fell from my eyes, and I saw the abyss these monsters were opening under my feet. This is a deception, a horrible deception, I exclaimed. I now understand the deed of humility, but I protest I will not sign it. I will have nothing more to do with it. After spending two or three hours in bitterness and woe, I resolved to have recourse to my family. For this purpose I wrote a long letter to my mother, in which I exposed all the miseries of my heart, related what had taken place with regard to the deed of humility, and begged of her consolation and advice. I gave the letter into the hands of a servant, and on the following morning received a reply in which I was told, in gentle terms, to be tranquil, not to resist the wishes of my directors. 
sign unhesitatingly any paper that might be required, for when my studies were completed and I quitted the college, the validity of these forms would cease. This letter set my doubts at rest and restored peace to my mind. It was written by my mother, and she, I felt assured, would never deceive me. How could I for one moment imagine that this epistle was an invention of my enemies, who imitated the handwriting and affectionate style of my mother? Some persons will say, you might have suspected it. I reply, that in the uprightness of my heart I could not conceive such atrocious wickedness. It appeared utterly irreconcilable with the sanctity of the place, and with the venerable hoariness of persons dedicated to God. After perusing the letter, I hastened to the master, declaring my readiness to sign the deed of humility. He smiled approvingly on finding how well his plan had succeeded. The notary and witnesses were again summoned, and my condemnation written. The good notary, however, pitying my situation, inserted an exceptional clause to the total relinquishment of my rights. No sooner was this business concluded than the master commanded me to write to my parents, to inform them that I had signed the deed of renunciation, and was willing, for the benefit of my soul, to assume the monkish habit. He was present when I wrote this letter. I was, therefore, obliged to adopt the phrases suggested by him, phrases breathing zeal and devotion, full of indifference to the world, and tranquil satisfaction at the choice I had made. My parents, thought I, will be astonished when they read this epistle, but they must perceive that the language is not mine, so little is it in accordance with my former style of writing. Reader, in the course of thirteen months, only one of from fifty to sixty letters which I addressed to my mother was ever received by her, and that one was this very letter. The monks, instead of forwarding mine, had forged letters imitating the handwriting and adopting a style suited to their purpose, and instead of consigning to me the genuine replies, they artfully substituted answers of their own fabrication. My family, therefore, were not surprised at the tenor of this epistle, but rejoiced over it, and reputed me already a saint. They probably pictured me to themselves on some future day with a mitre on my head, with the red cap, nay, perhaps even wearing the triple crown. Oh, what a delusion! Poor deceived parents! You knew not that your son, in anguish and despair, was clashing his chains and devouring his tears in secret, that a triple bandage was placed before his eyes, and that he was being dragged, an unwilling victim, to the sacrifice. Returning home soon after, Chiochi rushed to his mother and asked if she had his letters. They were produced when he found that only one had been written by him, the rest were forgeries of the masters. It follows then, said my father, that these letters are forgeries, and the excuses they have so often made are base falsehoods. A teacher of the religion of Jesus Christ, guilty of lying and forgery, O oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, Unto their assembly, mine honour, be thou not united. But we have our darling home again, said I, and now we shall keep her with us. Never shall I forget the sweet, sad smile that came over her pale face as I uttered these words. Perchance even then she realised that she was soon to leave us, never more to return. 
However this may be, she gradually declined. Slowly but surely she went down to the grave. Every remedy was tried, every measure resorted to that seemed to promise relief, but all in vain. We had the best physicians, but they frankly confessed they did not understand her disease. In a very few months after her return, we laid our lovely and beloved sister beneath the clods of the valley. Our good old physician wept as he gazed upon her cold remains. I believe he thought she was poisoned, but as he could not prove it, he would only have injured himself by saying so. As for myself, I always thought that she knew too many of their secrets to be allowed to live after leaving them. And now, dear, she continued, do you think it strange that I hate the Romanists? Do you wonder if I feel like swearing when I think of priests and convents? Truly, I did not wonder that she hated them, though I could not understand what benefit it could be to swear about it. But I did not doubt the truth of her story. How often in the convent from which I fled had I heard them exult over the success of some deep-laid scheme to entrap the ignorant, the innocent, and the unwary. If a girl was rich or handsome, as sure as she entered their school, so sure was she to become a nun, unless she had influential friends to look after her and resolutely prevent it. To effect this, no means were left untried. The grossest hypocrisy and the meanest deception were practiced to prevent a girl from holding communication with anyone out of the convent. No matter how lonely or how homesick she might feel, she was not allowed to see her friends, or even to be informed of their kind attentions. So far from this she was made to believe, if possible, that her relatives had quite forsaken her, while those very relatives were boldly informed that she did not wish to see them. If they wrote to their friends, as they sometimes did, their letters were always destroyed, while those received at home were invariably written by the priest or superior. These remarks, however, refer only to those who are rich or beautiful in person. Many a girl can say with truth that she has attended the convent school, and no effort was ever made, no inducement ever presented to persuade her to become a nun. Consequently, she says that stories like the above are mere falsehoods, reported to injure the school. This may be true so far as she is concerned, but you may be sure she has neither riches nor beauty, or if possessed of these, there was some other strong reason why she should be an exception to the general rule. Could she know the private history of some of her schoolmates, she would tell a different story. I remember that while in the convent, I was one day sent upstairs to assist a superior in a chamber remote from the kitchen and in a part of the house where I had never been before. Returning alone to the kitchen, I passed a door that was partly open, and hearing a slight groan within, I pushed open the door and looked in, before I thought what I was doing. A young girl lay upon a bed, who looked more like a corpse than a living person. She saw me and motioned to have me come to her. As I drew near the bed, she burst into tears and whispered, Can't you get me a drink of cold water? I told her I did not know, but I would try. I hastened to the kitchen, and as no one was present but a nun whom I did not fear, I procured a pitcher of water and went back with it without meeting anyone on the way. I was well aware that if seen I should be punished but I did not care, 
I was doing as I wish others would do to me, and truly I had my reward. Never shall I forget how grateful that poor sufferer was for a draught of cold water. She could not tell how many days she had been fasting, for some of the time she had been insensible, but it must have been several days, and she did not know how long she was to remain in that condition. How came you here? I asked in a whisper, and what have you done to induce them to punish you so? Oh, said she, with a burst of tears, and grasping my hand with her pale, cold fingers. I was in the school, and I thought it would be so nice to be a nun. Then my father died and left me all his property, and they persuaded me to stay here and give it all to the church. I was so sad then I did not care for money, and I had no idea what a place it is. I really thought that the nuns were pure and holy, that their lives were devoted to heaven, their efforts consecrated to the cause of truth and righteousness. I thought that this was indeed the house of God, the very gate of heaven, but as soon as they were sure of me, they let me know. But you understand me, you know what I mean. I nodded assent, and once more asked, What did you do? Oh, I was in the school, said she, and I knew that a friend of mine was coming here, just as I did, and I could not bear to see her in all her loveliness and unsuspecting innocence become a victim to these vile priests. I found an opportunity to let her know what a hell she was coming to. Twas an unpardonable sin, you see. I had robbed the church, committed sacrilege, they said, and they have almost killed me for it. I wish they would quite, for I am sure death has no terrors for me now. God will never punish me for what I have done. But go, don't stay any longer, they'll kill you if they catch you here. I knew that she had spoken truly. They would kill me, almost if not quite, if they found me here. But I must know a little more. Did you save your friend? I asked. Or did you both have to suffer to pay for your generous act? Did I save her? Yes, thank God I did. She did not come, and she promised not to tell of me. I don't think she did, but they managed to find it out. I don't know how, and now, oh God, let me die. I was obliged to go, and I left her, with a promise to carry her some bread if I could. But I could not, and I never saw her again. Yet what a history her few words unfolded. It was so much like the landlady's story, I could not forbear relating it to her. She seemed much interested in all my convent adventures, and in this way we spent the night. End of chapter 13、Chapter、14 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter 14 The Two Sisters. Next morning, the lady informed me that I could not remain with her in safety, but she had a sister who lived about half a mile distant. With whom I could stop until my feet were sufficiently healed to enable me to resume my journey. She then sent for her sister, who very kindly, as I then thought, acceded to her request, and said I was welcome to stay with her as long as I wished. Arrangements were therefore made at once for my removal. My kind hostess brought two large buffalo robes 
into my chamber, which she wrapped around my person in such a way as to shield me from the observation of the servants. She then called one whom she could trust, and bade him take up the bundle and carry it down to a large covered wagon that stood at the door. I have often wondered whether the man knew what was in that bundle or not. I do not think he did, for he threw me across his shoulder as he would any bale of merchandise, and laid me on the bottom of the carriage. The two ladies then entered, laughing heartily at the success of their ruse, and joking me about my novel mode of conveyance. In this manner we were driven to the sisters' residence, and I was carried into the house by the servants in the same way. The landlady stopped for a few moments, and when she left she gave me cloth for a new dress, a few other articles of clothing, and three dollars in money. She bade me stay there and make my dress, and on no account venture out again in my nun dress. She wished me success in my efforts to escape, commended me to the care of our Heavenly Father, and bade me farewell. She returned in the wagon alone, and left me to make the acquaintance of my new hostess. This lady was a very different woman from her sister, and I soon had reason to regret that I was in her power. It has been suggested to me that the two ladies acted in concert, that I was removed for the sole purpose of being betrayed into the hands of my enemies. But I am not willing to believe this. Dark as human nature appears to me, accustomed as I am to regard almost every one with suspicion, still I cannot for one moment cherish a thought so injurious to one who was so kind to me. Is it possible that she could be such a hypocrite? treat me with so much tenderness, and I might say affection, and then give me up to what was worse than death? No, whatever the reader may think about it, I can never believe her guilty of such perfidy. I regret exceedingly my inability to give the name of this lady in connection with the history of her good deeds, but I did not learn the name of either sister. The one to whom I was now indebted for a shelter seemed altogether careless of my interests. I had been with her but a few hours when she asked me to do some washing for her. Of course, I was glad to do it, but when she requested me to go into the yard and hang the clothes upon the line, I became somewhat alarmed. I did not like to do it, and told her so but she laughed at my fears, overruled all my objections, said no one in that place would seek to harm or betray me, and assured me there was not the least danger. I at last consented to go, though my reason, judgment, and inclination, had I followed their dictates, would have kept me in the house. But I did not like to appear ungrateful, or unwilling to repay the kindness I received, as far as I was able. Still, I could not help feeling that it was an ungenerous demand. She might at least have offered me a bonnet or a shawl, as a partial disguise, but she did nothing of the kind. When I saw that I could not avoid the exposure, I resolved to make the best of it, and get through as quickly as possible. But my dress attracted a good deal of attention, and I saw more than one suspicious glance directed towards me before my task was finished. When it was over, I thought no more about it, but gave myself up to the bright anticipations of future happiness, which now began to take possession of my mind. That night I retired to a comfortable bed, and was soon lost to all earthly cares in the glorious land of dreams. What unalloyed happiness I enjoyed that night! What impossible feats I performed! Truly, the vision was bright, 
but a sad awakening followed. Some time in the night I was aroused by the flashing of a bright light from a dark lantern suddenly opened. I attempted to rise, but before I could realize where I was, a strong hand seized me, and a gag was thrust into my mouth. The man attempted to take me in his arms, but with my hands and feet I defended myself to the best of my ability. Another man now came to his assistance, and with strong cords confined my hands and feet, so that I was entirely at their mercy. Perfectly helpless, I could neither resist nor call for help. They then took me up and carried me downstairs, with no clothing but my nightdress, not even a shawl to shield me from the cold night air. At the gate stood a long covered wagon, in form like a butcher's cart, drawn by two horses, and beside it a long box with several men standing around it. I had only time to observe this when they thrust me into the box, closed the lid, placed it on the wagon, and drove rapidly away. I could not doubt for a moment into whose hands I had fallen, and when they put me in the box I wished I might suffocate and thus end my misery at once. But they had taken good care to prevent this by boring holes in the box which admitted enough air to keep up respiration, and this was the result of all my efforts for freedom. After I had suffered in making my escape, it was a terrible disappointment to be thus cruelly betrayed, gagged, bound, and boxed up like an article of merchandise, carried back to certain torture, and perchance to death. Oh, blame me not, gentle reader, if in my haste and the bitter disappointment and anguish of my spirit I question the justice of the power that rules the world. Nor let your virtuous indignation wax hot against me if I confess to you that I even doubted the existence of that power. How often had I cried to God for help? Why were my prayers and tears disregarded? What had I done to deserve a life of misery? These and similar thoughts occupied my mind during that lonely midnight ride. We arrived at St. Regis before the first mass in the morning. The box was then taken into the chapel, where they took me out and carried me into the church. I was seated at the foot of the altar, with my hands and feet fast bound, the gag still in my mouth, and no clothing on but my night dress. Two men stood beside me, and I remained here until the priest had said Mass, and the people retired from the church. He then came down from the altar, and said to the men beside me, Well, you have got her. Yes, sir, they replied. What shall we do with her? Put her on the five o'clock boat, said he, and let the other men go with her to Montreal. I want you to stay here and be ready to go the other way tonight. The priest was an Indian, but he spoke the English language correctly and fluently. He seemed to feel some pity for my forlorn condition, and as they were about to carry me away, he brought me a large shawl and wrapped it around me for which I was truly grateful. At the appointed time I was taken on board the boat, watched very closely by the two men who had me in charge. There was need enough for this, for I would very gladly have thrown myself into the water had I not been prevented. Once and again I attempted it, but the men held me back. For this I am now thankful, but at that time my life appeared of so little importance and the punishments I knew were in reserve for me seemed so fearful. I voluntarily chose 
strangling and death rather than life. The captain and sailors were all Romanists, and seemed to vie with each other in making me as unhappy as possible. They made sport of my new-fashioned clothing, and asked if I did not wish to run away again. When they found I did not notice them, they used the most abusive and scurrilous language, mingled with vulgar and profane expressions, which may not be repeated. The men who had charge of me, and who should have protected me from such abuse, so far from doing it, joined in the laugh, and appeared to think it a pleasant amusement to ridicule and vex a poor, helpless fugitive. May God forgive them for their cruelty, and in the hour of their greatest need, may they meet with the kindness they refused to me. At La Chine we changed boats and took another to Montreal. When we arrived there, three priests were waiting for us. Their names I perfectly remember, but I am not sure that I can spell them correctly. Having never learned while in the nunnery to read or spell anything but a simple prayer, it is not strange if I do make mistakes when attempting to give names from memory. I can only give them as they were pronounced. They were called Father Kelly, Dow, and Conroy. All the priests were called Father, of whatever age they might be. As we proceeded from the boat to the nunnery, one of the priests went before us, while the others walked beside me, leading me between them. People gazed at us as we passed, but they did not dare to insult or laugh at me while in such respectable company. Yet methinks it must have been a ludicrous sight to witness so much parade for a poor runaway nun. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson Chapter 15 Choice of Punishments On our arrival at the nunnery, I was left alone for half an hour. Then the bishop came in with the lady superior, and the abbess who had charge of the kitchen when I left. The bishop read to me three punishments of which he said I could take my choice. First, to fast five days in the fasting room. Second, to suffer punishment in the lime room. Third, to fast four days in the cell. As I knew nothing of these places except the cell, a priest was directed to take me to them that I might see for myself and then take my choice. At first I thought I did not care, and I said I had no choice about it, but when I came to see the rooms I was thankful that I was not allowed to abide by that decision. Certainly I had no idea what was before me. I was blindfolded and taken to the lime room first. I think it must have been situated at a great distance from the room we left, for he led me down several flights of stairs and through long, low passages where it was impossible to stand erect. At length we entered a room where the atmosphere seemed laden with hot vapour. My blinder was removed, and I found myself in a pleasant room some fifteen feet square. There was no furniture of any kind, but a wide bench fastened to the wall extended round three sides of the room. The floor looked like one solid block of dark-coloured marble, not a crack or seam to be seen in it, but it was clouded, highly polished, and very beautiful. Around the sides of the room a great number of hooks and chains were fastened to the wall, 
and a large hook hung in the center overhead. Near the door stood two men, with long iron bars, some two inches square, on their shoulders. The priest directed me to stand upon the bench, and turning to the men, he bade them raise the door. They put down their bars, and I suppose touched a concealed spring, for the whole floor at once flew up, and fastened to the large hook overhead. Surprised and terrified, I stood wondering what was to come next. At my feet yawned a deep pit, from which arose a suffocating vapour, so hot it almost scorched my face, and nearly stopped my breath. The priest pointed to the heaving, tumbling billows of smoke that were rolling below, and asked, How would you like to be thrown into the lime? Not at all, I gasped, in a voice scarcely audible. It would burn me to death. I suppose he thought I was sufficiently frightened, for he bade his men close the door. This they did by slowly letting down the floor, and I could see that it was in some way supported by the chains attached to the walls, but in what manner I did not know. I was nearly suffocated by the lime smoke that filled the room, and though I knew not what was in reserve for me, I was glad when my blinder was put on, and I was led away. I think we returned the same way we came, and entered another room where the scent was so very offensive that I begged to be taken out immediately, even before my eyes were uncovered and I knew nothing of the loathsome objects by which we were surrounded, I felt that I could not endure to breathe an atmosphere so deadly. But the sight that met my eyes when my blinder was removed, I cannot describe, nor the sensations with which I gazed upon it. I can only give the reader some faint idea of the place, which, they said, was called the fasting room and here incorrigible offenders fasted until they starved to death. Nor was this all. Their dead bodies were not even allowed a decent burial, but were suffered to remain in the place where they died until the work of death was complete, and dust returned to dust. Thus the atmosphere became a deadly poison to the next poor victim who was left to breathe the noxious effluvia of corruption and decay. I am well aware that my reader will hardly credit my statements, but I do solemnly affirm that I relate nothing but the truth. In this room were placed several large iron kettles, so deep that a person could sit in them and many of them contained the remains of human beings. In one, the corpse looked as though it had been dead but a short time. Others still sat erect in the kettle, but the flesh was dropping from the bones. Every stage of decay was here represented, from the commencement till nothing but a pile of bones was left of the poor sufferer. Conceive, if you can, with what feelings I gazed upon these disgusting relics of the dead. Even now, my blood chills in my veins, as memory recalls the fearful sight, or as, in sleep, I live over again the dread realities of that hour. Was I to meet a fate like this? I might perchance escape it for that time, but what assurance had I that I was not ultimately destined to such an end. These thoughts filled my mind, as I followed the priest from the room, and for a long time I continued to speculate upon what I had seen. They called it the fasting room, but if fasting were the only object, why were they placed in those kettles, instead of being allowed to sit on chairs or benches? or even on the floor, and why placed in iron kettles? 
Why were they not made of wood? It would have answered the purpose quite as well if fasting or starvation were the only objects in view. Then came the fearful suggestion, were these kettles ever heated? And was that floor made of stone or iron? The thought was too shocking to be cherished for a moment, but I could not drive it from my mind. I was again blindfolded and taken to a place they called a cell, but it was quite different from the one I was in before. We descended several steps as we entered it, and instead of the darkness I anticipated, I found myself in a large room with sufficient light to enable me to see every object distinctly. One end of a long chain was fastened around my waist, and the other firmly secured to an iron ring in the floor. But the chain, though large and heavy, was long enough to allow me to go all over the room. I could not see how it was lighted, but it must have been in some artificial manner, for it was quite as light at night as in the day. Here were instruments of various kinds, the use of which I did not understand, some of them lying on the floor, others attached to the sides of the room. One of them was made in the form of a large fish, but of what material I do not know. It was of a bright flesh color and fastened to a board on the floor. If I pressed my foot upon the board, it would put in motion some machinery within, which caused it to spring forward with a harsh, jarring sound like the rumbling of the cars. At the same time, its eyes would roll round and its mouth open, displaying a set of teeth so large and long that I was glad to keep at a safe distance. I wished to know whether it would really bite me or not, but it looked so frightful I did not dare to hazard the experiment. Another so nearly resembled a large serpent, I almost thought it was one, but I found it moved only when touched in a certain manner. Then it would roll over, open its mouth, and run out its tongue. There was another that I cannot describe, for I never saw anything that looked like it. It was some kind of machine, and the turning of a crank made it draw together in such a way that if a person were once within its embrace, the pressure would soon arrest the vital current and stop the breath of life. Around the walls of the room were chains, rings, and hooks, almost innumerable, but I did not know their use and feared to touch them. I believed them all to be instruments of torture, and I thought they gave me a long chain in the hope and expectation that my curiosity would lead me into some of the numerous traps the room contained. Every morning the figure I had seen beside the dying nun, which they called the devil, came to my cell, and unlocking the door himself, entered and walked around me, laughing heartily and seeming much pleased to find me there. He would blow white froth from his mouth, but he never spoke to me, and when he went out, he locked the door after him and took away the key. He was, in fact, very thoughtful and prudent, but it will be long before I believe that he came as they pretended from the spirit world. So, far from being frightened, the incident was rather a source of amusement. Such questions as the following would force themselves upon my mind. If that image really is the devil, where did he get that key? And what will he do with it? Does the devil hold the keys of this nunnery so that he can come and go as he pleases? Or are the priests on such friendly terms 
with his satanic majesty that they lend him their keys? Or do they hold them as partners? Gentlemen of the Grey Nunnery, please tell us how it is about those keys. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson — Chapter Sixteen — Horrors of Starvation One day a woman came into my cell, dressed in white white cap on her head, and so very pale she looked more like a corpse than a living person. She came up to me with her mouth wide open, and stood gazing at me for a moment in perfect silence. She then asked, Where have you been? Into the world, I replied. How did you like the world? Very well, said I. She paused a moment, and then asked, did you find your friends? No, ma'am, said I. I did not. Another pause, and then she said, Perhaps you will if you go again. No, I replied. I shall not try again. You had better try it once more, she added, and I thought there was a slight sneer in her tone. Perhaps you may succeed better another time. No, I replied, I shall not try to run away from the nunnery again. I should most assuredly be caught and brought back, and then they would make me suffer so much. I assure you, I shall never do it again. She looked at me a moment as though she would read my very soul, and said, And so you did not find your friends after all, did you? I again told her that I did not, and she seemed satisfied with the result of her questioning. When she came in, I was pleased to see her, and thought I would ask her for something to eat, or at least for a little cold water. But she seemed so cold-hearted, so entirely destitute of sympathy or kind feeling, I had no courage to speak to her for I felt that it would do no good. Perhaps I misjudged her. I knew from her looks that she must have been a great sufferer, but I have heard it said that extreme suffering sometimes hardens instead of softening the heart, and I believe it. It seemed to me that this woman had suffered so much herself that every kind of feeling was crushed out of her soul. I was glad when she left me, locking the door after her. Four days they kept me in this cell, and for five days and nights I had not tasted food or drink. I endured the most intolerable agonies from hunger and thirst. The suffering produced by hunger, when it becomes actual starvation, is far beyond anything that I can imagine. There is no other sensation that can be compared to it, and no language can describe it. One must feel it in order to realize what it is. The first two days I amused myself by walking around my room, and trying to conjecture the use to which the various instruments were applied. Then I became so weak I could only think of eating and drinking. I sometimes fell asleep, but only to dream of loaded tables and luxurious feasts. Yet I could never taste the luxuries thus presented. Whenever I attempted to do so, they would be snatched away, or I would wake to find it all a dream. Driven to a perfect frenzy by the intensity of my sufferings, I would gladly have eaten my own flesh. Well it was for me that no sharp instrument was at hand, for as a last resort 
I more than once attempted to tear open my veins with my teeth. This severe paroxysm passed away, and I sank into a state of partial unconsciousness, in which I remained until I was taken out of the cell. I do not believe I should have lived many hours longer, nor should I ever have been conscious of much more suffering. With me, the bitterness of death had passed, and I felt disappointed and almost angry to be recalled to a life of misery. I begged them to allow me to die. It was the only boon I craved. But this would have been too merciful. Moreover, they did not care to lose my services in the kitchen. I was a good drudge for them, and they wished to restore me on the same principle that a farmer would preserve the life of a valuable horse. I do not remember leaving the cell. The first thing I realized, they were placing me in a chair in the kitchen, and allowed me to lean my head upon the table. They gave me some gruel, and I soon revived, so that I could sit up in my chair and speak in a whisper. But it was some hours before I could stand on my feet or speak loud. An abbess was in the kitchen preparing bread and wine for the priests. They partake of these refreshments every day at ten in the morning and three in the afternoon. She brought a pail full of wine and placed it on the table near me, and left a glass standing beside it. When she turned away, I took the glass, dipped up a little of the wine, and drank it. She saw me do it, but said not a word, and I think she left it there for that purpose. The wine was very strong, and my stomach so weak I soon began to feel sick, and asked permission to go to bed. They took me up in their arms and carried me to my old room and laid me on the bed. Here they left me, but the abbess soon returned with some gruel made very palatable with milk and sugar. I was weak, and my hand trembled so that I could not feed myself, but the abbess kindly sat beside me and fed me until I was satisfied. I had nothing more to eat until the next day at eleven o'clock, when the abbess again brought me some bread and gruel and a cup of strong tea. She requested me to drink the tea as quick as possible, and then she concealed the mug in which she brought it. I was now able to feed myself, and you may be sure I had an excellent appetite, and was not half so particular about my food as some persons I have since known. I lay in bed till near night, when I rose, dressed myself without assistance, and went down to the kitchen. I was so weak and trembled so that I could hardly manage to get downstairs, but I succeeded at last, for a strong will is a wonderful incentive to efficient action. In the kitchen I met the Lady Superior. She saw how weak I was, and as she assisted me to a chair, she said, I should not have supposed that you could get down here alone. Have you had anything to eat today? I was about to say yes, but one of the nuns shook her head at me, and I replied, No. She then brought some bread and wine, requesting me to eat it quick, for fear some of the priests might come in and detect us. Thus I saw that she feared the priests as well as the rest of us. Truly, it was a terrible crime she had committed. No wonder she was afraid of being caught giving a poor starved nun a piece of bread, and then obliged to conceal it as she would have done a larceny or a murder. Think of it, reader, and conceive if you can, the state of that community where humanity is a crime, where mercy is considered a weakness of which one should be ashamed. If a pirate or a highwayman had been guilty of treating a captive 
as cruelly as I was treated by those priests. He would have been looked upon as an inhuman monster, and at once given up to the strong grasp of the law. But when it is done by a priest, under the cloak of religion, and within the sacred precincts of a nunnery, people cry out, when the tale is told, Impossible! What motive could they have had? It cannot be true! etc. But whether the statement is believed or otherwise, it is a fact that in the grey nunnery at Montreal the least exhibition of a humane spirit was punished as a crime. The nun who was found guilty of showing mercy to a fellow sufferer was sure to find none herself. From this time I gained very fast, for the abbess saw how hungry I was, and she would either put food in my way or give me privately what I wished to eat. In two weeks I was able to go to work in the kitchen again, but those I had formerly seen there were gone. I never knew what became of the sick nun, nor could I learn anything about the one who ran away with me. I thought that the men who brought me to St. Regis were kept there to go after her, but I do not know whether they found her or not. For myself, I promised so solemnly and with such apparent sincerity that I would never leave the nunnery again, I was believed and trusted. Had I been kindly treated, had my life been even tolerable, my conscience would have reproached me for deceiving them. But as it was, I felt that I was more sinned against than sinning. I could not think it wrong to get away, if the opportunity presented and for this I was constantly on the watch. Every night I lay awake long after all the rest were buried in slumber, trying to devise some plan by which I could once more regain my liberty. And who can blame me? Having just tasted the sweets of freedom, how could I be content to remain in servitude all my life? Many a time have I left my bed at night resolved to try to escape once more, but the fear of detection would deter me from the attempt. In the discharge of my daily duties, I strove to the utmost of my ability to please my employers. I so far succeeded that for five weeks after my return I escaped punishment. Then I made a slight mistake about my work though I verily thought I was doing it according to the direction. For this I was told that I must go without two meals and spend three days in the torture room. I supposed it was the same room I was in before, but I was mistaken. I was taken to the kitchen cellar and down a flight of stairs to another room directly under it. From thence a door opened into another subterranean apartment, which they called the torture room. These doors were so constructed that a casual observer would not be likely to notice them. I had been in that cellar many times, but never saw that door till I was taken through it. A person might live in the nunnery a lifetime, and never see or hear anything of such a place. I presume those visitors who call at the schoolrooms go over a part of the house and leave with the impression that the convent is a nice place, will never believe my statements about this room, nor can we wonder at their scepticism. It is exceedingly difficult for pure minds to conceive how any human being can be so fearfully depraved. Knowing the purity of their own intentions, and judging others by themselves, it is not strange that they regard such tales of guilt and terror as mere fabrications, put forth to gratify the curiosity of the wonder-loving crowd. End of chapter 16 
Chapter Seventeen of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter Seventeen The Torture Room. I remember hearing a gentleman at the depot remark that the very enormity of the crimes committed by the Romanists is their best protection. For, said he, some of their practices are so shockingly infamous, they may not even be alluded to in the presence of the refined and the virtuous. And if the story of their guilt were told, who would believe the tale? Far easier would it be to call the whole a slanderous fabrication than to believe that man can be so vile. This consideration led me to doubt the propriety of attempting a description of what I saw in that room. But I have engaged to give a faithful narrative of what transpired in the nunnery, and shall I leave out a part, because it is so strange and monstrous that people will not believe it? No. I will tell without the least exaggeration what I saw, heard, and experienced. People may not credit the story now, but a day will surely come when they know that I speak the truth. As I entered the room, I was exceedingly shocked at the horrid spectacle that met my eye. I knew that fearful scenes were enacted in the subterranean cells, but I never imagined anything half so terrible as this. In various parts of the room I saw machines and instruments of torture, and on some of them persons were confined who seemed to be suffering the most excruciating agony. I paused, utterly overcome with terror, and for a moment imagined that I was a witness to the torments which the priests say are endured by the lost in the world of woe. Was I to undergo such tortures, and which of those infernal engines would be applied to me? I was not long in doubt. The priest took hold of me, and put me in a machine that held me fast, while my feet rested on a piece of iron, which was gradually heated, until both feet were blistered, I think I must have been there fifteen minutes, but perhaps the time seemed longer than it was. He then took me out, put some ointment on my feet, and left me. I was now at liberty to examine more minutely the strange objects around me. There were some persons in the place whose punishment, like my own, was light compared with others, but near me lay one old lady extended on a rack. Her joints were all dislocated, and she was emaciated to the last degree. I do not suppose I can describe this rack, for I never saw anything like it. It looked like a gridiron, but was long enough for the tallest man to lie upon. There were large rollers at each end, to which belts were attached, with a large lever to drive them back and forth. Upon this rack the poor woman was fastened in such a way that when the levers were turned and the rollers made to revolve, every bone in her body was displaced. Then the violent strain would be relaxed a little, and she was so very poor her skin would sink into the joints, and remain there till it mortified and corrupted. It was enough to melt the hardest heart to witness her agony, but she bore it with a degree of fortitude and patience I could not have supposed possible, had I not been compelled to behold it. When I entered the room, she looked up and said, Have you come to release me? or only to suffer with me. I did not dare to reply, for the priest was there, 
but when he left us, she exclaimed, My child, let nothing induce you to believe this cursed religion. It will be the death of you, and that death will be the death of a dog. I suppose she meant that they would kill me as they would a dog. She then asked, Who put you here? My father, said I. He must have been a brute, said she, or he could never have done it. At one time I happened to mention the name of God, when she fiercely exclaimed with gestures of contempt, A God? You believe there is one, do you? Don't you suffer yourself to believe any such thing? Think you that a wise, merciful, and all-powerful being would allow such a hell as this to exist? Would he suffer me to be torn from friends and home, from my poor children, and all that my soul holds dear, to be confined in this den of iniquity and tortured to death in this cruel manner? No. Oh, no. He would at once destroy these monsters in human form. He would not suffer them for one moment to breathe the pure air of heaven. At another time she exclaimed, Oh, my children, my poor motherless children, what will become of them? God of mercy protect my children. Thus at one moment she would say there was no God, and the next pray to him for help. This did not surprise me, for she was in such intolerable misery, she did not realize what she did say. Every few hours the priest came in and gave the rollers a turn when her joints would crack, and, but I cannot describe it, the sight made me sick and faint at the time, as the recollection of it does now. It seemed as though that man must have had a heart of adamant, or he could not have done it. She would shriek, and groan, and weep, but it did not affect him in the least. He was as calm and deliberate as though he had a block of wood in his hands, instead of a human being. When I saw him coming, I once shook my head at her to have her stop speaking, but when he was gone she said, Don't shake your head at me, I do not fear him. He can but kill me, and the quicker he does it, the better. I would be glad if he would put an end to my misery at once, but that would be too merciful. He is determined to kill me by inches, and it makes no difference what I say to him. She had no food or drink during the three days I was there, and the priest never spoke to her. He brought me my bread and water regularly, and I would gladly have given it to that poor woman if she would have taken it. But she would not accept the offer. It would only prolong her sufferings and she wished to die. I do not suppose she could have lived had she been taken out when I first saw her. In another part of the room a monk was under punishment. He was standing in some kind of a machine with heavy weights attached to his feet and a belt passed across his breast under his arms. He appeared to be in great distress and no refreshment was furnished him while I was there. On one side of the room I observed a closet with a slide door, as the nuns called them. There were several doors of this description in the building, so constructed as to slide back into the ceiling out of sight. Through this opening I could see an image resembling a monk, and whenever anyone was put in there they would shriek and groan and beg to be taken out, but I could not ascertain the cause of their suffering. One day a nun was brought in to be punished. The priest led her up to the side of the room and bade her put her fingers into some holes in the wall just large enough to admit them. She obeyed, but immediately drew them back with a loud shriek. I looked to see what was the matter with her and lo, every nail was torn from her fingers, which were bleeding profusely. 
How it was done I do not know. Certainly there was no visible cause for such a surprising effect. In all probability the fingers came in contact with the spring of some machine on the other side, or within the wall to which some sharp instrument was attached. I would give much to know just how it was constructed, and what the girl had done to subject herself to such a terrible and unheard-of punishment. But this, like many other things in that establishment, was wrapped in impenetrable mystery. God only knows when the veil will be removed, or whether it ever will be until the day when all secret things will be brought to light. When the three days expired, I was taken out of this room, but did not go to work again until my feet were healed. I was then obliged to assist in milking the cows, and taking care of the milk. They had a large number of cows, I believe thirty-five, and dairy rooms with everything convenient for making butter and cheese. When first directed to go out and milk, I was pleased with the idea, for I had hoped to find an opportunity to escape, but I was again disappointed. In the cow-yard, as elsewhere, every precaution was taken to prevent it. Passing out of the main yard of the convent through a small door, I found myself in a small, neat yard, surrounded by a high fence, so that nothing could be seen but the sky overhead. The cows were driven in, and the door immediately locked, so that escape from that place seemed impossible. At harvest time, in company with twenty other nuns, I was taken out into the country to the residence of the monks. The ride out there was a great treat, and very much enjoyed by us all. I believe it was about five miles through a part of the city of Montreal, the north part, I think, but I am not sure. We stopped before a large white stone building situated in the midst of a large yard like the one at the nunnery. A beautiful walk, paved with stone, led from the gate to the front door, and from thence around the house. Within the yard there was also a delightful garden, with neat, well-kept walks laid out in various directions. Before the front door there stood a large cross. I think I never saw a more charming place, it appeared to me a perfect paradise. I heard one of the priests say that the farm consisted of four hundred acres and belonged to the nunnery. The house was kept by two widow ladies who were married before they embraced the Romish faith. They were the only women on the place previous to our arrival, and I think they must have found it very laborious work to wait on so many monks. I do not know their number, but there was a great many of them, beside a large family of boys, who, I supposed, were being educated for priests or monks. Immediately on our arrival, a part of our number were set to work in the fields, while the rest were kept in the house to assist the women. I hoped that I might be one of these, but disappointment was again my lot. I was sent to the field with the others, and set to reaping, a priest being stationed near, to guard us and oversee our work. We were watched very closely, one priest having charge of two nuns, for whose safe-keeping he was responsible. Here we labored until the harvest was all gathered in. I dug potatoes, cut up corn and husked it, gathered apples, and did all kinds of work that is usually done by men in the fall of the year. Yet I was never allowed to wear a bonnet on my head, or anything to shield me from the piercing rays of the sun. Some days the heat was almost intolerable, and my cap was not the least protection, but they allowed me no other covering. In consequence of this exposure, my head soon became the seat of severe neuralgic pain, which caused me at times to linger over my work. 
but this was not permitted. My movements were immediately quickened, for the work must be done, notwithstanding the severe pain. Every command must be obeyed, whatever the result. At night a part of our number were taken to the nunnery, and the rest of us locked up in our rooms in the house. We were not permitted to take our meals with the two housekeepers, but a table was set for us in another room. One would think that when gathering the fruit we would be allowed to partake of it, or at least to taste it, but this was not allowed and as a priest's eye was ever upon us, we dare not disobey, however much we might wish to do so. I used to wonder if the two women who kept the house were as severely dealt with as we were, but had no means whereby to satisfy my curiosity. They were not allowed to converse with us, and we might not speak to them, or even look them in the face. Here, as at the nunnery, we were obliged to walk with the head bent forward a little, the eyes fixed on the floor, one hand, if disengaged, under the cape, the other down by the side, and on no occasion might we look a person in the face. The two women seemed to be governed by the same rules that we were, and subject to the same masters. I used to think a great deal about them, and longed to know their history. They wore blue dresses with white caps and white handkerchiefs on their necks. Their life, I think, was a hard one. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson Chapter 18 Return to the Nunnery While we remained in this place, I was not punished in any of the usual methods. Perhaps they thought the exposure to a burning sun and a severe headache sufficient to keep me in subjection without any other infliction. But immediately on my return to the nunnery, I was again subjected to the same cruel, capricious, and unreasonable punishment. On the first day after my return, one of the priests came into the kitchen where I was at work and I hastened to give him the usual respectful salutation, which I have before described. But he took hold of my arm and said, What do you look cross for? And without giving me time to reply, even if I had dared to do so, he added, I'll teach you not to look cross at me. He left the room with an expression of countenance that frightened me. I was not aware of looking cross at him, though I must confess I had suffered so much at his hands already, I did not feel very happy in his presence. Yet I always endeavoured to treat him with all due respect. Certainly his accusation against me in this instance was as false as it was cruel. But what of that? I was only a nun, and who would care if I was punished unjustly? The priest soon returned with a band of leather, or something of the kind, into which thorns were fastened in such numbers that the inside was completely covered with them. This he fastened around my head, with the points of the thorns pressing into the skin, and drew it so tight that the blood ran in streams over my neck and shoulders. I wore this band or crown of thorns, as they called it, for six hours, and all the time continued my work as usual. Then I thought of the crown of thorns our Saviour wore when he gave his life a ransom for the sins of the world. I thought I could realize something of his personal agony, and the prayer of my soul went up to heaven for grace to follow his example 
and forgive my tormentors. From this time I was punished every day while I remained there, and for the most simple things. It was evident they wished to break down my spirit, but it only confirmed me in my resolution to get away from them as soon as possible. One day I chanced to close the door a little too hard. It was mere accident, but for doing it they burned me with red-hot tongs. They kept them in the fire till they were red-hot, then plunged them into cold water, drew them out as quickly as possible, and immediately applied them to my arms or feet. The skin would, of course, adhere to the iron, and it would sometime burn down to the bone before they condescended to remove it. At another time I was cruelly burned on my arms and shoulders for not standing erect. The flesh was deep in some places, and the agony I suffered was intolerable. I thought of the stories the abbess used to tell me, years before, about the martyrs who were burned at the stake. But I had not a martyr's faith, and I could not imitate their patience and resignation. The sores made on these occasions were long in healing, and to this day I bear upon my person the scars caused by these frequent burnings. I was often punished because I forgot to walk on my toes. For this trivial offence I have often been made to fast two days. We all wore cloth shoes, and it was the rule of the house that we should all walk on tiptoe. Sometimes we would forget, and take a step or two in the usual way, and then it did seem as though they rejoiced in the opportunity to inflict punishment. It was the only amusement they had, and there was so little variety in their daily life. I believe they were glad of anything to break in upon the monotony of convent life and give them a little excitement. It was very hard for me to learn to walk on my toes, and as I often failed to do it, I was of course punished for the atrocious crime. But I did learn at last for what can we not accomplish by resolute perseverance? Several years of practice so confirmed the habit that I found it as difficult to leave off as it was to begin. Even now I find myself tripping along on tiptoe before I am aware of it. We had a very cruel abbess in the kitchen, and this was one reason of our being punished so often. She was young and inexperienced, and had just been promoted to office, with which she seemed much pleased and elated. She embraced every opportunity to exercise her authority, and often have I fasted two whole days for accidentally spilling a little water on the kitchen floor. Whenever she wished to call my attention to her, she did not content herself with simply speaking but would box my ears, pull my hair, pinch my arms, and in many ways so annoy and provoke me that I often wished her dead. One day when I was cleaning knives and forks, she came up to me and gave me such a severe pinch on my arm that I carried the marks for many days. I did not wait to think what I was doing, but turned and struck her with all my might. It could not have been a light blow, for I was very angry. She turned away, saying she would report me to the Lady Superior. I did not answer her, but as she passed through the door, I threw a knife, which I hoped would hit her, but it struck the door as she closed it. I expected something dreadful would be done to me after this willful violation of a well-known law. But I could bear it, I thought, and I was glad I hit her so hard. She soon returned with a young priest, who had been there but a short time, and his heart had not yet become so hard as it is necessary to be a good Romish priest. 
he came to me and asked, What is the matter? I told him the abbess punished me every day, that in fact I was under punishment most of the time, that I did not deserve it, and I was resolved to bear it no longer. I struck her because she pinched me for no good reason, and I should in future try to defend myself from her cruelty. Do you know, said he, what will be done to you for this? No, sir, said I, I do not know. And I was about to add, I do not care, but I restrained myself. He went out, and for a long time I expected to be called to account, but I heard no more of it. The abbess, however, went on in the old way, tormenting me on every occasion. One day the priests had a quarrel among themselves, and if I had said a drunken quarrel, I do not think it would have been a very great mistake. In the fray they stabbed one of their number in the side, drew him out of his room, and left him on the floor in the hall of the main building, but one flight of stairs above the kitchen. Two nuns, who did the chamber work, came downstairs, and seeing him lie there helpless and forsaken, they took him by the hair of the head and drew him down to the kitchen. Here they began to torment him in the most cruel manner. They burned sticks in the fire until the end was a live coal, put them into his hands and closed them, pressing the burning wood into the flesh, and thus producing the most exquisite pain. At least this would have been the result if he had realized their cruelty, but I think he was insensible before they touched him, or if not, must have died very soon after, for I am sure he was dead when I first saw him. I went to them and remonstrated against such inhuman conduct. That man has tormented me more than I can him, if I do my best, and I wish him to know how good it is. But, said I, someone will come in and you will be caught in the act. I'll risk that, said she. They are quarrelling all over the house, and will have enough to do to look after each other for a while, I assure you. But the man is dead, said I. How can you treat a senseless corpse in that way? I'm afraid he is dead, she replied. He don't move at all, and I can't feel his heart beat, but I did hope to make him realize how good the fire feels. Meanwhile, the blood was flowing from the wound in his side, and ran over the floor. The sight of this alarmed them, and they drew him into another dark hall, and left him beside the door of a room used for punishment. They then came back, locked the hall door, and washed up the blood. They expected to be punished for moving the dead body, but the floor was dry before any of the priests came in, and I do not think it was ever known. Perhaps they did not remember events as distinctly as they might under other circumstances and it is very possible that when they found the corpse they might not have been able to say whether it was where they left it or not. We all rejoiced over the death of that priest. He was a very cruel man, had punished me times without number, but though I was glad he was dead, I could not have touched him when he lay helpless and insensible. A few weeks after the events just related, Another trifling occurrence brought me into collision with the abbess. And here let me remark that I have no way by which to ascertain at what particular time certain events transpired. The reader will understand that I write this narrative from memory, and our life at the nunnery was so monotonous, the days and weeks passed by with such dull and irksome uniformity, that sometimes our frequent punishments were the only memorable events to break in upon the tiresome sameness of our unvarying life. Of course, 
The most simple thing was regarded by us as a great event, something worthy of special notice, because for the time it diverted our minds from the peculiar restraints of our disagreeable situation. To illustrate this remark, let me relate an incident that transpired about this time. I was one day sent to a part of the house where I was not in the habit of going. I was passing along a dark hall when a ray of light from an open door fell upon my path. I looked up, and as the door at that moment swung wide open, I saw before the glass, in a richly furnished room, the most beautiful woman I ever beheld. From the purity of her complexion, and the bright color of her cheeks and lips, I could have taken her for a piece of waxwork, but for the fact that she was carelessly arranging her hair. She was tall and elegant in person, with a countenance of such rare and surpassing beauty, I involuntarily exclaimed, What a beautiful woman! She turned towards me with a smile of angelic sweetness, while an expression of sympathetic emotion overspread her exquisitely moulded features, which seemed to say as plainly as though she had spoken in words, Poor child, I pity you. I now became conscious that I was breaking the rules of the house, and hastened away. But, oh, How many days my soul fed on that smile. I never saw the lady again. Her name I could never know. But that look of tenderness will never be forgotten. It was something to think of through many dreary hours. Something to look back to and be grateful for all the days of my life. But to return to my narrative. The priest's had a large quantity of sap gathered from the maple trees and brought to the nunnery to be boiled into sugar. Another nun and myself were left to watch it, keep the kettle filled up and prevent it from burning. It was boiled in the large cauldron of which I have before spoken and covered with a large thin wooden cover. The sap had boiled some time and become very thick. I was employed in filling up the kettle when the abbess came into the room, and after a few inquiries directed me to stand upon the cover of the cauldron, and fix a large hook directly over it. I objected, for I know full well that it would not bear a fourth part of my weight. She then took hold of me, and tried to force me to step upon it but I knew that I should be burned to death, for the cover, on account of its enormous size, was made as thin as possible, that we might be able to lift it. When I saw that she was determined to make me yield, in self-defense I threw her upon the floor. Would that I had been content to stop there! But no, when I saw her in my power, and remembered how much I had suffered from her, my angry passions rose, and I thought only of revenge. I commenced beating her with all my might, and when I stopped from mere exhaustion, the other nun caught her by the hair and began to draw her round the room. She struggled and shrieked, but she could not help herself. Her screams, however, alarmed the house and hearing one of the priests coming, the nun gave her a kick and left her. The priest asked what we were doing, and the abbess related with all possible exaggeration the story of our cruelty. But what did you do to them? asked the priest. You gave them some provocation, or they would never treat you so. She was then obliged to tell what had passed between us, and he said she deserved to suffer for giving such an order. Why, said he, that cover would not have held her a moment, and she would most assuredly have burned to death. He punished us all. 
the abbess for giving the order, and us for abusing her. I should not have done this thing, had I not come off so well, when I once before attempted to defend myself. But my success at that time gave me courage to try it again. My punishment was just, and I bore it well, consoled by the thought that justice was awarded to the abbess as well as myself. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah Richardson. Chapter 19 Sickness and Death of a Superior The next excitement in our little community was caused by the sickness and death of our superior. I do not know what her disease was, but she was sick two weeks, and one of the nuns from the kitchen was sent to take care of her. One night she was so much worse, the nun thought she would die, and she began to torment her in the most inhuman manner. She had been severely punished a short time before at the instigation of this woman, and she then swore revenge if she ever found an opportunity. Now it was presented. She was in her power, too weak to resist or call for assistance, and she resolved to let her know by experience how bitterly she had made others suffer in days gone by. It was a fiendish spirit, undoubtedly that prompted her to seek revenge upon the dying but what else could we expect? She only followed the example of her elders, and if she went somewhat beyond their teachings, she had, as we shall see, her reasons for so doing. With hot irons she burned her on various parts of her person, cut great gashes in the flesh upon her face, sides and arms, and then rubbed salt and pepper into the wounds but I will not try to describe it. The wretched woman died before morning, and the nun went to the priest and told him that the superior was dead and that she had killed her. The priests were immediately all called together, and the bishop called upon for counsel. He sentenced her to be hung that morning in the chapel before the assembled household. The abbess came and informed us what had taken place, and directed us to get ready and go to the chapel. When we entered, the doomed girl sat upon a chair on the altar. She was clad in a white robe with a white cap on her head, and appeared calm, self-possessed, and even joyful. The bishop asked her if she had anything to say for herself. She immediately rose and said, I have killed the superior, for which I am to be hung. I know that I deserve to die, but I have suffered more than death many times over from punishments inflicted by her order. For many years my life has been one of continual suffering, and for what? For just nothing at all, or for the most simple things. Is it right, is it just, to starve a person two whole days for shutting the door a little too hard, or to burn one with hot irons because a little water was accidentally spilt on the floor? Yet for these and similar things I have again and again been tortured within an inch of my life. Now that I am to be hung, I am glad of it, for I shall die quick and be out of my misery instead of being tortured to death by inches. I did this thing for this very purpose, for I do not fear death, nor anything that comes after it. Talk about the existence of a God? I don't believe a word of it. 
and the story of heaven and hell, purgatory and the Virgin Mary? Why, it's all a humbug, like the rest of the vile stuff you call religion. Religion, indeed! You won't catch us nuns believing it, and more than that, you don't believe it yourselves, not one of you. She sat down, and they put a cap over her head and face, drew it tight around her neck, adjusted the rope, and she was launched into eternity. To me it seemed a horrid thing, and I could not look upon her dying struggles. I did not justify the girl in what she had done, yet I knew the woman would have died if she had let her alone, and I also knew that worse things than that were done in the nunnery almost every day, and that, too, by the very men who had taken her life. I left the chapel with a firm resolve to make one more effort to escape from a thraldom that every day became more irksome. At the door, the abbess met me, and led me to a room I had never seen before, where, to my great surprise, I found my bed. She said it was removed by her order, and in future I was to sleep in that room. What? Sleep here alone? I exclaimed, quite forgetting in the agitation of the moment the rule of silent obedience. But she did not condescend to notice either my question or the unpleasant feelings which must have been visible in my features. I did feel very much troubled. I had never slept in a room alone a night in my life. Another nun always occupied the room with me, and when she was absent, as she often was when under punishment, the abbess slept there, so that I was never alone. I did not often meet the girl with whom I slept, as she did not work in the kitchen, but whenever I did, I felt as pleased as though she had been my sister. Yet I never spoke to her, nor did she ever attempt to converse with me. Yes, strange as it may seem, incredible as my reader may think it, it is a fact that during all the years we slept together, not one word ever passed between us. We did not dare to communicate our thoughts by signs, lest the abbess should detect us. That night I spent in my new room, but I could not sleep. I had heard strange hints about some room where no one could sleep, and where no one liked to go, though for what reason I could never learn. When I first entered, I discovered that the floor was badly stained and while speculating on the cause of those stains, I came to the conclusion that this was the room to which so much mystery was attached. It was very dark, with no window in it, situated in the midst of the house, surrounded by other rooms, and no means of ventilation except the door. I did not close my eyes during the whole night. I imagined that the door opened and shut, that persons were walking in the room, and I am certain that I heard noises near my bed for which I could not account. Altogether, it was the most uncomfortable night I ever spent, and I believe that few persons would have felt entirely at ease in my situation. To such a degree did these superstitious fears assail me, I felt as though I would endure any amount of physical suffering, rather than stay there another night. Resolved to brave everything, I went to a priest and asked permission to speak to him. It was an unusual thing, and I think his curiosity was excited, for it was only in extreme cases that a nun ventures to appeal to a priest. When I told him my story, he seemed much surprised, and asked by whose order my bed was moved to that room. 
I informed him of all the particulars, when he ordered me to move my bed back again. No one, said he, has slept in that room for years, and we do not wish anyone to sleep there. I accordingly moved the bed back, and as I had permission from the priest, the abbess dared not find fault with me. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson Chapter 20 Students at the Academy through the winter I continued to work as usual, leading the same dull, dreary, and monotonous life, varied only by pains and privations. In the spring a slight change was made in the household arrangements, and for a short time I assisted some of the other nuns to do the chamber work for the students at the academy. There was an underground passage from the convent to the cellar of the academy, through which we passed. Before we entered, the doors and windows were securely fastened, and the students ordered to leave their rooms, and not return again till we had left. They were also forbidden to speak to us, but whenever the teachers were away, they were sure to come back to their rooms and ask us all manner of questions. They wished to know, they said, how long we were going to stay in the convent if we really enjoyed the life we had chosen, and were happy in our retirement, if we had not rather return to the world, go into company, get married, etc. I suppose they really thought that we could leave at any time if we chose, but we did not dare to answer their questions, or let them know the truth. One day when we went to do the work, we found in one of the rooms some men who were engaged in painting. They asked us if we were contented. We did not dare to reply, lest they should betray us. They then began to make remarks about us, some of which I well remember. One of them said, I don't believe they are used very well. They look as though they were half starved. Another replied, I know they do. There is certainly something wrong about these convents, or the nuns, would not all look so pale and thin. I suspect the man little thought how much truth there was in his remarks. Soon after the painters left, we were all taken suddenly ill. Some were worse than others, but all were unwell except one nun. As all exhibited the same symptoms, we were supposed to have taken poison, and suspicion fastened on that nun. She was put upon the rack, and when she saw that her guilt could not be concealed, she confessed that she poisoned the water in the well, but she would not tell what she put into it, nor where she got it. She said she did not do it to injure the nuns, for she thought they were allowed so little drink with their food they would not be affected by it, while those who drank more she hoped to kill. She disliked all the priests and the superior, and would gladly have murdered them all. But for one priest in particular she felt all the hatred that a naturally malignant spirit, excited by repeated acts of cruelty, is capable of. He had punished her repeatedly, and as she thought, unjustly, and she resolved to avenge herself and destroy her enemy, even though the innocent should suffer with the guilty. This was all wrong, fearfully wrong, we must admit. But while we look with horror at the enormity of her crime, let us remember that she had great provocation. I hope there are few who could have sought revenge in the way she did. Yet I cannot believe that any one would endure from another what she was compelled to suffer from that man, without some feelings of resentment. Let us not judge too harshly this erring sister, for if her crime was great, her wrongs were neither small nor few, 
and her punishment was terrible. They tortured her a long time to make her tell what kind of poison she put in the well and where she obtained it. They supposed she must have got it from the painters, but she would never tell where she procured it. This fact proves that she had some generous feelings left. Under any other circumstances, such magnanimity would have been highly applauded, and in my secret soul I could not but admire the firmness with which she bore her sufferings. She was kept upon the rack until all her joints were dislocated, and the flesh around them mortified. They then carried her to her room, removed the bed, and laid her upon the bed cord. The nuns were all assembled to look at her, and take warning by her sad fate. Such a picture of misery I never saw before. She seems to have suffered even more than the old lady I saw in the cellar. It was but a moment, however, that we were allowed to gaze upon her shrunken, ghastly features, and then she was hid from our sight forever. The nuns, except two or three, were sent from the room and thus the murder was consummated. What else can we call it? There was one young student at the academy whose name was Smalley. He was from New England, and his father lived at St. Albans, Vermont, where he had wealth and influence. This young man had a little sister who used to visit at the convent, whom they called Sissy Smalley. She was young, but handsome, witty, and intelligent. For one of her age she was very much refined in her manners. They allowed her to go anywhere in the building except the private apartments where those deeds of darkness were performed which would not bear the pure light of heaven. I presume that no argument could convince Sissy Smalley that such rooms were actually in the nunnery. She had been all over it, she would tell you, and she never saw any torture rooms, never heard of any one being punished, or anything of the kind. Such reports would appear to her as mere slanders. Yet God knows they are true. I well remember how I used to shudder to hear that child praise the nunnery, tell what a nice, quiet place it was, and how she would like it for a permanent home. I hope her brother will find out the truth about it in season, to prevent his beautiful sister from ever becoming a nun. End of chapter 20。Chapter 21 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter 21. Second Escape from the Nunnery. It was early in the spring when I again succeeded in making my escape. It was on a Saturday evening when the priests and nearly all the nuns were in the chapel. I was assisted out of the yard in the same way I was before, and by the same person. There was still snow upon the ground, and that they might not be able to track me, I entered the market and walked the whole length of it without attracting observation. From thence I crossed the street when I saw a police officer coming directly towards me. I turned down a dark alley and ran for my life, I knew not whither. It is the duty of every police officer in Montreal to accompany any of the sisters whom they chance to meet in the street, and I knew if he saw me he would offer to attend me wherever I wished to go. Such an offer might not be refused, and certainly his company just at that time was neither desirable nor agreeable. At the end of the alley I found myself near a large church, and two priests were coming directly towards me. It is said, the drowning catch at straws. 
Whether this be true or not, the plan I adopted in this emergency seemed as hopeless for my preservation as a straw for the support of the drowning. Yet, it was the only course I could pursue, for to escape unseen was impossible. I therefore resolved to go boldly past them, and try to make them think I was a superior going to church. Trying to appear as indifferent as possible, I approached and saluted them in the usual way. This is done by throwing forward the open hand, and passing it down by the side with a slight inclination of the head. The priest returns the salutation by standing with uncovered head till you have passed. In the present instance, the priest said, as he removed his hat, Church is in, sister. I bowed again, and hastened on. With trembling limbs, I ascended the church steps, and stood there till the priests were out of sight. It was but a moment, yet it seemed a long time. I knew the house was filled with priests and students, some of whom would be sure to recognize me at once. What if they should come out? The thought of it nearly took away my breath. The cold perspiration started from my brow, and I felt as though I should faint. But my fears were not realized, and as soon as the priests were out of sight, I went on again. Soon I came to a cross street, leading to the river, where a large hotel stood on the corner. I followed the river and traveled all night. The next day, fearing to be seen by people going to church, I hid in a cellar hole, covered over with old boards and timbers. At night I went on again, and on Sunday evening, about ten o'clock, I came to a small village where I resolved to seek food and lodging. Tired, hungry, and cold, feeling as though I could not take another step, I called at one of the houses and asked permission to stay overnight. It was cheerfully granted. The lady gave me some milk, and I retired to rest. Next morning I rose early, and left before any of the family were up. I knew they were all Romanists, and I feared to trust them. At noon that day I arrived at St. Ors, a town named, as I have been informed, for the man who owns a great part of it. I stopped at a public house which they called Lady St. Ors, where they were eating dinner. The landlady invited me to dine with them and asked if I belonged to the convent in that place. I told her that I did, for I knew if I told the truth they would suspect me at once. Do you eat meat? she asked. I told her I did not. Do you eat butter on your bread? I replied in the affirmative, and she gave me a slice of bread and butter, a piece of cheese and a silver cup full of milk. I ate it all, and would gladly have eaten more, for I was very hungry. As I was about to leave, the lady remarked, There was grease in that cheese. Was it a sin for me to give it to you? I assured her that it was not, for I was allowed to eat milk, and the cheese being made of milk, there could be no sin in my eating it. I told her that, so far from committing a sin, the Blessed Virgin was pleased with her benevolent spirit, and would, in some way, reward her for her kindness. Leaving Lady St. Ors, I went on to the next town, where I arrived at seven in the evening. I called at the house of a Frenchman, and asked if I could stay overnight, or at least be allowed to rest a while. The man said I was welcome to come in, but he had no place where I could sleep. They were just sitting down to supper, which consisted of pea soup, but the lady said there was meat in it, and she would not invite me to partake of it, but she gave me a good supper of bread and milk. She thought I was a sister of charity, and I did not tell her that I was not. After supper she saw that my skirt was stiff with mud, 
and kindly offered to wash it out for me, saying I could rest till it was dry. I joyfully accepted her offer, and reclining in a corner, enjoyed a refreshing slumber. It was near twelve o'clock before I was ready to go on again, and when I asked how far it was to the next town, they manifested a great anxiety for my welfare. The man said it was seven miles to Mount Bly, but he hoped I did not intend to walk. I told him I did not know whether I should or not. Perhaps I might ride. But you are not afraid to go on alone, he asked. St. Dennis is a bad place for a lady to be out alone at night, and you must pass a graveyard in the south part of the town. Dare you go by it in the dark? I assured him that I had no fear whatever that would prevent me from going past the graveyard. I had never committed a crime, never injured anyone, and I did not think the departed would come back to harm me. The lady said she would think of me with some anxiety, for she should not dare to go past that graveyard alone in the dark. I again assured her that I had no cause to fear had no crime on my conscience, had been guilty of no neglect of duty, and if the living would let me alone, I did not fear the dead. They thought I referred to the low characters about town, and the lady replied, I shall tell my beads for you, and the Holy Virgin will protect you from all harm. But remember, she continued, whenever you pass this way, you will always find a cordial welcome with us. I thanked her, and with a warm grasp of the hand, we parted. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson Chapter 22 Lonely Midnight Walk It was near morning when I entered Mount Bly, but I did not stop. I travelled all night and late in the morning came to a respectable-looking farmhouse which I thought might be occupied by Protestants. I always noticed that their houses were neater and more comfortable than those of the Romanists in the same condition in life. In the present instance I was not disappointed in my expectations. The lady received me kindly, gave me some breakfast, and directed me to the next village. I walked all day, and near night arrived at St. Mary's, where I called at a house and asked permission to sit and rest a while. They gave me an invitation to enter, but did not offer refreshments. I did not like to ask for charity if I could avoid it, and I thought it possible they might ask me to stay overnight. But they did not, and after a half-hour's rest I rose to depart, and thanking them for their kindness, inquired how far it was to the next house. They said it was seven miles to the first house and nine to the next village. With a sad heart I once more pursued my lonely way. Soon it began to rain, and the night came on dark and dismal, cold and stormy, with a high wind that drove the rain against my face with pitiless fury. I entered a thick wood where no ray of light could penetrate, and at almost every step I sank over shoes into the mud. Thus I wandered on, reflecting bitterly on my wretched fate. All the superstitious fears which a convent life is so well calculated to produce again assailed me, and I was frightened at my own wild imaginings. I thought of the nuns who had been murdered so cruelly, and I listened to the voice of the storm, as to the despairing wail of a lost soul. 
the wind swept fiercely through the leafless branches, now roaring like a tornado, again rising to a shrill shriek, or a prolonged whistle, then sinking into a hollow murmur, and dying away in a low sob, which sounded to my excited fancy like the last convulsive sigh of a breaking heart. Once and again I paused, faint and dizzy with hunger and fatigue, feeling as though I could go no further. But there was no alternative. I must go on or perish. And go on I did. Though, as I now look back on that night's experience, I wonder how I managed to do so. But a kind providence undoubtedly watched over me, and good angels guided me on my way. Some time in the night, I think it must have been past twelve o'clock, I became so very weary, I felt I must rest a while at all events. It was so dark I could not see a step before me, but I groped my way to a fence, seated myself on a stone with my head resting against the rails, and in that position I fell asleep. How long I slept, I do not know. I think it must have been some hours. When I awoke, my clothes were drenched with rain, and I was so stiff and lame I could hardly move. But go I must, so I resolved to make the best of it, and hobble along as well as I could. At last I reached the village, but it was not yet morning, and I dared not stop. I kept on till daylight, and as soon as I thought people were up, I went up to a house and rapped. A woman came to the door, and I asked if she would allow me to go in and dry my clothes, and I would have added, get some breakfast. But her looks restrained me. They were getting breakfast, but did not invite me to partake of it, and I dared not ask for anything to eat. When my clothes were dry, I thanked them for the use of their fire, and inquired how far it was to the next village. They said the next town was Highgate, but they did not know the distance. My tears flowed freely when I again found myself in the street, cold, hungry, almost sick, and entirely friendless. What should I do? what would become of me. One thought alone gave courage to my desponding heart, buoyed up my sinking spirits, and restored strength to my weary limbs. I was striving for liberty, that priceless boon, so dear to every human heart. I might perhaps obtain it. At least I would try. Nerved to renew effort by thoughts like these, I toiled onward. All that day I walked without a particle of nourishment. When I reached Highgate, it was eleven o'clock at night, but in one house I saw a light, and I ventured to rap at the door. It was opened by a pale but pleasant-looking woman. "'Kind lady,' said I, "'will you please tell me how far it is to the States?' To the States, she exclaimed, and in a moment she seemed to understand both my character and situation. You are now in Vermont State, said she, but come in, child, you look sad and weary. I at once accepted her offer, and when she asked how far I was travelling, and how I came to be out so late, I did not hesitate to reveal to her my secret for I was sure she could be trusted. She invited me to spend the remainder of the night, and gave me some refreshment. She was nursing a sick woman, which accounted for her being up so late, but did not prevent her from attending to all my wants, and making me as comfortable as possible. When she saw that my feet were wounded, badly swollen, and covered with blood and dirt, she procured warm water, and with her own hands bathed, and made them clean with the best 
toilet soap. She expressed great sympathy for the sad condition my feet were in, and asked if I had no shoes. I told her that my shoes were made of cloth, and soon wore out, that what was left of them I lost in the mud when travelling through the woods in the dark. She then procured a pair of nice woolen stockings, and a pair of new shoes, some underclothes, and a good flannel skirt, which she begged me to wear for her sake. I accepted them gratefully, but the shoes I could not wear, my feet were so sore. She said I could take them with me, and she gave me a pair of Indian moccasins to wear until my feet were healed. Angel of mercy that she was, may God's blessing rest upon her for her kindness to the friendless wanderer. The next morning the good lady urged me to stay with her, at least for a time, and said I should be welcome to a home there for the rest of my life. Grateful as I was for her offer, I was forced to decline it, for I knew that I could not remain so near Montreal in safety. She said the select men of the town would protect me, if they were made acquainted with my peculiar situation. Dear lady, she little knew the character of a Romish priest. Her guileless heart did not suspect the cunning artifice by which they accomplish whatever they undertake. And those worthy select men, I imagine, were not much better informed than herself. Sure I am that any protection they could offer me would not, in the least degree, shield me from the secret intrigue, the affectionate, maternal embrace of Holy Mother Church. When she found that, notwithstanding all her offers, I was resolved to go, she put me into a basket, a change of clothing, the shoes she had given me, and a good supply of food which she gave me for future use. But the most acceptable part of her present was a sunbonnet, for thus far I had nothing on my head but the cap I wore in the convent. She gave me some money, and bade me to go to Swanton, and there, she said, I could take the cars. I accordingly bade her farewell, and basket in hand directed my steps toward the depot some seven miles distant, as I was informed, but I thought it a long seven miles as I passed over it with my sore feet, the blood starting at every step. On my arrival at the depot, a man came to me and asked where I wished to go. I told him I wished to go as far into the state as my money would carry me. He procured me a ticket, and said it would take me to St. Albans. He asked me where I came from, but I begged to be excused from answering questions. He then conducted me to the ladies' room, and left me, saying the cars would be along in about an hour. In this room, several ladies were waiting to take the cars. As I walked across the room, one of them said, in a tone that grated harshly on my feelings. Your skirt is below your dress. I did not feel very good-natured, and instead of saying thank you, as I should have done, I replied in the most impudent manner. Well, it is clean if it is in sight. The lady said no more, and I sat down upon a sofa and fell asleep. As I awoke, one of the ladies said, I wonder who that poor girl is. I was bewildered, and for the moment could not think where I was, but I thought I must make some reply, and rousing myself I turned to her and said, I am a nun, if you wish to know, and I have just escaped from a convent. She gave me a searching look and said, Well, I must confess you do look like one. I often visit in Montreal, where I see a great many of them, and they always look poor and pale. Will you allow me to ask you a few questions?" By this time I was wide awake, and realized perfectly where I was, and the folly of making such an imprudent disclosure. I would have given much to recall those few words, 
for I had a kind of presentiment that they would bring me trouble. I begged to be excused from answering any questions, as I was almost crazy with thinking of the past, and did not wish to speak of it. The lady said no more for some time, but she kept her eye upon me, in a way that I did not like, and I began to consider whether I had better wait for the cars, or start on foot. I was sorry for my imprudence, but it could not be helped now, and I must do the best I could to avoid the unpleasant consequences which might result from it. I had just made up my mind to go on, when I heard in the far distance the shrill whistle of the approaching train, that train which I fondly hoped would bear me far away from danger, and onward to the goal of my desires. At this moment the lady crossed the room, and seating herself by my side, asked, Would you not like to go and live with me? I have one waiting maid now, but I wish for another, and if you will go, I will take you and give you good wages. Your work will not be hard. Will you go? Where do you go? I asked. To Montreal, she replied. Then I shall not go with you, said I. No money could induce me to return there again. Ah, said she, with a peculiar smile. I see how it is, but you need not fear to trust me. I will protect you and never suffer you to be taken back to the convent. I saw that I had made unconsciously another imprudent revelation and resolved to say no more. I was about to leave her, but she drew me back, saying, I will give you some of my clothes, and I can make them fit you so well that no one will ever recognize you. I shall have plenty of time to alter them if they require it, for the train that I go in will not be along for about three hours. You can help me, and in that time we will get you nicely fixed. I could hardly repress a smile when I saw how earnest she was, and I thought it a great pity that a plan so nicely laid out should be so suddenly deranged. But I could not listen to her flatteries. I suspected that she was herself in the employ of the priests, and merely wished to get me back that she might betray me. She had the appearance of being very wealthy, was richly clad, wore a gold watch, chain, bracelets, breast-pin, earrings, and many finger-rings, all of the finest gold. But with all her wealth and kind offers, I dare not trust her. I thought she looked annoyed when I refused to go with her. But when I rose to go to the cars, a look of angry impatience stole over her fine features, which convinced me that I had escaped a snare. The cars came at length, and I was soon on my way to St. Albans. I was very sick, and asked a gentleman near me to raise the windows. He did so, and inquired how far I was going. I informed him, when he remarked that he was somewhat acquainted in St. Albans, and asked with whom I designed to stop. I told him I had no friends or acquaintance in the place, but I hoped to get employment in some Protestant family. He said he could direct me to some gentleman who would, he thought, assist me. One in particular he mentioned as being a very wealthy man and kept a number of servants. Perhaps he would employ me. This gentleman's name was Brainard and my informant spoke so highly of the family, I immediately sought them out on leaving the cars, and was at once employed by Mrs. Brainard as a seamstress. Here I found a quiet, happy home. Mrs. Brainard was a kind, sympathizing woman, and to her I confided the history of my convent life. She would not allow me to work hard, 
for she saw that my nerves were easily excited. She made me sit with her in her own room a great part of the time, and did not wish me to go out alone. They had several boarders in the family, and one of them was a brother-in-law to Mrs. Brainard. His name I have forgotten. It was not a common name, but he married Mrs. Brainard's sister, and with his wife resided there all the time that I was with them. Mr. Brainard was away from home most of the time, so that I saw but little of him. They had an Irish girl in the kitchen named Betsy. She was a kind, pleasant girl, and she thought me a strict Romanist because I said my prayers so often, and wore the holy scapulary around my neck. This scapulary is a band with a cross on one side, and on the other the letters J H S, which signify Jesus the Saviour of Man. At this place I professed great regard for the Church of Rome, and no one but Mrs. Brainard was acquainted with my real character and history. When they asked my name, I told them that they could call me Margaret, but it was an assumed name. My own, for reasons known only by myself, I did not choose to reveal. I supposed, of course, they would regard me with suspicion for a while, but I saw nothing of the kind. They treated me with great respect, and no questions were ever asked. Perhaps I did wrong in changing my name, but I felt that I was justified in using any means to preserve my liberty. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. Chapter 23 Flight and Recapture. Four happy weeks I enjoyed unalloyed satisfaction in the bosom of this charming family. It was a new thing for me to feel at home, contented and undisturbed, to have every one around me treat me with kindness and even affection. I sometimes feared it was too good to last. Mrs. Brainard, in particular, I shall ever remember with grateful and affectionate regard. She was more like a mother to me than a mistress, and I shall ever look back to the time I spent with her as a bright spot in the otherwise barren desert of my life. Better, far better would it have been for me if I had never left her. But I became alarmed and thought the convent people were after me. It was no idle whim, no imaginary terror, I had good cause to fear, for I had several times seen a priest go past, and gaze attentively at the house. I knew him at the first glance, having often seen him in Montreal. Then my heart told me that they had traced me to this place, and were now watching a chance to get hold of me. Imagine if you can my feelings. Had I suffered so much in vain? Would they be allowed to take me back to those fearful cells where no ray of mercy could ever reach me? I could not endure the thought. Frightened and almost beside myself, I resolved to make an effort to find a more secure place. I therefore left those kind friends in the darkness of night, without one word of farewell and without their knowledge. I knew they would not allow me to go if they were apprised of my design. In all probability they would have ridiculed my fears and bade me rest in peace. How could I expect them to comprehend my danger when they knew so little of the machination of my foes? I intended to go further into the state, but did not wish to have anyone know which way I had gone. It was a sad mistake, but how often in this world do we plunge into danger when we seek to avoid it? 
how often fancy ourselves in security when we stand upon the very brink of ruin i left mr brainard's in the evening and called upon a family in the neighbourhood whose acquaintance i had made and whom i wished to see once more though i dared not say farewell i left them between the hours of nine and ten and set forward on my perilous journey i had gone but a short distance when i heard the sound of wheels and the heavy tread of horses feet behind me my heart beat with such violence it almost stopped my breath for i felt they were after me but there was no escape no forest or shelter near where i could seek protection on came the furious beasts driven by no gentle hand they came up with me, and I almost began to hope that my fears were groundless. When the horses suddenly stopped, a strong hand grasped me, a gag was thrust into my mouth, and again the well-known box was taken from the wagon. Another moment and I was securely caged, and on my way back to Montreal. Two men were in the wagon, and two rode on horseback beside it four men to guard one poor nun they drove to mount bly where they stopped to change horses and the two men on horseback remained there while the other two mounted the wagon and drove to sorel here the box was taken out and carried on board a boat where two priests were waiting for me when the boat started they took me out for the first time after i was put into it at st albans Three days we had been on the way, and I had tasted neither food nor drink. How little did I think when I took my tea at Mr. Brainard's the night I left, that it was the last refreshment I would have for seven days. Yet such was the fact, and how little did they think, as they lay in their quiet beds that night, that the poor fugitive they had taken to their home was fleeing for life, or for that which to her was better than life yet so it was bitterly did i reproach myself for leaving those kind friends as i did for i thought perhaps if i had remained there they would not have dared to touch me such were my feelings then but as i now look back i can see that it would have made little difference whether i left or remained they were bound to get me at all events and if I had stopped there until they had despaired of catching me secretly, they would undoubtedly have come with an officer and accused me of some crime as a pretext for taking me away. Then, had any one been so far interested for me as to insist on my having a fair trial, how easy for them to produce witnesses enough to condemn me. Those priests have many ways to accomplish their designs. The American people don't know them yet. God grant they never may. On my arrival at the nunnery, I was taken down the coal grate and fastened to an iron ring in the back part of a cell. The archbishop then came down and read my punishment. Notwithstanding the bitter grief that oppressed my spirit, I could not repress a smile of contempt as the great man entered my cell. I remembered that before I ran away my punishments were assigned by a priest, but the first time I fled from them a bishop condescended to read my sentence, and now his honour the archbishop graciously deigned to illumine my dismal cell with the light of his countenance and his own august lips pronounced the words of doom. Was I rising in their esteem, or did they think to frighten me into obedience by the grandeur of his majestic mien? Such were my thoughts as this illustrious personage proceeded slowly and with suitable dignity to unroll the document that would decide my fate. What would it be? Death? It might be for aught I knew, or cared to know. I had by this time become perfectly reckless, and the whole proceeding seemed so ridiculous I found it exceedingly difficult to maintain a demeanour sufficiently solemn for the occasion. 
But when the fixed decree came forth, when the sentence fell upon my ear that condemned me to seven days' starvation, it sobered me at once. Yet even then the feeling of indignation was so strong within me, I could not hold my peace. I would speak to that man if he killed me for it. Looking him full in the face, which, by the way, I knew was considered by him a great crime, I asked, Do you ever expect to die? I did not, of course, expect an answer, but he replied with a smile, Yes, but you will die first. He then asked how long I had fasted, and I replied three days. He said you will fast four days more, and you will be punished every day until next December, when you will take the black veil. As he was leaving the room, he remarked, We do not usually have the nuns take the black veil until they are twenty-one, but you have such good luck in getting away, we mean to put you where you can't do it. And with this consoling thought he left me, left me in darkness and despair, to combat as best I could the horrors of starvation. This was in the early part of winter, and only about a year would transpire before I entered that retreat from which none ever returned. And then to be punished every day for a year. What a prospect! The priest came every morning with his dark lantern to look at me, but he never spoke. On the second day, after my return, I told him if he would bring me a little piece of bread, I would never attempt to run away again, but would serve him faithfully the rest of my life. Had he given it to me, I would have faithfully kept my word. But he did not notice me, and closing the door, he left me once more to pass through all the agonies of starvation. I remember nothing after that day, whether I remained in the cell the other two days, or was taken out before the time expired, I do not know. This much, however, I do know. As a general rule, a nun's punishment is never remitted. If she lives, it is well. If she dies, no matter. There are enough more, and no one will ever call them to an account for the murder. But methinks I hear the reader ask, Did they not fear the judgment of God and a future retribution? In reply, I can only state what I believe to be the fact. It is my firm belief that not more than one priest in ten thousand really believes in the truth of Christianity, or even in the existence of a God. They are all infidels or atheists. And how can they be otherwise? It is the legitimate fruit of that system of deceit which they call religion. Of course, I can only give this as my opinion, founded on what I have seen and heard. You can take it, reader, for what it is worth. Believe it or not, just as you please. But I assure you I have often heard the nuns say that they did not believe in any religion, the professions of holiness of heart and parity of life so often made by the priests they know to be nothing but a hypocritical pretense, and their ceremonies they regard as a ridiculous farce. For some time after I was taken from the cell, I lay in a state of partial unconsciousness, but how long I do not know. I have no recollection of being taken upstairs but I found myself on my bed in my old room and on the stand beside me were several cups, vials, etc. The abbess who sat beside me occasionally gave me a teaspoonful of wine or brandy and tried to make me eat. Ere long my appetite returned, but it was several weeks before my stomach was strong enough to enable me to satisfy in any degree the cravings of hunger. 
When I could eat, I gained very fast, and the abbess left me in the care of a nun, who came in occasionally to see if I wanted anything. This nun often stopped to talk with me when she thought no one was near, and expressed great curiosity to know what I saw in the world, if people were kind to me, and if I did not mean to get away again if possible. I told her I should not, but she replied, I don't believe that. You will try again, and you will succeed yet, if you keep up good courage. You are so good to work. They do not wish to part with you, and that is one reason why they try so hard to get you back again. But never mind, they won't get you next time. I assured her I should not try to escape again, for they were sure to catch me, and as they had almost killed me this time, they would the next. I did not dare to trust her, for I supposed the superior had given her orders to question me. I was still weak, so weak that I could hardly walk when they obliged me to go to the kitchen to clean vegetables and do other light work, and as soon as I had sufficient strength to milk the cows and take the care of the milk, they punished me every day in accordance with the bishop's order, and sometimes I thought more than he intended. I wore thorns on my head, and peas in my shoes, was whipped and pinched, burnt with hot irons, and made to crawl through the underground passage I have before described. In short, I was tortured and punished in every possible way, until I was weary of my life. Still they were careful not to go so far as to disable me from work. They did not care how much I suffered if I only performed my daily task. There was an underground passage leading away from the nunnery to a place which they called Providence in the south part of the city. I do not know whether it is a school or a convent, or what it is, but I think it must be some distance from what I heard said about it. The priest often spoke of sending me there, but for some reason he did not make me go. Still, the frequent reference to what I so much dreaded kept me in constant apprehension and alarm. I have heard the priest say that underground passages extended from the convent in every direction for a distance of five miles, and I have reason to believe the statement is true. But these reasons I may not attempt to give. There are things that may not even be alluded to, and if it were possible to speak of them, who would believe the story? End of chapter 23。e of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson Chapter 24 Resolves to Escape As summer approached, I expected to be sent to the farm again, but for some reason I was still employed in the kitchen. Yet I could not keep my mind upon my work. The one great object of my life the subject that continually pressed upon my mind, was the momentous question, how shall I escape? The dreaded December was rapidly approaching. To some it would bring a joyous festival, but to me the black veil and a lifelong imprisonment. Once within those dreary walls, and I might as well hope to escape from the grave. Such are the arrangements, there is no chance for a nun to escape, unless she is promoted to the office of abbess or superior. Of course, but few of them can hope for this, especially if they are not contented, and certainly in my case there was not the least reason to expect anything of the kind. Knowing these facts, with the horrors of the secret cloister ever before me, I felt some days as though on the verge of madness. Before the nuns take the black veil, and enter this tomb for the living, 
they are put into a room by themselves called the Forbidden Closet, where they spend six months in studying the black book. Perchance the reader will remember that when I first came to this nunnery, I was taken by the door tender to this forbidden closet, and permitted to look in upon the wretched inmates. From that time I have always had the greatest horror of that room. I was never allowed to enter it, and in fact never wished to do so, but I have heard the most agonizing groans from those within, and sometimes I have heard them laugh. Not a natural, hearty laugh, however, such as we hear from the gay and happy, but a strange, terrible sound which I cannot describe, and which sent a thrill of terror through my frame, and seemed to chill the very blood in my veins. I have heard the priests say, when conversing with each other while I was tidying their room, that many of these nuns lose their reason while studying the black book. I can well believe this, for never in my life did I ever witness an expression of such unspeakable, unmitigated anguish, such helpless and utter despair as I saw upon the faces of those nuns. And well they may despair, kept under lock and key, their windows barred, and no air admitted to the room except what comes through the iron grate of their windows from other apartments, compelled to study I know not what, with no hope of the least mitigation of their sufferings, or relaxation of the stringent rules that bind them, no prospect before them but a life-long imprisonment. What have they to hope for? Surely death and the grave are the only things to which they can look forward to with the least degree of satisfaction. Those nuns selected for this secret cloister are generally the fairest, the most beautiful of the whole number. I used to see them in the chapel, and some of them were very handsome. They dressed like the other nuns, and always looked sad and broken-hearted but were not pale and thin like the rest of us. I am sure they were not kept upon short allowance as the others were, and starvation was not one of their punishments, whatever else they might endure. The plain-looking girls were always selected to work in the kitchen and do the drudgery about the house. How often have I thanked God for my plain face! But for that, I might not have been kept in the kitchen so long, and thus found means to escape which I certainly could not have found elsewhere. With all my watching and planning I did not find an opportunity to get away till June. I then succeeded in getting outside the convent yard one evening between eight and nine o'clock. How I got there is a secret I shall never reveal. A few yards from the gate I was stopped by one of the guard at the barrack, who asked me where I was going. To visit a sick woman, I promptly replied, and he let me pass. Soon after this my heart ceased to flutter. I thought I heard someone running after me. My resolution was at once taken. I would never be caught and carried back alive. My fate was at last, I thought in my own hands. Better die at once than to be chained like a guilty criminal and suffer as I had done before. Blame me not, gentle reader, when I tell you that I stood upon the bank of the river with exultant joy, and as I pursued my way along the towpath, ready to spring into the water on the first indication of danger, I rejoiced over the disappointment of my pursuers in losing a servant who had done them so good service. At a little distance I saw a ferry-boat, but when I asked the captain to carry me over the river, he refused. He was, probably, afraid of the police and a fine, for no one can assist a runaway nun with impunity if caught in the act. He directed me, however, to the owner of the boat, who said I could go if the captain was willing to carry me. I knew very well that he would not, and I took my place in the boat 
as though I had a perfect right to it. We were almost across the river when the captain saw me and gave orders to turn back the boat and leave me on the shore from whence we started. From his appearance I thought we were pursued, and I was not mistaken. Five priests were following us in another boat, and they too turned back and reached the shore almost as soon as we did. I left the boat and ran for my life. I was now sure that I was pursued. There could be no doubt of that for the sound of footsteps behind me came distinct to my ear. At a little distance stood a small, white house. Could I not reach it? Would not the people protect me? The thought gave me courage, and I renewed my efforts. Nearer came the footsteps, but I reached the house, and without knocking or asking permission, I sprang through the door. The people were in bed in another room, but a man looked out and asked what I wanted. I'm a nun, said I. I've run away from the grey nunnery, and they're after me. Hide me, oh, hide me, and God will bless you. As I spoke, he put out his hand and opened the cellar door. Here, said he, run down the cellar. I'll be with you in a moment. I obeyed, and he struck a light and followed. Pointing to a place where he kept ashes, he said hastily, Crawl in there. There was not a moment to lose, for before he had covered up my hiding place, a loud knock was heard upon the front door. Having extinguished his light, he ran upstairs and opened the door with the appearance of having just left his bed. Who is here? he asked. And what do you want at this time of night? One of them replied, we are in search of a nun, and are very sure she came in here. Well, gentlemen, said he, walk in and see for yourselves. If she is here, you are at liberty to find her. Lighting a candle, he proceeded to guide them over the house, which they searched until they were satisfied. Then they came down the cellar, and I gave up all hope of escape. Still I resolved never to be taken alive. I could strangle myself, and I would do it, rather than suffer as I did before. At that moment I could truly say with the inspired penman, with whose language I have since become familiar, My soul chooseth strangling and death, rather than life. They looked all around me, and even into the place where I lay concealed, but they did not find me. At length I heard them depart, and so great was my joy I could hardly restrain my feelings within the bounds of decorum. I felt as though I must dance and sing, shout aloud or leap for joy at my great deliverance. I am sure I should have committed some extravagant act had not the gentleman at that moment called me up and told me that my danger was by no means past. This information so dashed my cup of bliss that I was able to drink it quietly. He gave me some refreshment, and as soon as safety would permit, saddled his horse and, taking me on behind him, carried me six miles to another boat put me on board and paid the captain three dollars to carry me to La Prairie. On leaving me, he gave me twenty-five cents, and said, You'll be caught if you go with the other passengers. The captain said he could hide me, and no one would know that I was on board but himself. He led me to the end of the boat, and put me upon a board over the horses. He fixed a strong cord for me to hold on by, and said, You must be careful and not fall down, for the horses would certainly kill you before you could be taken out. The captain was very kind to me, and when I left him, gave me twenty-five cents and some good advice. He said I must hurry along as fast as possible, for it was jubilee, and the priests would all be in church at four o'clock. He also advised me not to stop in any place where a Romish priest resided, for, 
said he, the convent people have undoubtedly telegraphed all over the country, giving a minute description of your persons, and the priests will all be looking for you. Two days I travelled as fast as my strength would allow. When I came to Sorel, which was on the other side of the river, here I saw several priests on the road coming directly towards me. That they were after me I had not a doubt. Whither should I flee? To escape by running was out of the question, but just at that moment my eye fell upon a boat near the shore. I ran to the captain and asked him to take me across the river. He consented, and as I expected, the priests took another boat and followed us. Once more I gave myself up for lost, and prepared to spring into the water if they were likely to overtake me. The man understood my feelings, and exerted all his strength to urge forward the boat. At last it reached the shore and as he helped me out he whispered, Now run! I did run, but though my own liberty was at stake, I could not help thinking about the consequences to that man if I escaped, for I knew they would make him pay a heavy fine for his benevolent act. A large house stood in my way, and throwing open the door I exclaimed, Are there any Protestants here? Oh, yes, replied a man who sat there. Come with me. He led me to the kitchen where a large company of Irishmen were rolling little balls on a table. I saw the men were Irish, and my first thought was, I am betrayed. But my fears were soon relieved, for the man exclaimed, Here is a nun inquiring for Protestants. Well, replied one who seemed to be a leader, this is the right place to find them. We are all true orange men. And then they all began to shout, Down with the Catholics! Down with the Pope! Death to the Jesuits! etc. I was frightened at their violence, but their leader came to me, and with the kindness of a brother said, Do not fear us. If you are a runaway, we will protect you. He bade the men be still, and asked if anyone was after me. I told him about the priests, and he replied, You have come to the right place for protection, for they dare not show themselves here. I am the leader of a band of anti-Catholics, and this is their lodge. You have heard of us, I presume. We are called Orange Men. Our object is to overthrow the Roman Catholic religion and we are bound by the most fearful oaths to stand by each other, and protect all who seek our aid. The priests dread our influence, for we have many members, and I hope, ere long, the power of the Pope in this country will be at an end. I am sure people must see what a cruel, hypocritical set they are. Before he had done speaking, a man came to the door and said, The carriage is ready. Another of the men, on hearing this, said, Come with me and I'll take you out of the reach of the priests. He conducted me to a carriage, which was covered and the curtains all fastened down. He helped me into it, directing me to sit upon the back seat, where I could not be seen by anyone unless they took particular pains. He drove to St. Oars that night, and if I remember right, he said the distance was twelve miles. When he left me, he gave me twenty-five cents. I travelled all night, and about midnight passed through St. Denis, but I did not stop until the next morning when I called at a house and asked for something to eat. The lady gave me some bread and milk, and I again pursued my way. End of chapter 24。Chapter 25 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson. 
Chapter Twenty Five Eventful Journey. Once more I had the good fortune to obtain a passage across the river in a ferry boat, and was soon passing onward upon the other side, passing through two places called St. Mary's and St. John's. I followed a railroad to a village which I was informed was called Stottsville, a great part of the property being owned by Mr. Stotts, to whom I was at once directed. Here I stopped and was kindly received by the gentleman and his wife. They offered me refreshments, gave me some articles of clothing, then he carried me twelve miles and left me at Rouse's Point to take the cars for Albany. He gave me six dollars to pay my expenses, and a letter of introduction to a gentleman by the name of Williams, in which he stated all the facts he knew concerning me, and commended me to his care for protection. I think he said Mr. Williams lived on North Pearl Street, but I may be mistaken in this and also some other particulars, as I had no thought of relating these facts at the time of their occurrence. I did not fix them in my mind as I otherwise should have done. Mr. Stotts said that if I could not find the gentleman to whom the letter was directed, I was to take it to the city authorities, and they would protect me. As he assisted me from the carriage, he said, You will stop here until the cars come along, and you must get your own ticket. I shall not notice you again and I do not wish you to speak to me. I entered the depot intending to follow his directions, but when I found the cars would not come along for three hours, I did not dare to stay. There was quite a large collection of people there, and I feared that someone would suspect and stop me. I therefore resolved to follow the railroad and walk on to the next station. On my way I passed over a railroad bridge, which I should think was two miles long. The wind blew very hard at the time, and I found it exceedingly difficult to walk upon the narrow timbers. More than once I came near losing my precarious footing, and I was in constant fear that the train would overtake me before I got over. In that case, I had resolved to step outside the track where I thought I could stand upon the edge of the bridge and hold on by the telegraph poles, and thus let them pass without doing me injury. Happily, however, I was not compelled to resort to this perilous expedient, but passed the bridge in safety. At the end I found another, nearly as long, connected with it by a drawbridge. When I drew near, it was up for a boat to pass, but a man called to me and asked if I wished to go over. I told him I did, and he let down the bridge. As I approached him, he asked, Are you mad? Or how came you here? I told him I had walked from the depot at Rouse's Point. He appeared, greatly surprised, and said, you are the first person who ever walked over that bridge. Will you come to my house and rest a while? You must be very weary, and my wife will be glad to see you. She is rather lonely here, and is pleased to see anyone. Will you come? Tis only a short distance, just down under the bridge. Those last words decided me. I thanked him, but firmly refused to go one step out of my way. I thought that he wished to deceive me, perhaps take me to some out-of-the-way place, and give me up to my pursuers. At all events it was wise not to trust him, for I was sure there was no house near the bridge, certainly not under it. I have since learned that such is the fact. As I turned to leave him, he again urged me to stop, and said, The cars will be along and they will run over you. How do you expect to get out of their way? I told him I would risk it, and left him. I passed on in safety, and soon came to the depot, where I took the evening train for Albany. 
At eight the same evening I left the cars and walked on towards Troy, which I think was four miles distant. Here I met a lad of whom I inquired the way to Albany. You cannot get there tonight, said he, and I advise you not to try. When he saw that I was determined to go on, he said I would pass a tavern called the Halfway House, and if I was tired I could stop there. It was about eleven o'clock when I passed this house. There were several persons on the piazza, laughing, talking, and singing, who called to me as I passed, shouted after me, and bade me to stop. Exceedingly frightened, I ran with all possible speed, but they continued to call after me till I was out of hearing. Seeing a light at a house nearby, I ventured to rap on the door. It was opened by a woman who asked me to walk in. I inquired the distance to Albany. She informed me, but said, You can't go there tonight. I told her I must. Well, said she, if you will go, the watch will take care of you when you get there. She then asked, Were those men calling after you? I told her I supposed they were when she replied with a peculiar smile, I guess you can't be a very nice kind of girl, or you wouldn't be on the street this time of night. My feelings were so deeply wounded I could hardly restrain my tears at this cruel insinuation. But pride came to my aid, and choking down the rising emotion, I replied as carefully as possible, I must do as I can, and not as I would. It was about one o'clock at night when I entered the principal street in Albany, and as the lady predicted, a watchman came to me and asked why I was out that time of night. I gave him Mr. Stott's letter. He stood beside a lamp post and read it, when he seemed satisfied and said, I know the man, come with me and I'll take you to his house. I followed him a long way till at last he stopped before a large house and rang the bell. Mr. Williams came to the door and asked what was wanted. The watchman gave him the letter. He read it and invited me to stop. His wife got up, received me very kindly and gave me some supper, for which I was truly grateful nor was I less thankful for the delicate consideration with which they avoided any allusion to my convent life, or my subsequent flight and suffering. Mrs. Williams saw that I was sad and weary, and as she conducted me to a comfortable bed she remarked, You are safe at last, and I am glad of it. You can now retire without the apprehension of danger, and sleep in perfect security. You are with friends who will protect you as long as you choose to remain with us. Notwithstanding the good lady's assurance of safety, I found it impossible to close my eyes. I was among strangers in a strange place, and having been so often deceived, might I not be again? Perhaps after all their pretended kindness they were plotting to betray me. A few days, however, convinced me that I had at last found real friends, who would protect me in the hour of danger to the utmost of their ability. I remained here some four weeks, and should have remained longer, but an incident transpired that awakened all my fears, and again sent me forth into the wide world, a fugitive and a wanderer. I went to my chamber one night, when I heard a sound like the full, heavy respiration of a man in deep sleep. The sound appeared to come from under the bed, but stopped as I entered the room. I was very much alarmed, but I controlled my feelings, and instead of running shrieking from the room, I deliberately closed the blinds, shut the windows, adjusted the curtain, all the time carelessly humming a tune and taking up my lamp, I slowly left the room. Once outside the door, I ran in all haste to Mr. Williams, and told him what I had heard. He laughed at me, said it was all imagination, 
but to quiet my fears he went to my room, resolved to convince me that no one was there. I followed and stood at the door while he lifted the bed valance, when a large, tall man sprang forth, and I caught him with one hand while with the other he drew a pistol from beneath his coat, saying, Let me go and I'll depart in peace, but attempt to detain me and I'll blow your brains out. I shrieked, and Mrs. Williams came in great terror and consternation to see what was the matter, but she could render no assistance, and Mr. Williams, being unarmed, was obliged to let him go. The watch were immediately called, and they sought for the intruder in every direction. No effort was spared to find him, that we might at least learn the object of this untimely visit. But the search was all in vain. No trace of his whereabouts could be discovered. Mr. Williams said he did not believe it was me he sought. He thought the object was robbery and perhaps arson and murder, but he would not think that I was in the least danger. The man, he said, in hastily concealing himself, had taken the first hiding place he could find. Yet I thought otherwise. Indeed, so sure was I that he was an agent of the priests, sent forth for the express purpose of arresting me. No earthly consideration would have induced me to remain there another day. The rest of that night I spent in a state of anxiety I cannot describe. Sleep fled from my eyes. I dared not even undress and go to bed, but I sat in my chair or walked the room every moment expecting the return of the mysterious visitor. I shuddered at every sound, whether real or imaginary. Once in particular I remember the distant roll of carriage wheels fell upon my ear. I listened. It came near and still nearer, till at last it stopped, as I thought, at the gate. For a moment I stood literally stupefied with terror, and then I hastily prepared to use the means for self-destruction I had already provided in anticipation of such an emergency. I was still resolved never to be taken alive. Give me liberty or give me death was now the language of my soul. If I could not enjoy the one, I would cordially embrace the other. But it was a sad alternative after all I had suffered that I might be free. After all my buoyant hopes, all my ardent aspirations for a better life. Oh, it was a bitter thing, thus to stand in the darkness of night, and with my own hand carefully adjust the cord that was to cut me off from the land of the living, and in a moment launch my trembling soul into the vast, unknown, untried, and fearful future that men call eternity. Was this to be the only use I was to make of liberty? Was it for this I had so long struggled, toiled, wept, and prayed? God of mercy, I cried, save, O oh, save me from this last great sin, from the sad and dire necessity which thus urges me to cut short a life which thou alone canst give. My prayer was heard, but how slowly passed the hours of that weary night while I waited for the day that I might hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Truly, at that time I could say with one of old, Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. My heart is sore pained within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Oh, that I had the wings of a dove, for then I would flee away and be at rest. But alas, I had not the wings of a dove, and whither should I flee from the furious grasp of my relentless persecutors? Again I must go forth into the busy haunts of men, I must mingle with the multitude, and what chance had I for ultimate escape? 
If I left these kind friends, and leave them I must, who would take me in? In whom could I confide? Who would have the power to rescue me in my hour of need? In God alone could I trust, yet why is he so far from helping me? Why are my prayers so long unanswered? And why does he thus allow the wicked to triumph, to lay snares for the feet of the innocent, and wrongfully persecute those whom their wanton cruelty hath caused to sit in darkness and in the shadow of death? Why does he not at once break the bands of iron and let the oppressed go free? The tedious night at length passed away. When I met Mr. Williams in the morning, I told him I could no longer remain with him, for I was sure if I did, I should be suddenly arrested in some unguarded moment and carried back to Montreal. He urged me to stay, assured me he would never allow them to take me, said that he thought some of going south, and I could go with him and thus be removed far from all whom I feared. Mrs. Williams also strove to persuade me to stay, but though sorry to appear ungrateful, I dared not remain another night where I felt that my danger was so great. When they found that I was determined to go, Mr. Williams said I had better go to Worcester, Massachusetts, and try to get employment in some farmer's family, a little out of the city. He gave me money to bear my expenses until I found a place where I could earn my living. It was with a sad heart that I left this hospitable roof, and as I turned away I said in my heart, Shall I always be hunted through the world in this manner? obliged to flee like a guilty thing? And shall I never find a home of happiness and peace? Must sorrow and despair forever be the portion of my cup? But no words of mine can describe what I felt at that moment. I longed for the power to sound a warning through the length and breadth of the land, to cry in the ears of all the people, Beware of Romanism! like the patient man of Uz, with whose history I have since become familiar, I was ready to exclaim, Oh, that my words were now written! Oh, that they were printed in a book, graven with an iron pen, that the world might know what a fearful and bitter thing it is to be a nun, to be subject to the control of those ruthless tyrants, the Romish priests. Once more I entered the depot, and mingled with the crowd around the ticket office. But no pen can describe my terror when I found myself the object of particular attention. I heard people remark about my strange and unnatural appearance, and I feared I might be taken up for a crazy person, if not for a nun. Thinking that I saw an enemy in every face, and a pursuer in every one who came near me, I hastened to take refuge in the cars. There I waited with the greatest impatience for the starting of the train. Slowly the cars were filled. Very leisurely the passengers sought their seats, while I sat trembling in every limb, and the cold perspiration starting from every pore. How carefully I scanned every face! How eagerly I watched for some indication of the priest or the spy. So intense was my anxiety. Those few moments seemed to me an age of agony. At length the shrill whistle announced that all was ready, and like sweetest music the sound fell upon my ears. The train dashed off at lightning speed, but to me it seemed like the movement of a snail. Once under way, I ventured to breathe freely, and hope again revived. Perchance I might yet escape. But even as the thought passed my mind, a man entered the cars and seated himself directly before me. I thought he regarded me with too much interest, and thinking to shun him, 
I quietly left my seat and retired to the other end of the car. He soon followed, and again my fears revived. He at first tried to converse with me, but finding I would not reply, he began to question me in the most direct and impertinent manner. Again I changed my seat, and again he followed. I then sought the conductor, and revealed to him enough of my history to enlist his sympathy and ensure his protection. To his honour be it spoken, I did not appeal to him in vain. He severely reproved the man for his impertinence, and for the rest of the journey I was shielded from insult or injury. Nothing further of interest transpired until I reached Worcester, when the first face that met my eye as I was about to leave the cars was that of a Romish priest. I could not be mistaken, for I had often seen him at Montreal. He might not have been looking for me, but he watched every passenger as they left the cars in a way that convinced me he had some special reason for doing it. As I, too, had special reasons for avoiding him just at that time, I stepped back out of sight until the passengers were all out of the cars and the priest had turned away. I then sprang out upon the opposite side, and, turning my back upon the depot, hastened away amid the wilderness of houses, not knowing whither I went. For a long time I wandered around, until at length, being faint and weary, I began to look for some place where I could obtain refreshment, but when I found a restaurant I did not dare to enter. A number of Irishmen were standing around who were in all probability Catholics. I would not venture among them, but as I turned aside I remembered that Mr. Williams had directed me to seek employment a little out of the city. I then inquired the way to Main Street and having found it, I turned to the north and walked on till I found myself out of the thickly settled part of the city. Then I began to seek for employment, and after several fruitless applications, I chanced to call upon a man whose name was Handy. He received me in the kindest manner, and when I asked for work, he said his wife did not need to hire me, but I was welcome to stop with them and work for my board until I found employment elsewhere. This offer I joyfully accepted, and as I became acquainted in the place, many kind hands were extended to aid me in my efforts to obtain an honest living. In this neighborhood I still reside, truly thankful for past deliverance, grateful for present mercies, and confidently trusting God for the future. End of chapter 25。Chapter 26 of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson Chapter 26 Conclusion Here closes the story of Sarah J. Richardson, as related by herself. The remaining particulars have been obtained from her employers in Worcester. She arrived in this city in August 1854, and as she has already stated, at once commenced seeking for employment. She called at many houses before she found anyone who wished to help, and her first question at each place was, Are you a Catholic? If the answer was in the affirmative, she passed on, but if the family were Protestants, she inquired for some kind of employment. She did not care what it was. She would cook, wash, sew, or do chamber work, anything to earn her bread. A Mr. Handy was the first person who took her in and gave her a home. In his family she worked for her board a few weeks, 
going out to wash occasionally as she had opportunity. She then went to Holden, Massachusetts, but for some reason remained only one week, and again returned to Worcester. Mr. Ezra Goddard then took her into his own family, and found her capable, industrious, and trustworthy. Had anything been wanting to prove her truthfulness and sincerity, the deep gratitude of her fervent, I thank you, when told that she had found a permanent home, would have done it effectually. But though her whole appearance indicated contentment and earnestness of purpose, though her various duties were faithfully and zealously performed, yet the deep sadness of her countenance and the evident anxiety of her mind at first awakened a suspicion of mental derangement. She seemed restless, suspicious, and morbidly apprehensive of approaching danger. The appearance of a stranger, or a sudden ringing of the bell, would cause her to start, tremble, and exhibit the greatest perturbation of spirit. In fact, she seemed so constantly on the qui vive, the lady of the house one day said to her, Sarah, what is the matter with you? What do you fear? The Roman Catholic priests, she replied, I have been a nun. I ran away from the Grey Nunnery at Montreal, and twice I have been caught carried back and punished in the most cruel manner. Oh, if only you knew what I have suffered, you would not wonder that I live in constant fear, lest they again seek out my retreat, and I will die before I go back again. Further questioning drew from her the foregoing narrative, which she repeated once and again to various persons, and at different times, without the least alteration or contradiction. She resided in the family of Mr. Goddard some weeks, when she was taken into the employ of Mr. Amos L. Black. This gentleman informs us that he found her a faithful, industrious, honest servant, and he has not the least doubt of the truthfulness of her statements respecting her former life in the convent. A few weeks after this, she was married to Frederick S. Richardson, with whom she became acquainted soon after her arrival in the city of Worcester. The marriage ceremony was performed by Charles Chaffin, Esquire, of Holden, Massachusetts. After their marriage, her husband hired a room in the house occupied by Mr. Handy, with whom she had formerly resided. After a few weeks, however, they removed to a place called the Drury Farm. It is owned by the heirs, but left in the care of Mr. Ezra Goddard. Previous to her marriage, Mrs. Richardson had often been advised to allow her history to be placed before the public. But she always replied, For my life I would not do it. Not because I do not wish the world to know it, for I would gladly proclaim it wherever a Romanist is known but it would be impossible for me to escape their hands should I make myself so public. They would most assuredly take my life. After her marriage, however, her principal objection was removed. She thought they would not wish to take her back into the nunnery, and her husband would protect her from violence. She therefore related the story of her life while in the convent, which, in accordance with her own request, was written down from her lips as she related it. This was done by Mrs. Lucy Ann Hood, wife of Edward P. Hood, and daughter of Ezra Goddard. It is now given to the public, without addition or alteration, and with but a slight abridgment. A strange and startling story it certainly is. Perhaps the reader will cast it aside at once as a worthless fiction, the idle vagary of an excited brain. The compiler, of course, cannot vouch for its truth, 
but would respectfully invite the attention of the reader to the following testimonials presented by those who have known the narrator. The first is from Edward P. Hood, with whom Mrs. Richardson resided when her narrative was written. End of chapter 26 End of Life in the Grey Nunnery at Montreal by Sarah J. Richardson